Chapter Eleven, Part Two of North America, Volume One by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleven, Series Americana, Part Two. We went there because it is surrounded by the prairie, and out into the prairie we had ourselves driven. We found some difficulty in getting away from the corn, though we had selected this spot as one at which the open rolling prairie was specially attainable. As long as I could see a cornfield or a tree I was not satisfied. Nor indeed was I satisfied at last. To have been thoroughly on the prairie, and in the prairie, I should have been a day's journey from tilled land but i doubt whether that could now be done in the state of illinois i got out into various patches and brought away specimens of corn ears bearing sixteen rows of grain with forty grains in each row each ear bearing a meal for a hungry man at last we did find ourselves on the prairie amid the waving grass with the land rolling on before us in a succession of gentle sweeps never rising so as to impede the view or apparently changing in its general level but yet without the monotony of flatness we were on the prairie but still i felt no satisfaction it was private property divided among holders and pastured over by private cattle salisbury plain is as wild and dartmoor almost wilder deer they told me were to be had within reach of dixon but for the buffalo one has to go much farther afield than illinois the farmer may rejoice in illinois but the hunter and the trapper must cross the big rivers and pass away into the western territories before he can find lands wild enough for his purposes my visit to the cornfields of illinois was in its way successful but i felt as i turned my face eastward toward chicago that i had no right to boast that i had as yet made acquaintance with a prairie all minds were turned to the war at dixon as elsewhere in illinois the men boasted that as regards the war they were the leading state of the union but the same boast was made in indiana and also in massachusetts and probably in half the states of the north and west they the illinoisans call their country the war nest of the west the population of the state is one million seven hundred thousand and it had undertaken to furnish sixty volunteer regiments of one thousand men each and let it be borne in mind that these regiments when furnished are really full absolutely containing the thousand men when they are sent away from the parent states the number of souls above named will give four hundred twenty thousand working men and if out of these sixty thousand are sent to the war the state which is almost purely agricultural will have given more than one man in eight when i was in illinois over forty regiments had already been sent forty-six if i remember rightly and there existed no doubt whatever as to the remaining number from the next state indiana with a population of one million three hundred fifty thousand giving something less than three hundred fifty thousand working men thirty-six regiments had been sent i fear that i am mentioning these numbers usque ad nauseam but i wish to impress upon english readers the magnitude of the effort made by the states in mustering and equipping an army within six or seven months of the first acknowledgment that such an army would be necessary the americans have complained bitterly of the want of english sympathy and i think they have been weak in making that complaint but i would not wish that they should hereafter have the power of complaining of a want of english justice there can be no doubt that a genuine feeling of patriotism was aroused throughout the north and west and that men rushed into the ranks actuated by that feeling men for whom war and army life a camp and fifteen dollars a month would not of themselves have had any attraction it came to that that young men were ashamed not to go into the army this feeling of course produced coercion and the movement was in that way tyrannical there is nothing more tyrannical than a strong popular feeling among a democratic people during the period of enlistment this tyranny was very strong but the existence of such a tyranny proves the passion and patriotism of the people it got the better of the love of money of the love of children and of the love of progress wives who with their bairns were absolutely dependent on their husbands labors would wish their husbands to be at war not to conduce in some special way toward the war to have neither father there nor brother nor son not to have lectured or preached or written for the war to have made no sacrifice for the war 
to have had no special and individual interest in the war was disgraceful one sees at a glance the tyranny of all this in such a country as the states one can understand how quickly adverse stories would spread themselves as to the opinion of any man who chose to remain tranquil at such a time one shudders at the absolute absence of true liberty which such a passion throughout a democratic country must engender but he who has observed all this must acknowledge that that passion did exist dollars children progress education and political rivalry all gave way to the one strong national desire for the thrashing and crushing of those who had rebelled against the authority of the stars and stripes when we were at dixon they were getting up the dement regiment the attempt at the time did not seem to be prosperous and the few men who had been collected had about them a forlorn ill-conditioned look but then as i was told dixon had already been decimated and redecimated by former recruiting colonels colonel dement from whom the regiment was to be named and whose military career was only now about to commence had come late into the field i did not afterward ascertain what had been his success but i hardly doubt that he did ultimately scrape together his thousand men why don't you go i said to a burly irishman who was driving me i'm not a sound man your honour said the irishman i'm deficient in me liver taking the irishman however throughout the union they had not been found deficient in any of the necessaries for a career of war i do not think that any men have done better than the irish in the american army from dixon we went to chicago chicago is in many respects the most remarkable city among all the remarkable cities of the union its growth has been the fastest and its success the most assured twenty-five years ago there was no chicago and now it contains one hundred twenty thousand inhabitants cincinnati on the ohio and st louis at the junction of the missouri and mississippi are larger towns but they have not grown large so quickly nor do they now promise so excessive a development of commerce chicago may be called the metropolis of american corn the favorite city haunt of the american series the goddess seats herself there amid the dust of her full barns and proclaims herself a goddess ruling over things political and philosophical as well as agricultural not furrows only are in her thoughts but free trade also and brotherly love and within her own bosom there is a boast that even yet she will be stronger than mars in chicago there are great streets and rows of houses fit to be the residences of a new corn exchange nobility they look out on the wide lake which is now the highway for breadstuffs and the merchant as he shaves at his window sees his rapid ventures as they pass away one after the other toward the east i went over one great grain store in chicago possessed by gentlemen of the name of sturgis and buckingham it was a world in itself and the dustiest of all the worlds it contained when i was there half a million bushels of wheat or a very great many as i might say in another language but it was not as a storehouse that this great building was so remarkable but as a channel or a river course for the flooding freshets of corn it is so built that both railway vans and vessels come immediately under its claws as i may call the great trunks of the elevators out of the railway vans the corn and wheat is clawed up into the building and down similar trunks it is at once again poured out into the vessels i shall be at buffalo in a page or two and then i will endeavour to explain more minutely how this is done at chicago the corn is bought and does change hands and much of it therefore is stored there for some space of time shorter or longer as the case may be when i was at chicago the only limit to the rapidity of its transit was set by the amount of boat accommodation there were not bottoms enough to take the corn away from chicago nor indeed on the railway was there a sufficiency of rolling stock or locomotive power to bring it into chicago as i said before the country was bursting with its own produce and smothered in its own fruits at chicago the hotel was bigger than other hotels and grander there were pipes without end for cold water which ran hot and for hot water which would not run at all the post office also was grander and bigger than other post offices though the postmaster confessed to me that the matter of the delivery of letters was one which could not be compassed 
just at that moment it was being done as a private speculation but it did not pay and would be discontinued the theatre too was large handsome and convenient but on the night of my attendance it seemed to lack an audience a good comic actor it did not lack and i never laughed more heartily in my life there was something wrong too just at that time i could not make out what in the constitution of illinois and the present moment had been selected for voting a new constitution to us in england such a necessity would be considered a matter of importance but it did not seem to be much thought of here some slight alteration probably i suggested no said my informant one of the judges of their courts it is to be a thorough radical change of the whole constitution they are voting the delegates to-day i went to see them vote the delegates but unfortunately got into a wrong place by invitation and was turned out not without some slight tumult i trust that the new constitution was carried through successfully from these little details it may perhaps be understood how a town like chicago goes on and prospers in spite of all the drawbacks which are incident to newness men in those regions do not mind failures and when they have failed instantly begin again they make their plans on a large scale and they who come after them fill up what has been wanting at first those taps of hot and cold water will be made to run by the next owner of the hotel if not by the present owner in another ten years the letters i do not doubt will all be delivered long before that time the theatre will probably be full the new constitution is no doubt already at work and if found deficient another will succeed to it without any trouble to the state or any talk on the subject through the union chicago was intended as a town of export for corn and therefore the corn stores have received the first attention when i was there they were in perfect working order from chicago we went on to cleveland a town in the state of ohio on lake erie again travelling by the sleeping cars i found that these cars were universally mentioned with great horror and disgust by americans of the upper class they always declared that they would not travel in them on any account noise and dirt were the two objections they are very noisy but to us belonged the happy power of sleeping down noise i invariably slept all through the night and knew nothing about the noise they are also very dirty extremely dirty dirty so as to cause much annoyance but then they are not quite so dirty as the day cars if dirt is to be a bar against travelling in america men and women must stay at home for myself i don't much care for dirt having a strong reliance on soap and water and scrubbing brushes no one regards poisons who carries antidotes in which he has perfect faith cleveland is another pleasant town pleasant as milwaukee and portland the streets are handsome and are shaded by grand avenues of trees one of these streets is over a mile in length and throughout the whole of it there are trees on each side not little paltry trees as are to be seen on the boulevards of paris but spreading elms the beautiful american elm which not only spreads but droops also and makes more of its foliage than any other tree extant and there is a square in cleveland well sized as large as russell square i should say with open paths across it and containing one or two handsome buildings i cannot but think that all men and women in london would be great gainers if the iron rails of the squares were thrown down and the grassy enclosures thrown open to the public of course the edges of the turf would be worn and the paths would not keep their exact shapes but the prison look would be banished and the sombre sadness of the squares would be relieved i was particularly struck by the size and comfort of the houses at cleveland all down that street of which i have spoken they do not stand continuously together but are detached and separate houses which in england would require some fifteen or eighteen hundred a year for their maintenance in the states however men commonly expend upon house rent a much greater proportion of their income than they do in england with us it is i believe thought that a man should certainly not apportion more than a seventh of his spending income to his house rent some say not more than a tenth but in many cities of the states a man is thought to live well within bounds if he so expends a fourth 
there can be no doubt as to americans living in better houses than englishmen making the comparison of course between men of equal incomes but the englishman has many more incidental expenses than the american he spends more on wine on entertainments on horses and on amusements he has a more numerous establishment and keeps up the adjuncts and outskirts of his residence with a more finished neatness these houses in cleveland were very good as indeed they are in most northern towns but some of them have been erected with an amount of bad taste that is almost incredible it is not uncommon to see in front of a square brick house a wooden quasi greek portico with a pediment and ionic columns equally high with the house itself wooden columns with greek capitals attached to the doorways and wooden pediments over the windows are very frequent as a rule these are attached to houses which without such ornamentation would be simple unpretentious square roomy residences an ionic or corinthian capital stuck on to a log of wood called a column and then fixed promiscuously to the outside of an ordinary house is to my eye the vilest of architectural pretenses little turrets are better than this or even brown battlements made of mortar except in america i do not remember to have seen these vicious bits of white timber timber painted white plastered on to the fronts and sides of red brick houses again we went on by rail to buffalo i have travelled some thousands of miles by railway in the states taking long journeys by night and longer journeys by day but i do not remember that while doing so i ever made acquaintance with an american to an american lady in a railway car i should no more think of speaking than i should to an unknown female in the next pew to me at a london church it is hard to understand from whence come the laws which govern societies in this respect but there are different laws in different societies which soon obtain recognition for themselves american ladies are much given to talking and are generally free from all mauvaise honte they are collected in manner well instructed and resolved to have their share of the social advantages of the world in this phase of life they come out more strongly than english women but on a railway journey be it ever so long they are never seen speaking to a stranger english women however on english railways are generally willing to converse they will do so if they be on a journey but will not open their mouths if they be simply passing backward and forward between their homes and some neighboring town we soon learn the rules on these subjects but who make the rules if you cross the atlantic with an american lady you invariably fall in love with her before the journey is over travel with the same woman in a railway car for twelve hours and you will have written her down in your own mind in quite other language than that of love and now for buffalo and the elevators i trust i have made it understood that corn comes into buffalo not only from chicago of which i have spoken specially but from all the ports round the lakes racine milwaukee grand haven port sarnia detroit toledo cleveland and many others at these ports the produce is generally bought and sold but at buffalo it is merely passed through a gateway it is taken from vessels of a size fitted for the lakes and placed in other vessels fitted for the canal this is the erie canal which connects the lakes with the hudson river and with new york the produce which passes through the welland canal the canal which connects lake erie and the upper lakes with lake ontario and the st lawrence is not transshipped seeing that the welland canal which is less than thirty miles in length gives a passage to vessels of five hundred tons as i have before said sixty million bushels of breadstuff were thus pushed through buffalo in the open months of the year eighteen sixty one these open months run from the middle of april to the middle of november but the busy period is that of the last two months the time that is which intervenes between the full ripening of the corn and the coming of the ice an elevator is as ugly a monster as has been yet produced in uncouthness of form it outdoes those obsolete old brutes who used to roam about the semi-aqueous world and live a most uncomfortable life with their great hungering stomachs and huge unsatisfied maws the elevator itself consists of a big movable trunk movable as is that of an elephant but not pliable and less graceful even than an elephant's this is attached to a huge granary or barn but in order to give altitude within the barn for the necessary moving up and down of this trunk 
seeing that it cannot be curled gracefully to its purposes as the elephant's is curled there is an awkward box erected on the roof of the barn giving some twenty feet of additional height up into which the elevator can be thrust it will be understood then that this big movable trunk the head of which when it is at rest is thrust up into the box on the roof is made to slant down in an oblique direction from the building to the river for the elevator is an amphibious institution and flourishes only on the banks of navigable waters when its head is ensconced within its box and the beast of prey is thus nearly hidden within the building the unsuspicious vessel is brought up within reach of the creature's trunk and down it comes like a mosquito's proboscis right through the deck in at the open aperture of the hole and so into the very vitals and bowels of the ship when there it goes to work upon its food with a greed and avidity that is disgusting to a beholder of any taste or imagination and now i must explain the anatomical arrangement by which the elevator still devours and continues to devour till the corn within its reach has all been swallowed masticated and digested its long trunk as seen slanting down from out of the building across the wharf and into the ship is a mere wooden pipe but this pipe is divided within it has two departments and as the grain-bearing troughs pass up the one on a pliable band they pass empty down the other the system therefore is that of an ordinary dredging machine only that the corn and not mud is taken away and that the buckets or troughs are hidden from sight below within the stomach of the poor bark three or four labourers are at work helping to feed the elevator they shovel the corn up toward its maw so that at every swallow he should take in all that he can hold thus the troughs as they ascend are kept full and when they reach the upper building they empty themselves into a chute over which a porter stands guard moderating the chute by a door which the weight of his finger can open and close through this doorway the corn runs into a measure and is weighed by measures of forty bushels each the tail is kept there stands the apparatus with the figures plainly marked over against the porter's eye and as the sum mounts nearly up to forty bushels he closes the door till the grains run thinly through hardly a handful at a time so that the balance is exactly struck then the teller standing by marks down his figure and the record is made the exact porter touches the string of another door and the forty bushels of corn run out at the bottom of the measure disappear down another chute slanting also toward the water and deposit themselves in the canal boat the transit of the bushels of corn from the larger vessel to the smaller will have taken less than a minute and the cost of that transit will have been a farthing but i have spoken of the rivers of wheat and i must explain what are those rivers in the working of the elevator which i have just attempted to describe the two vessels were supposed to be lying at the same wharf on the same side of the building in the same water the smaller vessel inside the larger one when this is the case the corn runs direct from the weighing measure into the chute that communicates with the canal boat but there is not room or time for confining the work to one side of the building there is water on both sides and the corn or wheat is elevated on the one side and reshipped on the other to effect this the corn is carried across the breadth of the building but nevertheless it is never handled or moved in its direction on trucks or carriages requiring the use of men's muscles for its motion across the floor of the building are two gutters or channels and through these small troughs on a pliable band circulate very quickly they which run one way in one channel are laden they which return by the other channel are empty the corn pours itself into these and they again pour it into the chute which commands the other water and thus rivers of corn are running through these buildings night and day the secret of all the motion and arrangement consists of course in the elevation the corn is lifted up and when lifted up can move itself and arrange itself and weigh itself and load itself i should have stated that all this wheat which passes through buffalo comes loose in bulk nothing is known of sacks or bags to any spectator at buffalo this becomes immediately a matter of course but this should be explained as we in england are not accustomed to see wheat travelling in this open unguarded and plebeian manner wheat with us is aristocratic and travels always in its private carriage 
over and beyond the elevators there is nothing specially worthy of remark at buffalo it is a fine city like all other american cities of its class the streets are broad the blocks are high and cars on tramways run all day and nearly all night as well End of chapter 11chapter twelve of north america volume one by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain twelve buffalo to new york we had now before us only two points of interest before we should reach new york the falls of trenton and west point on the hudson river we were too late in the year to get up to lake george which lies in the state of new york north of albany and is in fact the southern continuation of lake champlain lake george i know is very lovely and i would fain have seen it but visitors to it must have some hotel accommodation and the hotel was closed when we were near enough to visit it i was in its close neighbourhood three years since in june but then the hotel was not yet opened a visitor to lake george must be very exact in his time july and august are the months with perhaps the grace of a week in september the hotel at trenton was also closed as i was told but even if there were no hotel at trenton it can be visited without difficulty it is within a carriage drive of utica and there is moreover a direct railway from utica with a station at the trenton falls utica is a town on the line of railway from buffalo to new york via albany and is like all the other towns we had visited there are broad streets and avenues of trees and large shops and excellent houses a general air of fat prosperity pervades them all and is strong at utica as elsewhere i remember to have been told thirty years ago that a traveller might go far and wide in search of the picturesque without finding a spot more romantic in its loveliness than trenton falls the name of the river is canada creek west but as that is hardly euphonious the course of the water which forms the falls has been called after the town or parish this course is nearly two miles in length and along the space of this two miles it is impossible to say where the greatest beauty exists to see trenton aright one must be careful not to have too much water a sufficiency is no doubt desirable and it may be that at the close of summer before any of the autumnal rains have fallen there may occasionally be an insufficiency but if there is too much the passage up the rocks along the river is impossible the way on which the tourist should walk becomes the bed of the stream and the great charm of the place cannot be enjoyed that charm consists in descending into the ravine of the river down amid the rocks through which it has cut its channel and in walking up the bed against the stream in climbing the sides of the various falls and sticking close to the river till an envious block is reached which comes sheer down into the water and prevents farther progress this is nearly two miles above the steps by which the descent is made and not a foot of this distance but is wildly beautiful when the river is very low there is a pathway even beyond that block but when this is the case there can hardly be enough of water to make the fall satisfactory there is no one special cataract at trenton which is in itself either wonderful or preeminently beautiful it is the position form colour and a rapidity of the river which gives the charm it runs through a deep ravine at the bottom of which the water has cut for itself a channel through the rocks the sides of which rise sometimes with the sharpness of the walls of a stone sarcophagus they are rounded too toward the bed as i have seen the bottom of a sarcophagus along the side of the right bank of the river there is a passage which when the freshets come is altogether covered this passage is sometimes very narrow but in the narrowest parts an iron chain is affixed into the rock it is slippery and wet and it is well for ladies when visiting the place to be provided with outside india rubber shoes which keep a hold upon the stone if i remember rightly there are two actual cataracts one not far above the steps by which the descent is made into the channel and the other close under a summer-house near to which the visitors reascend into the wood but these cataracts though by no means despicable as cataracts leave comparatively a slight impression they tumble down with sufficient violence and the usual fantastic disposition of their forces but simply as cataracts within a day's journey of niagara they would be nothing 
up beyond the summer-house the passage along the river can be continued for another mile but it is rough and the climbing in some places rather difficult for ladies every man however who has the use of his legs should do it for the succession of rapids and the twisting of the channels and the forms of the rocks are as wild and beautiful as the imagination can desire the banks of the river are closely wooded on each side and though this circumstance does not at first seem to add much to the beauty seeing that the ravine is so deep that the absence of wood above would hardly be noticed still there are broken clefts ever and anon through which the colours of the foliage show themselves and straggling boughs and rough roots break through the rocks here and there and add to the wildness and charm of the whole the walk back from the summer-house through the wood is very lovely but it would be a disappointing walk to visitors who had been prevented by a flood in the river from coming up the channel for it indicates plainly how requisite it is that the river should be seen from below and not from above the best view of the larger fall itself is that seen from the wood and here again i would point out that any male visitor should walk the channel of the river up and down the descent is too slippery and difficult for bipeds laden with petticoats we found a small hotel open at trenton at which we got a comfortable dinner and then in the evening were driven back to utica albany is the capital of the state of new york and our road from trenton to west point lay through that town but these political state capitals have no interest in themselves the state legislature was not sitting and we went on merely remarking that the manner in which the railway cars are made to run backward and forward through the crowded streets of the town must cause a frequent loss of human life one is led to suppose that children in albany can hardly have a chance of coming to maturity such accidents do not become the subject of long-continued and strong comment in the states as they do with us but nevertheless i should have thought that such a state of things as we saw there would have given rise to some remark on the part of the philanthropists i cannot myself say that i saw anybody killed and therefore should not be justified in making more than this passing remark on the subject when first the americans of the northern states began to talk much of their country their claims as to fine scenery were confined to niagara and the hudson river of niagara i have spoken and all the world has acknowledged that no claim made on that head can be regarded as exaggerated as to the hudson i am not prepared to say so much generally though there is one spot upon it which cannot be beaten for sweetness i have been up and down the hudson by water and confess that the entire river is pretty but there is much of it that is not preeminently pretty among rivers as a whole it cannot be named with the upper mississippi with the rhine with the moselle or with the upper rhone the palisades just out of new york are pretty and the whole passage through the mountains from west point up to catskill and hudson is interesting but the glory of the hudson is at west point itself and thither on this occasion we went direct by railway and there we remained for two days the catskill mountains should be seen by a detour from off the river we did not visit them because here again the hotel was closed i will leave them therefore for the new handbook which mr murray will soon bring out of west point there is something to be said independently of its scenery it is the sandhurst of the states here is their military school from which officers are drafted to their regiments and the tuition for military purposes is i imagine of a high order it must of course be borne in mind that west point even as at present arranged is fitted to the wants of the old army and not to that of the army now required it can go but a little way to supply officers for five hundred thousand men but would do much towards supplying them for forty thousand at the time of my visit to west point the regular army of the northern states had not even swelled itself to the latter number i found that there were two hundred twenty students at west point that about forty graduate every year each of whom receives a commission in the army that about one hundred twenty pupils are admitted every year and that in the course of every year about eighty either resign or are called upon to leave on account of some deficiency or fail in their final examination the result is simply this that one-third of those who enter succeeds and that two-thirds fail the number of failures seemed to me to be terribly large so large as to give great ground of hesitation to a parent in accepting a nomination for the college 
i especially inquired into the particulars of these dismissals and resignations and was assured that the majority of them took place in the first year of the pupilage it is soon seen whether or no a lad has the mental and physical capacities necessary for the education and future life required of him and a care is taken that those shall be removed early as to whom it may be determined that the necessary capacity is clearly wanting if this is done and i do not doubt it the evil is much mitigated the effect otherwise would be very injurious the lads remain till they are perhaps one and twenty and have then acquired aptitudes for military life but no other aptitudes at that age the education cannot be commenced anew and moreover at that age the disgrace of failure is very injurious the period of education used to be five years but has now been reduced to four this was done in order that a double class might be graduated in eighteen sixty one to supply the wants of the war i believe it is considered that but for such necessity as that the fifth year of education can be ill spared the discipline to our english ideas is very strict in the first place no kind of beer wine or spirits is allowed at west point the law upon this point may be said to be very vehement for it debars even the visitors at the hotel from the solace of a glass of beer the hotel is within the bounds of the college and as the lads might become purchasers at the bar there is no bar allowed any breach of this law leads to instant expulsion or i should say rather any detection of such breach the officer who showed us over the college assured me that the presence of a glass of wine in a young man's room would secure his exclusion even though there should be no evidence that he had tasted it he was very firm as to this but a little bird of west point whose information though not official or probably accurate in words seemed to me to be worthy of reliance in general told me that eyes were wont to wink when such glasses of wine made themselves unnecessarily visible let us fancy an english mess of young men from seventeen to twenty-one at which a mug of beer would be felony and a glass of wine high treason but the whole management of the young with the american differs much from that in vogue with us we do not require so much at so early an age either in knowledge in morals or even in manliness in america if a lad be under control as at west point he is called upon for an amount of labour and a degree of conduct which would be considered quite transcendental and out of the question in england but if he be not under control if at the age of eighteen he be living at home or be from his circumstances exempt from professorial power he is a full-fledged man with his pipe apparatus and his bar acquaintances and then i was told at west point how needful and yet how painful it was that all should be removed who were in any way deficient in credit to the establishment our rules are very exact my informant told me but the carrying out of our rules is a task not always very easy as to this also i had already heard something from that little bird of west point but of course i wisely assented to my informant remarking that discipline in such an establishment was essentially necessary the little bird had told me that discipline at west point had been rendered terribly difficult by political interference a young man will be dismissed by the unanimous voice of the board and will be sent away and then after a week or two he will be sent back with an order from washington that another trial shall be given him the lad will march back into the college with all the honours of a victory and will be conscious of a triumph over the superintendent and his officers and is that common i asked not at the present moment i was told but it was common before the war while mr buchanan and mr pierce and mr polk were presidents no officer or board of officers then at west point was able to dismiss a lad whose father was a southerner and who had friends among the government not only was this true of west point but the same allegation is true as to all matters of patronage throughout the united states during the three or four last presidencies and i believe back to the time of jackson there has been an organized system of dishonesty in the management of all beneficial places under the control of the government i doubt whether any despotic court of europe has been so corrupt in the distribution of places that is in the selection of public officers as has been the assemblage of statesmen at washington and this is the evil which the country is now expiating with its blood and treasure 
it has allowed its knaves to stand in the high places and now it finds that knavish works have brought about evil results but of this i shall be constrained to say something further hereafter we went into all the schools of the college and made ourselves fully aware that the amount of learning imparted was far above our comprehension it always occurs to me in looking through the new schools of the present day that i ought to be thankful to persons who know so much for condescending to speak to me at all in plain english i said a word to the gentleman who was with me about horses seeing a lot of lads going to their riding lesson but he was down upon me and crushed me instantly beneath the weight of my own ignorance he walked me up to the image of a horse which he took to pieces bit by bit taking off skin muscle flesh nerves and bones till the animal was a heap of atoms and assured me that the anatomy of the horse throughout was one of the necessary studies of the place we afterward went to see the riding the horses themselves were poor enough this was accounted for by the fact that such of them as had been found fit for military service had been taken for the use of the army there is a gallery in the college in which are hung sketches and pictures by former students i was greatly struck with the merit of many of these there were some copies from well-known works of art of very high excellence when the age is taken into account of those by whom they were done i don't know how far the art of drawing as taught generally and with no special tendency to military instruction may be necessary for military training but if it be necessary i should imagine that more is done in that direction at west point than at sandhurst i found however that much of that in the gallery which was good had been done by lads who had not obtained their degree and who had shown an aptitude for drawing but had not shown any aptitude for other pursuits necessary to their intended career and then we were taken to the chapel and there saw displayed as trophies two of our own dear old english flags i have seen many a banner hung up in token of past victory and many a flag taken on the field of battle mouldering by degrees into dust on some chapel's wall but they have not been the flags of england till this day i had never seen our own colours in any position but one of self-assertion and independent power from the tone used by the gentleman who showed them to me i could gather that he would have passed them by had he not foreseen that he could not do so without my notice i don't know that we are right to put them there he said quite right was my reply as long as the world does such things in private life it is vulgar to triumph over one's friends and malicious to triumph over one's enemies we have not got so far yet in public life but i hope we are advancing toward it in the meantime i did not begrudge the americans our two flags if we keep flags and cannons taken from our enemies and show them about as signs of our own prowess after those enemies have become friends why should not others do so as regards us it clearly would not be well for the world that we should always beat other nations and never be beaten i did not begrudge that chapel our two flags but nevertheless the sight of them made me sick in the stomach and uncomfortable as an englishman i do not want to be ascendant over any one but it makes me very ill when any one tries to be ascendant over me i wish we could send back with our compliments all the trophies that we hold carriage paid and get back and return those two flags and any other flag or two of our own that may be doing similar duty about the world i take it that the parcel sent away would be somewhat more bulky than that which would reach us in return the discipline at west point seemed as i have said to be very severe but it seemed also that the severity could not in all cases be maintained the hours of study also were long being nearly continuous throughout the day english lads of that age could not do it i said thus confessing that english lads must have in them less power of sustained work than those of america they must do it here said my informant or else leave us and then he took us off to one of the young gentlemen's quarters in order that we might see the nature of their rooms we found the young gentleman fast asleep on his bed and felt uncommonly grieved that we should have thus intruded on him as the hour was one of those allocated by my informant in the distribution of the day to private study i could not but take the present occupation of the embryo warrior as an indication that the amount of labour required might be occasionally too much even for an american youth 
the heat makes one so uncommonly drowsy said the young man i was not the least surprised at the exclamation the air of the apartment had been warmed up to such a pitch by the hot pipe apparatus of the building that prolonged life to me would i should have thought be out of the question in such an atmosphere do you always have it as hot as this i asked the young man swore that it was so and with considerable energy expressed his opinion that all his health and spirits and vitality were being baked out of him he seemed to have a strong opinion on the matter for which i respected him but it had never occurred to him and did not then occur to him that anything could be done to moderate that deathly flow of hot air which came up to him from the neighbouring infernal regions he was pale in the face and all the lads there were pale american lads and lasses are all pale men at thirty and women at twenty-five have had all semblance of youth baked out of them infants even are not rosy and the only shades known on the cheeks of children are those composed of brown yellow and white all this comes of those damnable hot air pipes which every tenement in america is infested we cannot do without them they say our cold is so intense that we must heat our houses throughout open fireplaces in a few rooms would not keep our toes and fingers from the frost there is much in this the assertion is no doubt true and thereby a great difficulty is created it is no doubt quite within the power of american ingenuity to moderate the heat of these stoves and to produce such an atmosphere as may be most conducive to health in hospitals no doubt this will be done perhaps is done at present though even in hospitals i have thought the air hotter than it should be but hot air drinking is like dram drinking there is the machine within the house capable of supplying any quantity and those who consume it unconsciously increase their draughts and take their drams stronger and stronger till a breath of fresh air is felt to be a blast direct from boreas west point is at all points a military colony and as such belongs exclusively to the federal government as separate from the government of any individual state it is the purchased property of the united states as a whole and is devoted to the necessities of a military college no man could take a house there or succeed in getting even permanent lodgings unless he belonged to or were employed by the establishment there is no intercourse by road between west point and other towns or villages on the riverside and any such intercourse even by water is looked upon with jealousy by the authorities the wish is that west point should be isolated and kept apart for military instruction to the exclusion of all other purposes whatever especially love-making purposes the coming over from the other side of the water of young ladies by the ferry is regarded as a great hindrance they will come and then the military students will talk to them we all know to what such talking leads a lad when i was there had been tempted to get out of barracks in plain clothes in order that he might call on a young lady at the hotel and was in consequence obliged to abandon his commission and retire from the academy will that young lady ever again sleep quietly in her bed i should hope not an opinion was expressed to me that there should be no hotel in such a place that there should be no ferry no roads no means by which the attention of the students should be distracted that these military rasselasses should live in a happy military valley from which might be excluded both strong drinks and female charms those two poisons from which youthful military ardour is supposed to suffer so much it always seems to me that such training begins at the wrong end i will not say that nothing should be done to keep lads of eighteen from strong drinks i will not even say that there should not be some line of moderation with reference to feminine allurements but as a rule the restraint should come from the sense good feeling and education of him who is restrained there is no embargo on the beer shops either at harrow or at oxford and certainly none upon the young ladies occasional damage may accrue from habits early depraved or a heart too early and too easily susceptible but the injury so done is not i think equal to that inflicted by a draconian code of morals which will probably be evaded and will certainly create a desire for its evasion nevertheless i feel assured that west point taken as a whole is an excellent military academy and that young men have gone forth from it and will go forth from it fit for officers as far as training can make men fit 
the fault if fault there be is that which is to be found in so many of the institutions of the united states and is one so allied to a virtue that no foreigner has a right to wonder that it is regarded in the light of a virtue by all americans there has been an attempt to make the place too perfect in the desire to have the establishment self-sufficient at all points more has been attempted than human nature can achieve the lad is taken to west point and it is presumed that from the moment of his reception he shall expend every energy of his mind and body in making himself a soldier at fifteen he is not to be a boy at twenty he is not to be a young man he is to be a gentleman a soldier and an officer i believe that those who leave the college for the army are gentlemen soldiers and officers and therefore the result is good but they are also young men and it seems that they have become so not in accordance with their training but in spite of it but i have another complaint to make against the authorities of west point which they will not be able to answer so easily as that already preferred what right can they have to take the very prettiest spot on the hudson the prettiest spot on the continent one of the prettiest spots which nature with all her vagaries ever formed and shut it up from all the world for purposes of war would not any plain however ugly do for military exercises cannot broadsword goose step and double quick time be instilled into young hands and legs in any field of thirty forty or fifty acres i wonder whether these lads appreciate the fact that they are studying fourteen hours a day amid the sweetest river rock and mountain scenery that the imagination can conceive of course it will be said that the world at large is not excluded from west point that the ferry to the place is open and that there is even a hotel there closed against no man or woman who will consent to become a teetotaler for the period of his visit i must admit that this is so but still one feels that one is only admitted as a guest i want to go and live at west point and why should i be prevented the government had a right to buy it of course but government should not buy up the prettiest spots on a country's surface if i were an american i should make a grievance of this but americans will suffer things from their government which no englishman would endure it is one of the peculiarities of west point that everything there is in good taste the point itself consists of a bluff of land so formed that the river hudson is forced to run round three sides of it it is consequently a peninsula and as the surrounding country is mountainous on both sides of the river it may be imagined that the site is good the views both up and down the river are lovely and the mountains behind break themselves so as to make the landscape perfect but this is not all at west point there is much of buildings much of military arrangement in the way of cannons forts and artillery yards all these things are so contrived as to group themselves well into pictures there is no picture of architectural grandeur but everything stands well and where it should stand and the eye is not hurt at any spot i regard west point as a delightful place and was much gratified by the kindness i received there from west point we went direct to new york End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of North America, Volume One by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen, an apology for the war. I think it may be received as a fact that the northern states taken together sent a full tenth of their able-bodied men into the ranks of the army in the course of the summer and autumn of eighteen sixty one. The South, no doubt, sent a much larger proportion but the effect of such a drain upon the south would not be the same because the slaves were left at home to perform the agricultural work of the country i very much doubt whether any other nation ever made such an effort in so short a time to a people who can do this it may well be granted that they are in earnest and i do not think it should be lightly decided by any foreigner that they are wrong the strong and unanimous impulse of a great people is seldom wrong and let it be borne in mind that in this case both people may be right the people both of north and south each may have been guided by a just and noble feeling though each was brought to its present condition by bad government and dishonest statesmen 
there can be no doubt since the commencement of the war the american feeling against england has been very bitter all americans to whom i spoke on the subject admitted that it was so i as an englishman felt strongly the injustice of this feeling and lost no opportunity of showing or endeavouring to show that the line of conduct pursued by england toward the states was the only line which was compatible with her own policy and just interests and also with the dignity of the state's government i heard much of the tender sympathy of russia russia sent a flourishing general message saying that she wished the north might win and ending with some good general advice proposing peace it was such a message as strong nations sent to those which are weaker had england ventured on such counsel the diplomatic paper would probably have been returned to her it is i think manifest that an absolute and disinterested neutrality has been the only course which could preserve england from deserved rebuke a neutrality on which her commercial necessity for importing cotton or exporting her own manufactures should have no effect that our government would preserve such a neutrality i have always insisted and i believe it has been done with a pure and strict disregard to any selfish views on the part of great britain so far i think england may feel that she has done well in this matter but i must confess that i have not been so proud of the tone of all our people at home as i have been of the decisions of our statesmen it seems to me that some of us never tire in abusing the americans and calling them names for having allowed themselves to be driven into this civil war we tell them they are fools and idiots we speak of their doings as though there had been some plain course by which the war might have been avoided and we throw it in their teeth that they have no capability for war we tell them of the debt which they are creating and point out to them that they can never pay it we laugh at their attempt to sustain loyalty and to speak of them as a steady father of a family is wont to speak of some unthrifty prodigal who is throwing away his estate and hurrying from one ruinous debauchery to another and alas we too frequently allow to escape from us some expression of that satisfaction which one rival tradesman has in the downfall of another here you are with all your boasting is what we say you were going to whip all creation the other day and it has come to this brag is a good dog but hold fast is a better pray remember that if ever you find yourselves on your legs again that little advice about the two dogs is very well and was not altogether inapplicable but this is not the time in which it should be given putting aside slight asperities we will all own that the people of the states have been and are our friends and that as friends we cannot spare them for one englishman who brings home to his own heart a feeling of cordiality for france a belief in the affection of our french alliance there are ten who do so with reference to the states now in these days of their trouble i think that we might have borne with them more tenderly and how was it possible that they should have avoided this war i will not now go into the cause of it or discuss the course which it has taken but will simply take up the fact of the rebellion the south rebelled against the north and such being the case was it possible that the north should yield without a war it may very likely be well that hungary should be severed from austria or poland from russia or venice from austria taking englishmen in a lump they think that such separation would be well the subject people do not speak the language of those that govern them or enjoy kindred interests but when military efforts are made by those who govern hungary poland and venice to prevent such separation we do not say that russia and austria are fools we are not surprised that they should take up arms against the rebels but would be very much surprised indeed if they did not do so we know that nothing but weakness would prevent their doing so but if austria and russia insist on tying to themselves the people who do not speak their language or live in accordance with their habits and are not considered unreasonable in so insisting how much more thoroughly would they carry with them the sympathy of their neighbours in preventing any secession by integral parts of their own nationalities would england let ireland walk off by herself if she wished it in eighteen forty three she did wish it three-fourths of the irish population would have voted for such a separation but england would have prevented such a secession via armis had ireland driven her to the necessity of such prevention 
i will put it to any reader of history whether since government commenced it has not been regarded as the first duty of government to prevent a separation of the territories governed and whether also it has not been regarded as a point of honour with all nationalities to preserve uninjured each its own greatness and its own power i trust that i may not be thought to argue that all governments or even all nationalities should succeed in such endeavours few kings have fallen in my day in whose fate i have not rejoiced none i take it except that poor citizen king of the french and i can rejoice that england lost her american colonies and shall rejoice when spain has been deprived of cuba but i hold the citizen king of the french in small esteem seeing that he made no fight and i know that england was bound to struggle when the boston people threw her tea into the water spain keeps a tighter hand on cuba than we thought she would some ten years since and therefore she stands higher in the world's respect it may be well that the south should be divided from the north i am inclined to think that it would be well at any rate for the north but the south must have been aware that such division could only be effected in two ways either by agreement in which case the proposition must have been brought forward by the south and discussed by the north or by violence they chose the latter way as being the readier and the surer as most seceding nations have done o'connell when struggling for the secession of ireland chose the other and nothing came of it the south chose violence and prepared for it secretly and with great adroitness if that be not rebellion there never has been rebellion since history began and if civil war was ever justified in one portion of a nation by turbulence in another it has now been justified in the northern states of america what was the north to do this foolish north which has been so liberally told by us that she has taken up arms for nothing that she is fighting for nothing and will ruin herself for nothing when was she to take the first step toward peace surely every englishman will remember that when the earliest tidings of the coming quarrel reached us on the election of mr lincoln we all declared that any division was impossible it was a mere madness to speak of it the states which were so great in their unity would never consent to break up all their prestige and all their power by a separation would it have been well for the north then to say if the south wish it we will certainly separate after that when mr lincoln assumed the power to which he had been elected and declared with sufficient manliness and sufficient dignity also that he would make no war upon the south but would collect the customs and carry on the government did we turn round and advise him that he was wrong no the idea in england then was that his message was if anything too mild if he means to be president of the whole union england said he must come out with something stronger than that then came mr seward's speech which was in truth weak enough mr seward had ran mr lincoln very hard for the president's chair on the republican interest and was most unfortunately as i think made secretary of state by mr lincoln or by his party the secretary of state holds the highest office in the united states government under the president he cannot be compared to our prime minister seeing that the president himself exercises political power and is responsible for its exercise mr seward's speech simply amounted to a declaration that separation was a thing of which the union would neither hear speak nor if possible think things looked very like it but no they could never come to that the world was too good and especially the american world mr seward had no specific against secession but let every free man strike his breast look up to heaven determined to be good and all would go right a great deal had been expected from mr seward and when this speech came out we in england were a little disappointed and nobody presumed even then that the north would let the south go it will be argued by those who have gone into the details of american politics that an acceptance of the crittenden compromise at this point would have saved the war what is or was the crittenden compromise i will endeavour to explain hereafter but the terms and meaning of that compromise can have no bearing on the subject the republican party who were in power disapproved of that compromise and could not model their course upon it the republican party may have been right or may have been wrong 
but surely it will not be argued that any political party elected to power by a majority should follow the policy of a minority lest that minority should rebel i can conceive of no government more lowly placed than one which deserts the policy of the majority which supports it fearing either the tongues or arms of a minority as the next scene in the play the state of south carolina bombarded fort sumter was that to be the moment for a peaceable separation let us suppose that o'connell had marched down to the pigeon-house at dublin and had taken it in eighteen forty three let us say would that have been an argument to us for allowing ireland to set up for herself is that the way of men's minds or of the minds of nations the powers of the president were defined by law as agreed upon among all the states of the union and against that power and against that law south carolina raised her hand and the other states joined her in rebellion when circumstances had come to that it was no longer possible that the north should shun the war to my thinking the rights of rebellion are holy where would the world have been or where would the world hope to be without rebellion but let rebellion look the truth in the face and not blanch from its own consequences she has to judge her own opportunities and to decide on her own fitness success is the test of her judgment but rebellion can never be successful except by overcoming the power against which she raises herself she has no right to expect bloodless triumphs and if she be not the stronger in the encounter which she creates she must bear the penalty of her rashness rebellion is justified by being better served than constituted authority but cannot be justified otherwise now and again it may happen that rebellion's cause is so good that constituted authority will fall to the ground at the first glance of her sword this was so the other day in naples when garibaldi blew away the king's armies with a breath but this is not so often rebellion knows that it must fight and the legalized power against which rebels rise must of necessity fight also i cannot see at what point the north first sinned nor do i think that had the north yielded england would have honoured her for her meekness had she yielded without striking a blow she would have been told that she had suffered the union to drop asunder by her supineness she would have been twitted with cowardice and told that she was no match for southern energy it would then have seemed to those who sat in judgment on her that she might have righted everything by that one blow from which she had abstained but having struck that one blow and having found that it did not suffice could she then withdraw give way and own herself beaten has it been so usually with anglo-saxon pluck in such case as that would there have been no mention of those two dogs brag and hold fast the man of the northern states knows that he has bragged bragged as loudly as his english forefathers in that matter of bragging the british lion and the star-spangled banner may abstain from throwing mud at each other and now the northern man wishes to show that he can hold fast also looking at all this i cannot see that peace has been possible to the north as to the question of secession and rebellion being one and the same thing the point to me does not seem to bear an argument the confederation of states had a common army a common policy a common capital a common government and a common debt if one might secede any or all might secede and where then would be their property their debt and their servants a confederation with such a license attached to it would have been simply playing at national power if new york had seceded a state which stretches from the atlantic to british north america it would have cut new england off from the rest of the union was it legally within the power of new york to place the six states of new england in such a position and why should it be assumed that so suicidal a power of destroying a nationality should be inherent in every portion of the nation the states are bound together by a written compact but that compact gives each state no such power surely such a power would have been specified had it been intended that it should be given but there are axioms in politics as in mathematics which recommend themselves to the mind at once and require no argument for their proof men who are not argumentative perceive at once that they are true a part cannot be greater than the whole i think it is plain that the remnant of the union was bound to take up arms against those states which had illegally torn themselves off from her and if so 
she could only do so with such weapons as were at her hand. The United States Army had never been numerous or well-appointed, and of such officers and equipments as it possessed, the more valuable part was in the hands of the Southerners. It was clear enough that she was ill-provided, and that in going to war she was undertaking a work as to which she had still to learn many of the rudiments. But Englishmen should be the last to twit her with such ignorance. It is not yet ten years since we were all boasting that swords and guns were useless things, and that military expenditure might be cut down to any minimum figure that an economizing Chancellor of the Exchequer could name. Since that we have extemporized two if not three armies. There are our volunteers at home, and the army which holds India can hardly be considered as one with that which is to maintain our prestige in Europe and the West. We made some natural blunders in the Crimea, but in making those blunders we taught ourselves the trade. It is the misfortune of the northern states that they must learn these lessons in fighting their own countrymen. In the course of our history we have suffered the same calamity more than once. The roundheads, who beat the cavaliers and created English liberty, made themselves soldiers on the bodies of their countrymen. But England was not ruined by that civil war, nor was she ruined by those which preceded it. From out of these she came forth stronger than she entered them stronger better and more fit for a great destiny in the history of nations the northern states had nearly five hundred thousand men under arms when the winter of eighteen sixty one commenced and for that enormous multitude all commissariat requirements were well supplied camps and barracks sprang up through the country as though by magic clothing was obtained with a rapidity that has i think never been equalled the country had not been prepared for the fabrication of arms, and yet arms were put into the man's hands almost as quickly as the regiments could be mustered. The eighteen millions of the northern states lent themselves to the effort as one man. Each state gave the best it had to give. Newspapers were as rabid against each other as ever, but no newspaper could live which did not support the war. The South has rebelled against the law, and the law shall be supported this has been the cry and the heartfelt feeling of all men and it is a feeling which cannot but inspire respect we have heard much of the tyranny of the present government of the united states and of the tyranny also of the people they have both been very tyrannical the habeas corpus has been suspended by the word of one man arrests have been made on men who have been hardly suspected of more than secession principles arrests have i believe been made in cases which have been destitute even of any fair ground for such suspicion newspapers have been stopped for advocating views opposed to the feelings of the north as freely as newspapers were ever stopped in france for opposing the emperor a man has not been safe in the streets who was known to be a secessionist it must be at once admitted that opinion in the northern states was not free when i was there but has opinion ever been free anywhere on all subjects in the best built strongholds of freedom have there not always been questions on which opinion has not been free and must it not always be so when the decision of a people on any matter has become so to say unanimous when it has shown itself to be so general as to be clearly the expression of the nation's voice as a single chorus that decision becomes holy and may not be touched could any newspaper be produced in england which advocated the overthrow of the queen and why may not the passion for the union be as strong with the northern states as the passion for the crown is strong with us the crown with us is in no danger and therefore the matter is at rest but i think we must admit that in any nation let it be ever so free there may be points on which opinion must be held under restraint and as to those summary arrests and the suspension of the habeas corpus is there not something to be said for the state's government on that head also military arrests are very dreadful and the soul of a nation's liberty is that personal freedom from arbitrary interference which is signified to the world by those two unintelligible latin words a man's body shall not be kept in duress at any man's will but shall be brought up into open court with uttermost speed in order that the law may say whether or no it should be kept in duress that i take it is the meaning of habeas corpus 
and it is easy to see that the suspension of that privilege destroys all freedom and places the liberty of every individual at the mercy of him who has the power to suspend it nothing can be worse than this and such suspension if extended over any long period of years will certainly make a nation weak mean-spirited and poor but in a period of civil war or even of a widely extended civil commotion things cannot work in their accustomed grooves a lady does not willingly get out of her bedroom window with nothing on but her nightgown but when her house is on fire she is very thankful for an opportunity of doing so it is not long since the habeas corpus was suspended in parts of ireland and absurd arrests were made almost daily when that suspension first took effect it was grievous that there should be necessity for such a step and it is very grievous now that such necessity should be felt in the northern states but i do not think that it becomes englishmen to bear hardly upon americans generally for what has been done in that matter mr seward in an official letter to the british minister at washington which letter through official dishonesty found its way to the press claimed for the president the right of suspending the habeas corpus in the states whenever it might seem good to him to do so if this be in accordance with the law of the land which i think must be doubted the law of the land is not favorable to freedom for myself i conceive that mr lincoln and mr seward have been wrong in their law and that no such right is given to the president by the constitution of the united states this i will attempt to prove in some subsequent chapter but i think it must be felt by all who had given any thought to the constitution of the states that let what may be the letter of the law the presidents of the united states have had no such power it is because the states have been no longer united that mr lincoln has had the power whether it be given to him by the law or no and then as to the debt it seems to me very singular that we in england should suppose that a great commercial people would be ruined by a national debt as regards ourselves i have always looked on our national debt as the ballast in our ship we have a great deal of ballast but then the ship is very big the states also are taking in ballast at a rather rapid rate and we took it in quickly when we were about it but i cannot understand why their ship should not carry without shipwreck that which our ship has carried without damage and as i believe with positive advantage to its sailing the ballast if carried honestly will not i think bring the vessel to grief the fear is lest the ballast should be thrown overboard so much i have said wishing to plead the cause of the northern states before the bar of english opinion and thinking that there is ground for a plea in their favour but yet i cannot say that their bitterness against englishmen has been justified or that their tone toward england has been dignified their complaint is that they have received no sympathy from england but it seems to me that a great nation should not require an expression of sympathy during its struggle sympathy is for the weak rather than for the strong when i hear two powerful men contending together in an argument i do not sympathize with him who has the best of it but i watch the precision of his logic and acknowledge the effects of his rhetoric there has been a whining weakness in the complaints made by americans against england which has done more to lower them as a people in my judgment than any other part of their conduct during the present crisis when we were at war with russia the feeling of the states was strongly against us all their wishes were with our enemies when the indian mutiny was at its worst the feeling of france was equally adverse to us the joy expressed by the french newspapers was almost ecstatic but i do not think that on either occasion we bemoaned ourselves sadly on the want of sympathy shown by our friends on each occasion we took the opinion expressed for what it was worth and managed to live it down we listened to what was said and let it pass by when in each case we had been successful there was an end of our friends croakings but in the northern states of america the bitterness against england has amounted almost to a passion the players those chroniclers of the time have had no hits so sure as those which have been aimed at englishmen as cowards fools and liars no paper has dared to say that england has been true in her american policy the name of an englishman has been made a byword for reproach in private intercourse private amenities have remained 
i at any rate may boast that such has been the case as regards myself but even in private life i have been unable to keep down the feeling that i have always been walking over smothered ashes it may be that when the civil war in america is over all this will pass by and there will be nothing left of international bitterness but its memory it is sincerely to be hoped that this may be so that even the memory of the existing feeling may fade away and become unreal i for one cannot think that two nations situated as are the states and england should permanently quarrel and avoid each other but words have been spoken which will i fear long sound in men's ears and thoughts have sprung up which will not easily allow themselves to be extinguished End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen part one of north america volume one by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain fourteen new york part one speaking of new york as a traveller i have two faults to find with it in the first place there is nothing to see and in the second place there is no mode of getting about to see anything nevertheless new york is a most interesting city it is the third biggest city in the known world for those chinese congregations of unwinged ants are not cities in the known world in no other city is there a population so mixed and cosmopolitan in their modes of life and yet in no other city that i have seen are there such strong and ever visible characteristics of the social and political bearings of the nation to which it belongs new york appears to me as infinitely more american than boston chicago or washington it has no peculiar attribute of its own as have those three cities boston in its literature and accomplished intelligence chicago in its internal trade and washington in its congressional and state politics new york has its literary aspirations its commercial grandeur and heaven knows it has its politics also but these do not strike the visitor as being specially characteristic of the city that it is pre-eminently american is its glory or its disgrace as men of different ways of thinking may decide upon it free institutions general education and the ascendancy of dollars are the words written on every paving-stone along fifth avenue down broadway and up wall street every man can vote and values the privilege every man can read and uses the privilege every man worships the dollar and is down before his shrine from morning to night as regards voting and reading no american will be angry with me for saying so much of him and no englishman whatever may be his ideas as to the franchise in his own country will conceive that i have said aught to the dishonour of an american but as to that dollar worshipping it will of course seem that i am abusing the new yorkers we all know what a wretchedly wicked thing money is how it stands between us and heaven how it hardens our hearts and makes vulgar our thoughts dives has ever gone to the devil while lazarus has been laid up in heavenly lavender the hand that employs itself in compelling gold to enter the service of man has always been stigmatized as the ravisher of things sacred the world is agreed about that and therefore the new yorker is in a bad way there are very few citizens in any town known to me which under this dispensation are in a good way but the new yorker is in about the worst way of all other men the world over worship regularly at the shrine with matins and vespers knowns and complines and whatever other daily services may be known to the religious houses but the new yorker is always on his knees that is the amount of the charge which i bring against new york and now having laid on my paint thickly i shall proceed like an unskilful artist to scrape a great deal of it off again new york has been a leading commercial city in the world for not more than fifty or sixty years as far as i can learn its population at the close of the last century did not exceed sixty thousand and ten years later it had not reached one hundred thousand in eighteen sixty it had reached nearly eight hundred thousand in the city of new york itself to this number must be added the numbers of brooklyn williamsburg and jersey city in order that a true conception may be had of the population of this american metropolis seeing that those places are as much a part of new york as southwark is of london by this the total will be swelled to considerably above a million 
it will no doubt be admitted that this growth has been very fast and that new york may well be proud of it increase of population is i take it the only trustworthy sign of a nation's success or of a city's success we boast that london has beaten the other cities of the world and think that that boast is enough to cover all the social sins for which london has to confess her guilt new york beginning with sixty thousand sixty years since has now a million souls a million mouths all of which eat a sufficiency of bread all of which speak ore rotundo and almost all of which can read and this has come of its love of dollars for myself i do not believe that dives is so black as he is painted or that his peril is so imminent to reconcile such an opinion with holy writ might place me in some difficulty were i a clergyman clergymen in these days are surrounded by difficulties of this nature finding it necessary to explain away many old established teachings which narrowed the christian church and to open the door wide enough to satisfy the aspirations and natural hopes of instructed men the brethren of dives are now so many and so intelligent that they will no longer consent to be damned without looking closely into the matter themselves i will leave them to settle the matter with the church merely assuring them of my sympathy in their little difficulties in any case in which mere money causes the hitch to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow was man's curse in adam's day but is certainly man's blessing in our day and what is eating one's bread in the sweat of one's brow but making money i will believe no man who tells me that he would not sooner earn two loaves than one and if two then two hundred i will believe no man who tells me that he would sooner earn one dollar a day than two and if two then two hundred that is in the very nature of the argument ceteris paribus when a man tells me that he would prefer one honest loaf to two that are dishonest i will in all possible cases believe him so also a man may prefer one quiet loaf to two that are unquiet but under circumstances that are the same and to a man who is sane a whole loaf is better than half and two loaves are better than one the preachers have preached well but on this matter they have preached in vain dives has never believed that he will be damned because he is dives he has never even believed that the temptations incident to his position have been more than a fair counterpoise or even so much as a fair counterpoise to his opportunities for doing good all men who work desire to prosper by their work and they so desire by the nature given to them from god wealth and progress must go on hand in hand together let the accidents which occasionally divide them for a time happen as often as they may the progress of the americans has been caused by their aptitude for money-making and that continual kneeling at the shrine of the coined goddess has carried them across from new york to san francisco men who kneel at that shrine are called on to have ready wits and quick hands and not a little aptitude for self-denial the new yorker has been true to his dollar because his dollar has been true to him but not on this account can i nor on this account will any englishman reconcile himself to the savour of dollars which pervades the atmosphere of new york the ars celari artem is wanting the making of money is the work of man but he need not take his work to bed with him and have it ever by his side at table amid his family in church while he disports himself as he declares his passion to the girl of his heart in the moments of his softest bliss and at the periods of his most solemn ceremonies that many do so elsewhere than in new york in london for instance in paris among the mountains of switzerland and the steppes of russia i do not doubt but there is generally a veil thrown over the object of the worshipper's idolatry in new york one's ear is constantly filled with the fanatic's voice as he prays one's eyes are always on the familiar altar the frankincense from the temple is ever in one's nostrils i have never walked down fifth avenue alone without thinking of money i have never walked there with a companion without talking of it i fancy that every man there in order to maintain the spirit of the place should bear on his forehead a label stating how many dollars he is worth and that every label should be expected to assert a falsehood i do not think that new york has been less generous in the use of its money than other cities or that the men of new york generally are so 
perhaps i might go farther and say that in no city has more been achieved for humanity by the munificence of its richest citizens than in new york its hospitals asylums and institutions for the relief of all ailments to which flesh is heir are very numerous and beyond praise in the excellence of their arrangements and this has been achieved in a great degree by private liberality men in america are not as a rule anxious to leave large fortunes to their children the millionaire when making his will very generally gives back a considerable portion of the wealth which he has made to the city in which he made it the rich citizen is always anxious that the poor citizen shall be relieved it is a point of honour with him to raise the character of his municipality and to provide that the deaf and dumb the blind the mad the idiots the old and the incurable shall have such alleviation in their misfortune as skill and kindness can afford nor is the new yorker a hugger-mugger with his money he does not hide up his dollars in old stockings and keep rolls of gold in hidden pots he does not even invest it where it will not grow but only produce small though sure fruit he builds houses he speculates largely he spreads himself in trade to the extent of his wings and not seldom somewhat farther he scatters his wealth broadcast over strange fields trusting that it may grow with an increase of a hundredfold but bold to bear the loss should the strange field prove itself barren his regret at losing his money is by no means commensurate with his desire to make it in this there is a living spirit which to me divests the dollar-worshipping idolatry of something of its ugliness the hand when closed on the gold is instantly reopened the idolater is anxious to get but he is anxious also to spend he is energetic to the last and has no comfort with his stock unless it breeds with transatlantic rapidity of procreation so much i say being anxious to scrape off some of that daub of black paint with which i have smeared the face of my new yorker but not desiring to scrape it all off for myself i do not love to live amid the clink of gold and never have a good time as the americans say when the price of shares and percentages come up in conversation that state of men's minds here which i have endeavoured to explain tends i think to make new york disagreeable a stranger there who has no great interest in percentages soon finds himself anxious to escape by degrees he perceives that he is out of his element and had better go away he calls at the bank and when he shows himself ignorant as to the price at which his sovereigns should be done he is conscious that he is ridiculous he is like a man who goes out hunting for the first time at forty years of age he feels himself to be in the wrong place and is anxious to get out of it such was my experience of new york at each of the visits that i paid to it but yet i say again no other american city is so intensely american as new york it is generally considered that the inhabitants of new england the yankees properly so called have the american characteristics of physiognomy in the fullest degree the lantern jaws the thin and lithe body the dry face on which there has been no tint of the rose since the baby's long clothes were first abandoned the harsh thick hair the thin lips the intelligent eyes the sharp voice with the nasal twang not altogether harsh though sharp and nasal all these traits are supposed to belong especially to the yankee perhaps it was so once but at present they are i think more universally common in new york than in any other part of the states go to wall street the front of the astor house and the regions about trinity church and you will find them in their fullest perfection what circumstances of blood or food of early habit or subsequent education have created for the latter-day american his present physiognomy it is as completely marked as much his own as is that of any race under the sun that has bred in and in for centuries but the american owns a more mixed blood than any other race known the chief stock is english which is itself so mixed that no man can trace its ramifications with this are mingled the bloods of ireland holland france sweden and germany all this has been done within but a few years so that the american may be said to have no claim to any national type of face nevertheless no man has a type of face so clearly national as the american he is acknowledged by it all over the continent of europe and on his own side of the water is gratified by knowing that he is never mistaken for his english visitor 
i think it comes from the hot air pipes and from dollar worship in the jesuit his mode of dealing with things divine has given a peculiar cast of countenance and why should not the american be similarly moulded by his special aspirations as to the hot air pipes there can i think be no doubt that to them is to be charged the murder of all rosy cheeks throughout the states if the effect was to be noticed simply in the dry faces of the men about wall street i should be very indifferent to the matter but the young ladies of fifth avenue are in the same category the very pith and marrow of life is baked out of their young bones by the hot air chambers to which they are accustomed hot air is the great destroyer of american beauty in saying that there is very little to be seen in new york i have also said that there is no way of seeing that little my assertion amounts to this that there are no cabs to the reading world at large this may not seem to be much but let the reading world go to new york and it will find out how much the deficiency means in london in paris in florence in rome in the havana or at grand cairo the cab driver or attendant does not merely drive the cab or belabor the donkey but he is the visitor's easiest and cheapest guide in london the tower westminster abbey and madame tussaud are found by the stranger without difficulty and almost without a thought because the cab driver knows the whereabouts and the way space is moreover annihilated and the huge distances of the english metropolis are brought within the scope of mortal power but in new york there is no such institution in new york there are street omnibuses as we have there are street cars such as last year we declined to have and there are very excellent public carriages but none of these give you the accommodation of a cab nor can all of them combine to do so the omnibuses though clean and excellent were to me very unintelligible they have no conductor to them to know their different lines and usages a man should have made a scientific study of the city to those going up and down broadway i became accustomed but in them i was never quite at my ease the money has to be paid through a little hole behind the driver's back and should as i learned at last be paid immediately on entrance but in getting up to do this i always stumbled about and it would happen that when with considerable difficulty i had settled my own account two or three ladies would enter and would hand me without a word some coins with which i had no lifelong familiarity in order that i might go through the same ceremony on their account the change i would usually drop into the straw and then there would arise trouble and unhappiness before i became aware of that law as to instant payment bells used to be rung at me which made me uneasy i knew i was not behaving as a citizen should behave but i could not compass the exact points of my delinquency and then when i desired to escape the door being strapped up tight i would halloo vainly at the driver through the little hole whereas had i known my duty i should have rung a bell or pulled a strap according to the nature of the omnibus in question in a month or two all these things may possibly be learned but the visitor requires his facilities for locomotion at the first moment of his entrance into the city i heard it asserted by a lecturer in boston mr wendell phillips whose name there is a household word that citizens of the united states carried brains in their fingers as well as in their heads whereas common people by which mr phillips intended to designate the remnant of mankind beyond the united states were blessed with no such extended cerebral development having once learned this fact from mr phillips i understood why it was that a new york omnibus should be so disagreeable to me and at the same time so suitable to the wants of the new yorkers and then there are street cars very long omnibuses which run on rails but are dragged by horses they are capable of holding forty passengers each and as far as my experience goes carry an average load of sixty the fare of the omnibus is six cents or three pence that of the street car five cents or two pence half penny they run along the different avenues taking the length of the city in the upper or new part of the town their course is simple enough but as they descend to the bowery peck slip and pearl street nothing can be conceived more difficult or devious than their courses the broadway omnibus on the other hand is a straightforward honest vehicle in the lower part of the town 
becoming however dangerous and miscellaneous when it ascends to union square and the vicinities of fashionable life the street cars are manned with conductors and therefore are free from many of the perils of the omnibus but they have perils of their own they are always quite full by that i mean that every seat is crowded that there is a double row of men and women standing down the centre and that the driver's platform in front is full and also the conductor's platform behind that is the normal condition of a street car in the third avenue you as a stranger in the middle of the car wish to be put down at let us say eighty ninth street in the map of new york now before me the cross streets running from east to west are numbered up northward as far as one hundred fifty fourth street it is quite useless for you to give the number as you enter even an american conductor with brains all over him and an anxious desire to accommodate as is the case with all these men cannot remember you are left therefore in misery to calculate the number of the street as you move along vainly endeavouring through the misty glass to decipher the small numbers which after a day or two you perceive to be written on the lamp-posts but i soon gave up all attempts at keeping a seat in one of these cars it became my practice to sit down on the outside iron rail behind and as the conductor generally sat in my lap i was in a measure protected as for the inside of these vehicles the women of new york were i must confess too much for me i would no sooner place myself on a seat than i would be called on by a mute unexpressive but still impressive stare into my face to surrender my place from cowardice if not from gallantry i would always obey and as this led to discomfort and an irritated spirit i preferred nursing the conductor on the hard bar in the rear and here if i seem to say a word against women in america i beg that it may be understood that i say that word only against a certain class and even as to that class i admit that they are respectable intelligent and as i believe industrious their manners however are to me more odious than those of any other human beings that i ever met elsewhere nor can i go on with that which i have to say without carrying my apology further lest perchance i should be misunderstood by some american women whom i would not only exclude from my censure but would include in the very warmest eulogium which words of mine could express as to those of the female sex whom i love and admire the most i have known do know and mean to continue to know as far as in me may lie american ladies as bright as beautiful as grateful as sweet as mortal limits for brightness beauty grace and sweetness will permit they belong to the aristocracy of the land by whatever means they may have become aristocrats in america one does not inquire as to their birth their training or their old names the fact of their aristocratic power comes out in every word and look it is not only so with those who have travelled or with those who are rich i have found female aristocrats with families and slender means who have as yet made no grand tour across the ocean these women are charming beyond expression it is not only their beauty had he been speaking of such wendell phillips would have been right in saying that they have brains all over them so much for those who are bright and beautiful who are graceful and sweet and now a word as to those who to me are neither bright nor beautiful and who can be to none either graceful or sweet it is a hard task that of speaking ill of any woman but it seems to me that he who takes upon himself to praise incurs the duty of dispraising also where dispraise is or to him seems to be deserved the trade of a novelist is very much that of describing the softness sweetness and loving dispositions of women and this he does copying as best he can from nature but if he only sings of that which is sweet whereas that which is not sweet too frequently presents itself his song will in the end be untrue and ridiculous women are entitled to much observance from men but they are entitled to no observance which is incompatible with truth women by the conventional laws of society are allowed to exact much from men but they are allowed to exact nothing for which they should not make some adequate return it is well that a man should kneel in spirit before the grace and weakness of a woman but it is not well that he should kneel either in spirit or body if there be neither grace nor weakness a man should yield everything to a woman for a word for a smile to one look of entreaty 
but if there be no look of entreaty no word no smile i do not see that he is called upon to yield much the happy privileges with which women are at present blessed have come to them from the spirit of chivalry that spirit has taught man to endure in order that women may be at their ease and has generally taught women to accept the ease bestowed on them with grace and thankfulness but in america the spirit of chivalry has sunk deeper among men than it has among women it must be borne in mind that in that country material well-being and education are more extended than with us and that therefore men there have learned to be chivalrous who with us have hardly progressed so far the conduct of men to women throughout the states is always gracious they have learned the lesson but it seems to me that the women have not advanced as far as the men have done they have acquired a sufficient perception of the privileges which chivalry gives them but no perception of that return which chivalry demands from them women of the class to which i allude are always talking of their rights but seem to have a most indifferent idea of their duties they have no scruple at demanding for men everything that a man can be called on to relinquish in a woman's behalf but they do so without any of that grace which turns the demand made into a favor conferred i have seen much of this in various cities of america but much more of it in new york than elsewhere i have heard young americans complain of it swearing that they must change the whole tenor of their habits toward women i have heard american ladies speak of it with loathing and disgust for myself i have entertained on sundry occasions that sort of feeling for an american woman which the close vicinity of an unclean animal produces i have spoken of this with reference to street cars because in no position of life does an unfortunate man become more liable to these anti-feminine atrocities than in the centre of one of these vehicles the woman as she enters drags after her a misshapen dirty mass of battered wire-work which she calls her crinoline and which adds as much to her grace and comfort as a log of wood does to a donkey when tied to an animal's leg in a paddock of this she takes much heed not managing it so that it may be conveyed up the carriage with some decency but striking it about against men's legs and heaving it with violence over people's knees the touch of a real woman's dress is in itself delicate but these blows from a harpy's fins are as loathsome as a snake's slime if there be two of them they talk loudly together having a theory that modesty has been put out of court by women's rights but though not modest the woman i describe is ferocious in her propriety she ignores the whole world around her as she sits with a raised chin and face flattened by affectation she pretends to declare aloud that she is positively not aware that any man is even near her she speaks as though to her in her womanhood the neighbourhood of men was the same as that of dogs or cats they are there but she does not hear them see them or even acknowledge them by any courtesy of motion but her own face always gives her the lie in her assumption of indifference she displays her nasty consciousness and in each attempt at a would-be propriety is guilty of an immodesty who does not know the timid retiring face of the young girl who when alone among men unknown to her feels that it becomes her to keep herself secluded as many men as there are around her so many nights has such a one ready bucklered for her service should occasion require such services should it not she passes unmolested but not as she herself will wrongly think unheeded but as to her of whom i am speaking we may say that every twist of her body and every tone of her voice is an unsuccessful falsehood she looks square at you in the face and you rise to give her your seat you rise from a deference to your own old convictions and from that courtesy which you have ever paid to a woman's dress let it be worn with ever such hideous deformities she takes the place from which you have moved without a word or a bow she twists herself round banging your shins with her wires while her chin is still raised and her face is still flattened and she directs her friend's attention to another seated man as though that place were also vacant and necessarily at her disposal. perhaps the man opposite has his own ideas about chivalry i have seen such a thing and have rejoiced to see it you will meet these women daily hourly everywhere in the streets now and again you will find them in society making themselves even more odious there than elsewhere who they are whence they come 
and why they are so unlike that other race of women of which i have spoken you will settle for yourself do we not all say of our chance acquaintances after half an hour's conversation nay after half an hour spent in the same room without conversation that this woman is a lady and that that other woman is not they jostle each other even among us but never seem to mix they are closely allied but neither imbues the other with her attributes both shall be equally well born or both shall be equally ill born but still it is so the contrast exists in england but in america it is much stronger in england women become ladylike or vulgar in the states they are either charming or odious see that female walking down broadway she is not exactly such a one as her i have attempted to describe on her entrance into the street-car for this lady is well dressed if fine clothes will make well dressing the machinery of her hoops is not battered and altogether she is a personage much more distinguished in all her expenditures but yet she is a copy of the other woman look at the train which she drags behind her over the dirty pavement where dogs have been and chewers of tobacco and everything concerned with filth except a scavenger at every hundred yards some unhappy man treads upon the silken swab which she trails behind her loosening it dreadfully at the girth one would say and then see the style of face and the expression of features with which she accepts the sinner's half-muttered apology the world she supposes owes her everything because of her silken train even room enough in a crowded thoroughfare to drag it along unmolested but according to her theory she owes the world nothing in return she is a woman with perhaps a hundred dollars on her back and having done the world the honour of wearing them in the world's presence expects to be repaid by the world's homage and chivalry but chivalry owes her nothing nothing though she walk about beneath a hundred times a hundred dollars nothing even though she be a woman let every woman learn this that chivalry owes her nothing unless she also acknowledges her debt to chivalry she must acknowledge it and pay it and then chivalry will not be backward in making good her claims upon it all this has come of the street-cars but as it was necessary that i should say it somewhere it is as well said on that subject as on any other and now to continue with the street-cars they run as i have said the length of the town taking parallel lines they will take you from the astor house near the bottom of the town for miles and miles northward halfway up the hudson river for i believe five pence they are very slow averaging about five miles an hour but they are very sure for regular inhabitants who have to travel five or six miles perhaps to their daily work they are excellent i have nothing really to say against the street-cars but they do not fill the place of cabs there are however public carriages roomy vehicles dragged by two horses clean and nice and very well suited to ladies visiting the city but they have none of the attributes of the cab as a rule they are not to be found standing about they are very slow they are very dear a dollar an hour is the regular charge but one cannot regulate one's motion by the hour going out to dinner and back costs two dollars over a distance which in london would cost two shillings as a rule the cost is four times that of a cab and the rapidity half that of a cab under these circumstances i think i am justified in saying that there is no mode of getting about in new york to see anything and now as to the other charge against new york of there being nothing to see how should there be anything there to see of general interest in other large cities cities as large in name as new york there are works of art fine buildings ruins ancient churches picturesque costumes and the tombs of celebrated men but in new york there are none of these things art has not yet grown up there one or two fine figures by crawford are in the town especially that of the sorrowing indian at the rooms of the historical society but art is a luxury in a city which follows but slowly on the heels of wealth and civilization of fine buildings which indeed are comprised in art there are none deserving special praise or remark it might well have been that new york should ere this have graced herself with something grand in architecture but she has not done so some good architectural effect there is and much architectural comfort 
of ruins of course there can be none none at least of such ruins as travellers admire though perhaps some of that sort which disgraces rather than decorates churches there are plenty but none that are ancient the costume is the same as our own and i need hardly say that it is not picturesque and the time for the tombs of celebrated men has not yet come a great man's ashes are hardly of value till they have all but ceased to exist the visitor to new york must seek his gratification and obtain his instruction from the habits and manners of men the american though he dresses like an englishman and eats roast beef with a silver fork or sometimes with a steel knife as does an englishman is not like an englishman in his mind in his aspirations in his taste or in his politics in his mind he is quicker more universally intelligent more ambitious of general knowledge less indulgent of stupidity and ignorance in others harder sharper brighter with the surface brightness of steel than is an englishman but he is more brittle less enduring less malleable and i think less capable of impressions the mind of the englishman has more imagination but that of the american more incision the american is a great observer but he observes things material rather than things social or picturesque he is a constant and ready speculator but all speculations even those which come of philosophy are with him more or less material in his aspirations the american is more constant than an englishman or i should rather say he is more constant in aspiring every citizen of the united states intends to do something every one thinks himself capable of some effort but in his aspirations he is more limited than an englishman the ambitious american never soars so high as the ambitious englishman he does not even see up to so great a height and when he has raised himself somewhat above the crowd becomes sooner dizzy with his own altitude an american of mark though always anxious to show his mark is always fearful of a fall in his tastes the american imitates the frenchman who shall dare to say that he is wrong seeing that in general matters of design and luxury the french have won for themselves the foremost name i will not say that the american is wrong but i cannot avoid thinking that he is so i detest what is called french taste but the world is against me when i complained to a landlord of a hotel out in the west that his furniture was useless that i could not write at a marble table whose outside rim was curved into fantastic shapes that a gold clock in my bedroom which did not go would give me no aid in washing myself that a heavy immovable curtain shut out the light and that papier-mache chairs with small fluffy velvet seats were bad to sit on he answered me completely by telling me that his house had been furnished not in accordance with the taste of england but with that of france i acknowledged the rebuke gave up my pursuits of literature and cleanliness and hurried out of the house as quickly as i could all america is now furnishing itself by the rules which guided that hotel-keeper i do not merely allude to actual household furniture to chairs tables and detestable gilt clocks the taste of america is becoming french in its conversation french in its comforts and french in its discomforts french in its eating and french in its dress french in its manners and will become french in its art there are those who will say that english taste is taking the same direction i do not think so i strongly hope that it is not so and therefore i say that an englishman and an american differ in their taste End of chapter fourteen part one Chapter Fourteen, Part Two of North America, Volume One, by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourteen, New York, Part Two. But of all differences between an Englishman and an American, that in politics is the strongest and the most essential. I cannot here, in one paragraph, define that difference with sufficient clearness to make my definition satisfactory but i trust that some idea of that difference may be conveyed by the general tenor of my book the american and the englishman are both republicans the government of the states and of england are probably the two purest republican governments in the world i do not of course here mean to say that the governments are more pure than others but that the systems are more absolutely republican 
and yet no men can be much farther asunder in politics than the englishman and the american the american of the present day puts a ballot-box into the hands of every citizen and takes his stand upon that and that only it is the duty of an american citizen to vote and when he has voted he need trouble himself no further till the time for voting shall come round again the candidate for whom he has voted represents his will if he have voted with the majority and in that case he has no right to look for further influence if he have voted with the minority he has no right to look for any influence at all in either case he has done his political work and may go about his business till next year or the next two or four years shall have come round the englishman on the other hand will have no ballot box and is by no means inclined to depend exclusively upon voters or upon voting as far as voting can show it he desires to get the sense of the country but he does not think that that sense will be shown by universal suffrage he thinks that property amounting to a thousand pounds will show more of that sense than property amounting to a hundred but he will not on that account go to work and apportion votes to wealth he thinks that the educated can show more of that sense than the uneducated but he does not therefore lay down any rule about reading writing and arithmetic or apportion votes to learning he prefers that all these opinions of his shall bring themselves out and operate by their own intrinsic weight nor does he at all confine himself to voting in his anxiety to get the sense of the country he takes it in any way that it will show itself uses it for what it is worth or perhaps far more than it is worth and welds it into that gigantic lever by which the political action of the country is moved every man in great britain whether he possesses any actual vote or no can do that which is tantamount to voting every day of his life by the mere expression of his opinion public opinion in america has hitherto been nothing unless it has managed to express itself by a majority of ballot boxes public opinion in england is everything let votes go as they may let the people want a measure and there is no doubt of their obtaining it only the people must want it as they did want catholic emancipation reform and corn law repeal and as they would want war if it were brought home to them that their country was insulted in attempting to describe this difference in the political action of the two countries i am very far from taking all praise for england and throwing any reproach on the states the political action of the states is undoubtedly the more logical and the clearer that indeed of england is so illogical and so little clear that it would be quite impossible for any other nation to assume it merely by resolving to do so whereas the political action of the states might be assumed by any nation to-morrow and all its strength might be carried across the water in a few written rules as are the prescriptions of a physician or the regulations of an infirmary with us the thing has grown of habit has been fostered by tradition has crept up uncared for and in some parts unnoticed it can be written in no book can be described in no words can be copied by no statesman and i almost believe can be understood by no people but that to whose peculiar uses it has been adapted in speaking as i have done here of american taste and american politics i must allude to a special class of americans who are to be met more generally in new york than elsewhere men who are educated who have generally travelled who are almost always agreeable but who as regards their politics are to me the most objectionable of all men as regards taste they are objectionable to me also but that is a small thing and as they are quite as likely to be right as i am i will say nothing against their taste but in politics it seems to me that these men have fallen into the bitterest and perhaps into the basest of errors of the man who begins his life with mean political ideas having sucked them in with his mother's milk there may be some hope the evil is at any rate the fault of his forefathers rather than of himself but who can have hope of him who having been thrown by birth and fortune into the running river of free political activity has allowed himself to be drifted into the stagnant level of general political servility there are very many such americans they call themselves republicans and sneer at the idea of a limited monarchy but they declare that there is no republic so safe so equal for all men so purely democratic as that now existing in france under the french empire all men are equal there is no aristocracy 
no oligarchy no overshadowing of the little by the great one superior is admitted admitted on earth as a superior is also admitted in heaven under him everything is level and provided he be not impeded everything is free he knows how to rule and the nation allowing him the privilege of doing so can go along its course safely can eat drink and be merry if few men can rise high so also can few men fall low political equality is the one thing desirable in a commonwealth and by this arrangement political equality is obtained such is the modern creed of many an educated republican of the states to me it seems that such a political state is about the vilest to which a man can descend it amounts to a tacit abandonment of the struggle which men are making for political truth and political beneficence in order that bread and meat may be eaten in peace during the score of years or so that are at the moment passing over us the politicians of this class have decided for themselves that the summum bonum is to be found in bread and the circus games if they be free to eat free to rest free to sleep free to drink little cups of coffee while the world passes before them on a boulevard they have that freedom which they covet but equality is necessary as well as freedom there must be no towering trees in this parterre to overshadow the clipped shrubs and destroy the uniformity of a growth which should never mount more than two feet above the earth the equality of this politician would forbid any to rise above him instead of inviting all to rise up to him it is the equality of fear and of selfishness and not the equality of courage and philanthropy and brotherhood too must be invoked fraternity as we may better call it in the jargon of the school such politicians tell one much of fraternity and define it too it consists in a general raising of the hat to all mankind in a daily walk that never hurries itself into a jostling trot inconvenient to passengers on the pavement in a placid voice a soft smile and a small cup of coffee on a boulevard it means all this but i could never find that it meant any more there is a nation for which one is almost driven to think that such political aspirations as these are suitable but that nation is certainly not the states of america and yet one finds many american gentlemen who have allowed themselves to be drifted into such a theory they have begun the world as republican citizens and as such they must go on but in their travels and their studies and in the luxury of their life they have learned to dislike the rowdiness of their country's politics they want things to be soft and easy as republican as you please but with as little noise as possible the president is there for four years why not elect him for eight for twelve or for life for eternity if it were possible to find one who could continue to live it is to this way of thinking that americans are driven when the polish of europe has made the roughness of their own elections odious to them have you seen any of our great institutions sir that of course is a question which is put to every englishman who has visited new york and the englishman who intends to say that he has seen new york should visit many of them i went to schools hospitals lunatic asylums institutes for deaf and dumb waterworks historical societies telegraph offices and large commercial establishments i rather think that i did my work in a thorough and conscientious manner and i owe much gratitude to those who guided me on such occasions perhaps i ought to describe all these institutions but were i to do so i fear that i should inflict fifty or sixty very dull pages on my readers if i could make all that i saw as clear and intelligible to others as it was made to me who saw it i might do some good but i know that i should fail i marvelled much at the developed intelligence of a room full of deaf and dumb pupils and was greatly astonished at the performance of one special girl who seemed to be brighter and quicker and more rapidly easy with her pen than girls generally are who can hear and talk but i cannot convey my enthusiasm to others on such a subject a writer may be correct may be exhaustive may be statistically great but he can hardly be entertaining and the chances are that he will not be instructive in all such matters however new york is preeminently great all through the states suffering humanity receives so much attention that humanity can hardly be said to suffer 
the daily recurring boast of our glorious institution sir always provokes the ridicule of an englishman the words have become ridiculous and it would i think be well for the nation if the term institution could be excluded from its vocabulary but in truth they are glorious the country in this respect boasts but it has done that which justifies a boast the arrangements for supplying new york with water are magnificent the drainage of the new part of the city is excellent the hospitals are almost alluring the lunatic asylum which i saw was perfect though i did not feel obliged to the resident physician for introducing me to all the worst patients as countrymen of my own an english lady mr trollope i'll introduce you quite a hopeless case two old women they've been here fifty years they're english another gentleman from england mr trollope a very interesting case confirmed in ebriety and as to the schools it is almost impossible to mention them with too high a praise i am speaking here especially of new york though i might say the same of boston or of all new england i do not know any contrast that would be more surprising to an englishman up to that moment ignorant of the matter than that which he would find by visiting first of all a free school in london and then a free school in new york if he would also learn the number of children that are educated gratuitously in each of the two cities and also the number in each which altogether lack education he would if susceptible of statistics be surprised also at that but seeing and hearing are always more effective than mere figures the female pupil at a free school in london is as a rule either a ragged pauper or a charity girl if not degraded at least stigmatized by the badges and dress of the charity we englishmen know well the type of each and have a fairly correct idea of the amount of education which is imparted to them we see the result afterward when the same girls become our servants and the wives of our grooms and porters the female pupil at a free school in new york is neither a pauper nor a charity girl she is dressed with the utmost decency she is perfectly cleanly in speaking to her you cannot in any degree guess whether her father has a dollar a day or three thousand dollars a year nor will you be enabled to guess by the manner in which her associates treat her as regards her own manner to you it is always the same as though her father were in all respects your equal as to the amount of her knowledge i fairly confess that it is terrific when in the first room which i visited a slight slim creature was had up before me to explain to me the properties of the hypothenuse i fairly confess that as regards education i backed down and that i resolved to confine my criticisms to manner dress and general behaviour in the next room i was more at my ease finding that ancient roman history was on the tapis why did the romans run away with the sabine women asked the mistress herself a young woman of about three-and-twenty because they were pretty simpered out a little girl with a cherry mouth the answer did not give complete satisfaction and then followed a somewhat abstruse explanation on the subject of population it was all done with good faith and a serious intent and showed what it was intended to show that the girls there educated had in truth reached the consideration of important subjects and that they were leagues beyond that terrible repetition of a b c to which i fear that most of our free metropolitan schools are still necessarily confined you and i reader were we called on to superintend the education of girls of sixteen might not select as favourite points either the hypotenuse or the ancient methods of populating young colonies there may be and to us on the european side of the atlantic there will be a certain amount of absurdity in the transatlantic idea that all knowledge is knowledge and that it should be imparted if it be not knowledge of evil but as to the general result no fair-minded man or woman can have a doubt that the lads and girls in these schools are excellently educated comes home as a fact to the mind of any one who will look into the subject that girl could not have got as fair at the hypothenuse without a competent and abiding knowledge of much that is very far beyond the outside limits of what such girls know with us it was at least manifest in the other examination that the girls knew as well as i did who were the romans and who were the sabine women that all this is of use was shown in the very gestures and bearings of the girl emolite mores as colonel newcomb used to say 
that young woman whom i had watched while she cooked her husband's dinner upon the banks of the mississippi had doubtless learned all about the sabine women and i feel assured that she cooked her husband's dinner all the better for that knowledge and faced the hardships of the world with a better front than she would have done had she been ignorant on the subject in order to make a comparison between the schools of london and those of new york i have called them both free schools they are in fact more free in new york than they are in london because in new york every boy and girl let his parentage be what it may can attend these schools without any payment thus an education as good as the american mind can compass prepared with every care carried on by highly paid tutors under ample surveillance provided with all that is most excellent in the way of rooms desks books charts maps and implements is brought actually within the reach of everybody i need not point out to englishmen how different is the nature of schools in london it must not however be supposed that these are charity schools such is not their nature let us say what we may as to the beauty of charity as a virtue the recipient of charity in its customary sense among us is ever more or less degraded by the position in the states that has been fully understood and the schools to which i allude are carefully preserved from any such taint throughout the states a separate tax is levied for the maintenance of these schools and as the taxpayer supports them he is of course entitled to the advantage which they confer the child of the non-taxpayer is also entitled and to him the boon if strictly analyzed will come in the shape of a charity but under the system as it is arranged this is not analyzed it is understood that the school is open to all in the ward to which it belongs and no inquiry is made whether the pupil's parent has or has not paid anything toward the school's support i found this theory carried out so far that at the deaf and dumb school where some of the poorer children are wholly provided by the institution care is taken to clothe them in dresses of different colours and different make in order that nothing may attach to them which has the appearance of a badge political economists will see something of evil in this but philanthropists will see very much that is good it is not without a purpose that i have given this somewhat glowing account of a girl's school in new york so soon after my little picture of new york women as they behave themselves in the streets and street cars it will of course be said that those women of whom i have spoken by no means in terms of admiration are the very girls whose education has been so excellent this of course is so but i beg to remark that i have by no means said that an excellent school education will produce all female excellencies the fact i take it is this that seeing how high in the scale these girls have been raised one is anxious that they should be raised higher one is surprised at their pert vulgarity and hideous airs not because they are so low in our general estimation but because they are so high women of the same class in london are humble enough and therefore rarely offend us who are squeamish they show by their gestures that they hardly think themselves good enough to sit by us they apologize for their presence they conceive it to be their duty to be lowly in their gesture the question is which is best the crouching and crawling or the impudent unattractive self-composure not my reader which action on her part may the better conduce to my comfort or to yours that is by no means the question which is the better for the woman herself that i take it is the point to be decided that there is something better than either we shall all agree but to my thinking the crouching and crawling is the lowest type of all at that school i saw some five or six hundred girls collected in one room and heard them sing the singing was very pretty and it was all very nice but i own that i was rather startled and to tell the truth somewhat abashed when i was invited to say a few words to them no idea of such a suggestion had dawned upon me and i felt myself quite at a loss to be called up before five hundred men is bad enough but how much worse before that number of girls what could i say but that they were all very pretty as far as i can remember i did say that and nothing else very pretty they were and neatly dressed and attractive but among them all there was not a pair of rosy cheeks how should there be when every room in the building was heated up to the condition of an oven by those damnable hot air pipes 
in england a taste for very large shops has come up during the last twenty years a firm is not doing a good business or at any rate a distinguished business unless he can assert in his trade card that he occupies at least half a dozen houses numbers one hundred five one hundred six seven eight nine and ten the old way of paying for what you want over the counter is gone and when you buy a yard of tape or a new carriage for either of which articles you will probably visit the same establishment you go through about the same amount of ceremony as when you sell a thousand pounds out of the stocks in propria persona but all this is still further exaggerated in new york mr stewart's store there is perhaps the handsomest institution in the city and his hall of audience for new carpets is a magnificent saloon you have nothing like that in england my friend said to me as he walked me through it in triumph i wish we had nothing approaching to it i answered for i confess to a liking for the old-fashioned private shops harper's establishment for the manufacture and sale of books is also very wonderful everything is done on the premises down to the very colouring of the paper which lines the covers and places the gilding on their backs the firm prints engraves electroplates sews binds publishes and sells wholesale and retail i have no doubt that the authors have rooms in the attics where the other slight initiatory step is taken toward the production of literature new york is built upon an island which is i believe about ten miles long counting from the southern point at the battery up to carmansville to which place the city is presumed to extend northward this island is called manhattan a name which i have always thought would have been more graceful for the city than that of new york it is formed by the sound or east river which divides the continent from long island by the hudson river which runs into the sound or rather joins it at the city foot and by a small stream called the harlem river which runs out of the hudson and meanders away into the sound at the north of the city thus cutting the city off from the mainland the breadth of the island does not much exceed two miles and therefore the city is long and not capable of extension in point of breadth in its old days it clustered itself round about the point and stretched itself up from there along the quays of the two waters the streets down in this part of the town are devious enough twisting themselves about with delightful irregularity but as the city grew there came the taste for parallelograms and the upper streets are rectangular and numbered broadway the street of new york with which the world is generally best acquainted begins at the southern point of the town and goes northward through it for some two miles and a half it walks away in a straight line and then it turns to the left toward the hudson from that time broadway never again takes a straight course but crosses the various avenues in an oblique direction till it becomes the bloomingdale road and under that name takes itself out of town there are eleven so-called avenues which descend in absolutely straight lines from the northern and at present unsettled extremity of the new town making their way southward till they lose themselves among the old streets these are called first avenue second avenue and so on the town had already progressed two miles up northward from the battery before it had caught the parallelogramic fever from philadelphia for at about the distance we find first street first street runs across the avenues from water to water and then second street i will not name them all seeing that they go up to one hundred fifty fourth street they do so at least on the map and i believe on the lamp posts but the houses are not yet built in order beyond fiftieth or sixtieth street the other hundred streets each of two miles long with the avenues which are mostly unoccupied for four or five miles is the ground over which the young new yorkers are to spread themselves i do not in the least doubt that they will occupy it all and that one hundred fifty fourth street will find itself too narrow a boundary for the population i have said that there was some good architectural effect in new york and i alluded chiefly to that of the fifth avenue the fifth avenue is the belgrave square the park lane and the pall mall of new york it is certainly a very fine street the houses in it are magnificent not having that aristocratic look which some of our detached london residences enjoy or the palatial appearance of an old-fashioned hotel in paris but an air of comfortable luxury and commercial wealth which is not excelled by the best houses of any other town that i know 
they are houses not hotels or palaces but they are very roomy houses with every luxury that complete finish can give them many of them cover large spaces of the ground and their rent will sometimes go up as high as eight hundred and one thousand pounds a year generally the best of these houses are owned by those who live in them and rent is not therefore paid but this is not always the case and the sums named above may be taken as expressing their value in england a man should have a very large income indeed who could afford to pay one thousand pounds a year for his house in london such a one would as a matter of course have an establishment in the country and be an earl or a duke or a millionaire but it is different in new york the resident there shows his wealth chiefly by his house and though he may probably have a villa at newport or a box somewhere up in the hudson he has no second establishment such a house therefore will not represent a total expenditure of above four thousand pounds a year there are churches on each side of fifth avenue perhaps five or six within sight at one time which add much to the beauty of the street they are well built and in fairly good taste these added to the general well-being and splendid comfort of the place give it an effect better than the architecture of the individual houses would seem to warrant i own that i have enjoyed the vista as i have walked up and down fifth avenue and have felt that the city had a right to be proud of its wealth but the greatness and beauty and glory of wealth have on such occasions been all in all with me i know no great man no celebrated statesman no philanthropist of peculiar note who has lived in fifth avenue that gentleman on the right made a million of dollars by inventing a shirt collar this one on the left electrified the world by a lotion as to the gentleman at the corner there there are rumours about him and the cuban slave trade but my informant by no means knows that they are true such are the aristocracy of fifth avenue i can only say that if i could make a million dollars by a lotion i should certainly be right to live in such a house as one of those the suburbs of new york are by the nature of the localities divided from the city by water jersey city and hoboken are on the other side of the hudson and in another state williamsburg and brooklyn are on long island which is a part of the state of new york but these places are as easily reached as lambeth is reached from westminster steam ferries ply every three or four minutes and into these boats coaches carts and wagons of any size or weight are driven in fact they make no other stoppage to the commerce than that occasioned by the payment of a few cents such payment no doubt is a stoppage and therefore it is that jersey city brooklyn and williamsburg are at any rate in appearance very dull and uninviting they are however very populous many of the quieter citizens prefer to live there and i am told that the brooklyn tea parties consider themselves to be in aesthetic feeling very much ahead of anything of the kind in the more opulent centres of the city in beauty of scenery staten island is very much the prettiest of the suburbs of new york the view from the hillside in staten island down upon new york harbour is very lovely it is the only really good view of that magnificent harbour which i have been able to find as for appreciating such beauty when one is entering a port from sea or leaving it for sea i do not believe in any such power the ship creeps up or creeps out while the mind is engaged on other matters the passenger is uneasy either with hopes or fears and then the grease of the engines offends one's nostrils but it is worth the tourist's while to look down upon new york harbour from the hillside in staten island when i was there fort lafayette looked black in the centre of the channel and we knew that it was crowded with the victims of secession fort tompkins was being built to guard the pass worthy of a name of richer sound and fort something else was bristling with new cannon fort hamilton on long island opposite was frowning at us and immediately around us a regiment of volunteers was receiving regimental stocks and boots from the hands of its officers everything was bristling with war and one could not but think that not in this way had new york raised herself so quickly to her present greatness but the glory of new york is the central park its glory in the minds of all new yorkers of the present day the first question asked of you is whether you have seen the central park and the second is as to what you think of it it does not do to say simply that it is fine grand beautiful and miraculous 
you must swear by cock and pie that it is more fine more grand more beautiful more miraculous than anything else of the kind anywhere here you encounter in its most annoying form that necessity for eulogium which presses you everywhere for in truth taken as it is at present the central park is not fine nor grand nor beautiful as to the miracle let that pass it is perhaps as miraculous as some other great latter-day miracles but the central park is a very great fact and affords a strong additional proof of the sense and energy of the people it is very large being over three miles long and about three-quarters of a mile in breadth when it was found that new york was extending itself and becoming one of the largest cities of the world a space was selected between fifth and seventh avenues immediately outside the limits of the city as then built but nearly in the centre of the city as it is intended to be built the ground around it became at once of great value and i do not doubt that the present fashion of fifth avenue about twentieth street will in course of time move itself up to fifth avenue as it looks or will look over the park at seventieth eightieth and ninetieth streets the great water-works of the city bring the croton river whence new york is supplied by an aqueduct over the harlem river into an enormous reservoir just above the park and hence it has come to pass that there will be water not only for sanitary and useful purposes but also for ornament at present the park to english eyes seems to be all road the trees are not grown up and the new embankments and new lakes and new ditches and new paths give to the place anything but a picturesque appearance the central park is good for what it will be rather than for what it is the summer heat is so very great that i doubt much whether the people of new york will ever enjoy such verdure as our parks show but there will be a pleasant assemblage of walks and waterworks with fresh air and fine shrubs and flowers immediately within reach of the citizens all that art and energy can do will be done and the central park doubtless will become one of the great glories of new york when i was expected to declare that st james park green park hyde park and kensington gardens altogether were nothing to it i confessed that i could only remain mute those who desire to learn what are the secrets of society in new york i would refer to the potiphar papers the potiphar papers are perhaps not as well known in england as they deserve to be they were published i think as much as seven or eight years ago but are probably as true now as they were then what i saw of society in new york was quiet and pleasant enough but doubtless i did not climb into that circle in which mrs potiphar held so distinguished a position it may be true that gentlemen habitually throw fragments of their supper and remnants of their wine on their host's carpets but if so i did not see it as i progress in my work i feel that duty will call upon me to write a separate chapter on hotels in general and i will not therefore here say much about those in new york i am inclined to think that few towns in the world if any afford on the whole better accommodation but there are many in which the accommodation is cheaper of the railways also i ought to say something the fact respecting them which is most remarkable is that of their being continued into the centre of the town through the streets the cars are not dragged through the city by locomotive engines but by horses the pace therefore is slow but the convenience to travellers in being brought nearer to the centre of trade must be much felt it is as though passengers from liverpool and passengers from bristol were carried on from euston square and paddington along the new road portland place and regent street to pall mall or up the city road to the bank as a general rule however the railways railway cars and all about them are ill managed they are monopolies and the public through the press has no restraining power upon them as it has in england a parcel sent by express over a distance of forty miles will not be delivered within twenty-four hours i once made my plaint on this subject at the bar or office of a hotel and was told that no remonstrance was of avail it is a monopoly the man told me and if we say anything we are told that if we do not like it we need not use it in railway matters and postal matters time and punctuality are not valued in the states as they are with us and the public seem to acknowledge that they must put up with defects 
that they must grin and bear them in america as the public no doubt do in austria where such affairs are managed by a government bureau in the beginning of this chapter i spoke of the population of new york and i cannot end it without remarking that out of the population more than one-eighth is composed of germans it is i believe computed that there are about one hundred twenty thousand germans in the city and that only two other german cities in the world vienna and berlin have a larger german population than new york the germans are good citizens and thriving men and are to be found prospering all over the northern and western parts of the union it seems that they are excellently well adapted to colonization though they have in no instance become the dominant people in a colony or carried with them their own language or their own laws the french have done so in algeria in some of the west india islands and quite as essentially into lower canada where their language and laws still prevail and yet it is i think beyond doubt that the french are not good colonists as are the germans of the ultimate destiny of new york as one of the ruling commercial cities of the world it is i think impossible to doubt whether or no it will ever equal london in population i will not pretend to say even should it do so should its numbers so increase as to enable it to say that it had done so the question could not very well be settled when it comes to pass that an assemblage of men in one so-called city have to be counted by millions there arises the impossibility of defining the limits of that city and of saying who belong to it and who do not an arbitrary line may be drawn but that arbitrary line though perhaps false when drawn as including too much soon becomes more false as including too little ealing acton fulham putney norwood sydenham blackheath woolwich greenwich stratford highgate and hampstead are in truth component parts of london and very shortly brighton will be as much so End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of North America, Volume One, by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifteen, the Constitution of the State of New York. As New York is the most populous state of the Union, having the largest representation in Congress, on which account it has been called the Empire State, I propose to state as shortly as may be the nature of its separate constitution as a state of course it will be understood that the constitutions of the different states are by no means the same they have been arranged according to the judgment of the different people concerned and have been altered from time to time to suit such altered judgment but as the states together form one nation and on such matters as foreign affairs war customs and post-office regulations are bound together as much as are the english counties it is of course necessary that the constitution of each should in most matters assimilate itself to those of the others these constitutions are very much alike a governor with two houses of legislature generally called the senate and the house of representatives exists in each state in the state of new york the lower house is called the assembly in most states the governor is elected annually but in some states for two years as in new york in pennsylvania he is elected for three years the house of representatives or the assembly is i think always elected for one session only but as in many of the states the legislature only sits once in two years the election recurs of course at the same interval the franchise in all the states is nearly universal but in no state is it perfectly so the governor lieutenant governor and other officers are elected by vote of the people as well as the members of the legislature of course it will be understood that each state makes laws for itself that they are in no wise dependent on the congress assembled at washington for their laws unless for laws which refer to matters between the united states as a nation and other nations or between one state and another each state declares with what punishment crime shall be visited what taxes shall be levied for the use of the state what laws shall be passed as to education what shall be the state judiciary with reference to the judiciary however it must be understood that the united states as a nation have separate national law courts before which come all cases litigated between state and state and all cases which do not belong in every respect to any one individual state 
In a subsequent chapter I will endeavor to explain this more fully. In endeavoring to understand the Constitution of the United States, it is essentially necessary that we should remember that we have always to deal with two different political arrangements, that which refers to the nation as a whole, and that which belongs to each state as a separate governing power in itself. What is law in one state is not law in another. Nevertheless, there is a very great likeness throughout these various constitutions, and any political student who shall have thoroughly mastered one will not have much to learn in mastering the others. This state, now called New York, was first settled by the Dutch in 1614 on Manhattan Island. They established a government in 1629 under the name of the New Netherlands. In 1664, Charles II granted the province to his brother James II, then Duke of York, and possession was taken of the country on his behalf by one Colonel Nichols. In 1673 it was recaptured by the Dutch, but they could not hold it, and the Duke of York again took possession by patent. A legislative body was first assembled during the reign of Charles II in 1683, from which it will be seen that parliamentary representation was introduced into the American colonies at a very early date. The Declaration of Independence was made by the revolted colonies in 1776, and in 1777 the first constitution was adopted by the state of New York. In 1822 this was changed for another, and the one of which I now purport to state some of the details was brought into action in 1847. In this constitution there is a provision that it shall be overhauled and remodeled if needs be once in twenty years. Article 13, Section 2 Quote, At the general election to be held in 1866 and in each twentieth year thereafter the question, Shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution and amend the same? Shall be decided by the electors qualified to vote for members of the legislature? End quote. So that the New Yorkers cannot be twitted with the presumption of finality in reference to their legislative arrangements. The present Constitution begins with declaring the inviolability of trial by jury and of habeas corpus, unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require its suspension. It does not say by whom it may be suspended, or who is to judge of the public safety, but at any rate it may be presumed that such suspension was supposed to come from the powers of the state which enacted the law. At the present moment the habeas corpus is suspended in New York and this suspension has proceeded not from the powers of the state but from the federal government without the sanction even of the federal congress article one section eight quote, every citizen may freely speak write and publish his sentiments on all subjects being responsible for the abuse of that right and no law shall be passed to restrain or abridge the liberty of speech or of the press End quote. But at the present moment liberty of speech and of the press is utterly abrogated in the state of New York as it is in other states. I mention this not as a reproach against either the state or the federal government, but to show how vain all laws are for the protection of such rights. If they be not protected by the feelings of the people, if the people are at any time or from any cause willing to abandon such privileges, no written laws will preserve them. In Article 1, Section 14, there is a proviso that no land, land that is used for agricultural purposes, shall be let on lease for a longer period than twelve years. Quote, no lease or grant of agricultural land for a longer period than twelve years hereafter made, in which shall be reserved any rent or service of any kind, shall be valid. End quote. I do not understand the intended virtue of this proviso, but it shows very clearly how different are the practices with reference to land in England and America. Farmers in the States almost always are the owners of the land which they farm, and such tenures as those by which the occupiers of land generally hold their farms with us are almost unknown. There is no such relation as that of landlord and tenant as regards agricultural holdings. Every male citizen of New York may vote who is twenty-one, who has been a citizen for ten days, who has lived in the state for a year and for four months in the county in which he votes. He can vote for all officers that now are or hereafter may be elective by the people, Article 2, Section 1. But, the section goes on to say, 
no man of colour unless he shall have been for three years a citizen of the state and for one year next preceding any election shall have been possessed of a freehold estate of the value of two hundred fifty dollars and shall have been actually rated and paid a tax thereon shall be entitled to vote at such election and quote this is the only embargo with which universal suffrage is laden in the state of new york the third article provides for the election of the senate and the assembly the senate consists of thirty-two members and it may here be remarked that large as is the state of new york and great as is its population its senate is less numerous than that of many other states in massachusetts for instance there are forty senators though the population of massachusetts is barely one-third that of new york in virginia there are fifty senators whereas the free population is not one-third of that of new york as a consequence the senate of new york is said to be filled with men of a higher class than are generally found in the senates of other states then follows in the article a list of districts which are to return the senators these districts consist of one two three or in one case four counties according to the population the article does not give the number of members of the lower house nor does it even state what amount of population shall be held as entitled to a member it merely provides for the division of the state into districts which shall contain an equal number not of population but of voters the house of assembly does consist of one hundred twenty eight members it is then stipulated that every member of both houses shall receive three dollars a day or twelve shillings for their services during the sitting of the legislature but this sum is never to exceed three hundred dollars or sixty pounds in one year unless an extra session be called there is also an allowance for the travelling expenses of members it is i presume generally known that the members of the congress at washington are all paid and that the same is the case with reference to the legislatures of all the states no member of the new york legislature can also be a member of the washington congress or hold any civil or military office during the general states government a majority of each house must be present or as the article says shall constitute a quorum to do business each house is to keep a journal of its proceedings the doors are to be open except when the public welfare shall require secrecy a singular proviso this in a country boasting so much of freedom for no speech or debate in either house shall the legislator be called in question in any other place the legislature assembles on the first tuesday in january and sits for about three months its seat is at albany the executive power article four is to be vested in a governor and a lieutenant governor both of whom shall be chosen for two years the governor must be a citizen of the united states must be thirty years of age and have lived for the last four years in the state he is to be commander-in-chief of the military and naval forces of the state as is the president of those of the union i see that this is also the case in inland states which one would say can have no navies and with reference to some states it is enacted that the governor is commander-in-chief of the army navy and militia showing that some army over and beyond the militia may be kept by the state in tennessee which is an inland state it is enacted that the governor shall be commander-in-chief of the army and navy of this state and of the militia except when they shall be called into the service of the united states in ohio the same is the case except that there is no mention of militia in new york there is no proviso with reference to the service of the united states i mention this as it bears with some strength on the question of the right of secession and indicates the jealousy of the individual states with reference to the federal government the governor can convene extra sessions of one house or of both he makes a message to the legislature when it meets a sort of queen's speech and he receives for his services a compensation to be established by law in new york this amounts to eight hundred pounds a year in some states this is as low as two hundred pounds and three hundred pounds in virginia it is one thousand pounds in california twelve hundred pounds the governor can pardon except in cases of treason he has also a veto upon all bills sent up by the legislature if he exercise this veto he returns the bill to the legislature with his reasons for so doing 
if the bill on reconsideration by the houses be again passed by a majority of two-thirds in each house it becomes law in spite of the governor's veto the veto of the president at washington is one of the same nature such are the powers of the governor but though they are very full the governor of each state does not practically exercise any great political power nor is he even politically a great man you might live in a state during the whole term of his government and hardly hear of him there is vested in him by the language of the constitution a much wider power than that entrusted to the governor of our colonies but in our colonies everybody talks and thinks and knows about the governor as far as the limits of the colony the governor is a great man but this is not the case with reference to the governors in the different states the next article provides that the governor's ministers viz the secretary of state the controller treasurer and attorney-general shall be chosen every two years at a general election in this respect the state constitution differs from that of the national constitution the president at washington names his own ministers subject to the approbation of the senate he makes many other appointments with the same limitation and the senate i believe is not slow to interfere but with reference to the ministers it is understood that the names sent in by the president shall stand of the secretary of state controller etc belonging to the different states and who are elected by the people in a general way one never hears no doubt they attend their offices and take their pay but they are not political personages the next article number six refers to the judiciary and is very complicated as i cannot understand it i will not attempt to explain it moreover it is not within the scope of my ambition to convey here all the details of the state constitution in section twenty of this article it is provided that no judicial officer except justices of the peace shall receive to his own use any fees or perquisites of office how pleasantly this enactment must sound in the ears of the justices of the peace article seven refers to fiscal matters and is more especially interesting as showing how greatly the state of new york has depended on its canals for its wealth these canals are the property of the state and by this article it seems to be provided that they shall not only maintain themselves but maintain to a considerable extent the state expenditure also and stand in lieu of taxation it is provided section six that the legislator shall not sell lease or otherwise dispose of any of the canals of the state but that they shall remain the property of the state and under its management for ever but in spite of its canals the state does not seem to be doing very well for i see that in eighteen sixty its income was four million seven hundred eighty thousand dollars and its expenditure five million one hundred thousand whereas its debt was thirty two million five hundred thousand dollars of all the states pennsylvania is the most indebted virginia the second and new york the third new hampshire connecticut vermont delaware and texas owe no state debts all the other state ships have taken in ballast the militia is supposed to consist of all men capable of bearing arms under forty-five years of age but no one need be enrolled who from scruples of conscience is averse to bearing arms at the present moment such scruples do not seem to be very general then follows in article eleven a detailed enactment as to the choosing of militia officers it may be perhaps sufficient to say that the privates are to choose the captains and the subalterns the captains and subalterns are to choose the field officers and the field officers the brigadier generals and inspectors of brigade the governor however with the consent of the senate shall nominate all major generals now that real soldiers have unfortunately become necessary the above plan has not been found to work well such is the constitution of the state of new york which has been intended to work and does work quite separately from that of the united states it will be seen that the purport has been to make it as widely democratic as possible to provide that all power of all description shall come directly from the people and that such power shall return to the people at short intervals the senate and the governor each remain for two years but not for the same two years if a new senate commence its work in eighteen sixty one a new governor will come in in eighteen sixty two 
but nevertheless there is in the form of government as thus established an absence of that close and immediate responsibility which attends our ministers when a man has been voted in it seems that responsibility is over for the period of the required service he has been chosen and the country which has chosen him is to trust that he will do his best i do not know that this matters much with reference to the legislature or governments of the different states for their state legislatures and governments are but puny powers but in the legislature and government at washington it does matter very much but i shall have another opportunity of speaking on that subject nothing has struck me so much in america as the fact that these state legislatures are puny powers the absence of any tidings whatever of their doings across the water is a proof of this who has heard of the legislature of new york or of massachusetts it is boasted here that their insignificance is a sign of the well-being of the people that the smallness of the power necessary for carrying on the machine shows how beautifully the machine is organized and how well it works it is better to have little governors than great governors an american said to me once it is our glory that we know how to live without having great men over us to rule us that glory if ever it were a glory has come to an end it seems to me that all these troubles have come upon the states because they have not placed high men in high places the less of laws and the less of control the better providing a people can go right with few laws and little control one may say that no laws and no control would be best of all provided that none were needed but this is not exactly the position of the american people the two professions of law-making and of governing have become unfashionable low in estimation and of no repute in the states the municipal powers of the cities have not fallen into the hands of the leading men the word politician has come to bear the meaning of political adventurer and almost of political blackleg if a calls b a politician a intends to vilify b by so calling him whether or no the best citizens of a state will ever be induced to serve in the state legislature by a nobler consideration than that of pay or by a higher tone of political morals than that now existing i cannot say it seems to me that some great decrease in the numbers of the state legislature should be a first step towards such a consummation there are not many men in each state who can afford to give up two or three months of the year to the state service for nothing but it may be presumed that in each state there are a few those who are induced to devote their time by the payment of sixty pounds can hardly be the men most fitted for the purpose of legislation it certainly has seemed to me that the members of the state legislatures and of the state governments are not held in that respect and treated with that confidence to which in the eyes of an englishman such functionaries should be held as entitled End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen, Part One of North America, Volume One by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixteen, Boston, Part One. From New York, we returned to Boston by Hartford, the capital or one of the capitals of Connecticut. This proud little state is composed of two old provinces, of which Hartford and New Haven were the two metropolitan towns indeed there was a third colony called saybrook which was joined to hartford as neither of the two could of course give way when hartford and new haven were made into one the houses of legislature and the seat of government are changed about year by year connecticut is a very proud little state and has a pleasant legend of its own stanchness in the old colonial days in sixteen sixty two the colonies were united and a charter was given to them by charles the second but some years later in eighteen eighty six when the bad days of james the second had come this charter was considered to be too liberal and order was given that it should be suspended one sir edmund andros had been appointed governor of all new england and sent word from boston to connecticut that the charter itself should be given up to him this the men of connecticut refused to do whereupon sir edmund with a military following presented himself at their assembly declared their governing powers to be dissolved and after much palaver caused the charter itself to be laid upon the table before him the discussion had been long having lasted through the day into the night and the room had been lighted with candles 
on a sudden each light disappeared and sir edmund with his followers were in the dark as a matter of course when the light was restored the charter was gone and sir edmund the governor-general was baffled as all governors-general and all sir edmunds always are in such cases the charter was gone a gallant captain wadsworth having carried it off and hidden it in an oak tree the charter was renewed when william the third came to the throne and now hangs triumphantly in the state house at hartford the charter oak has alas succumbed to the weather but was standing a few years since the men of hartford are very proud of their charter and regard it as the parent of their existing liberties quite as much as though no national revolution of their own had intervened and indeed the northern states of the union especially those of new england refer all their liberties to the old charters which they held from the mother country they rebelled as they themselves would seem to say and set themselves up as a separate people not because the mother country had refused to them by law sufficient liberty and sufficient self-control but because the mother country infringed the liberties and powers of self-control which she herself had given the mother country so these states declare had acted the part of sir edmund andros had endeavoured to take away their charters so they also put out the lights and took themselves to an oak tree of their own which is still standing though winds from the infernal regions are now battering its branches long may it stand whether the mother country did or did not infringe the charters she had given i will not here inquire as to the nature of those alleged infringements are they not written down to the number of twenty-seven in the declaration of independence they mostly begin with he he has done this and he has done that the he is poor george the third whose twenty-seven mortal sins against his transatlantic colonies are thus recapitulated it would avail nothing to argue now whether those deeds were sins or virtues nor would it have availed then the child had grown up and was strong and chose to go alone into the world the young bird was fledged and flew away poor george the third with his cackling was certainly not efficacious in restraining such a flight but it is gratifying to see how this new people when they had it in their power to change all their laws to throw themselves upon any utopian theory that the folly of a wild philanthropy could devise to discard as abominable every vestige of english rule and english power it is gratifying to see that when they could have done all this they did not do so but preferred to cling to things english their old colonial limits were still to be the borders of their states their old charters were still to be regarded as the sources from whence their state powers had come the old laws were to remain in force the precedents of the english courts were to be held as legal precedents in the courts of the new nation and are now so held it was still to be england but england without a king making his last struggle for political power this was the idea of the people and this was their feeling and that idea has been carried out and that feeling has remained in the constitution of the state of new york nothing is said about the religion of the people it was regarded as a subject with which the constitution had no concern whatever but as soon as we come among the stricter people of new england we find that the constitution makers have not been able absolutely to ignore the subject in connecticut it is enjoined that as it is the duty of all men to worship the supreme being and their right to render that worship in the mode most consistent with their consciences no person shall be by law compelled to join or be classed with any religious association the line of argument is hardly logical the conclusion not being in accordance with or hanging on the first of the two premises but nevertheless the meaning is clear in a free country no man shall be made to worship after any special fashion but it is decreed by the constitution that every man is bound by duty to worship after some fashion the article then goes on to say how they who do worship are to be taxed for the support of their peculiar church i am not quite clear whether the new yorkers have not managed this difficulty with greater success when we come to the old bay state to massachusetts we find the christian religion spoken of in the constitution as that which in some of its forms should receive the adherence of every good citizen 
hartford is a pleasant little town with english-looking houses and an english-looking country around it here as everywhere through the states one is struck by the size and comfort of the residences i sojourned there at the house of a friend and could find no limit to the number of spacious sitting-rooms which it contained the modest dining-room and drawing-room which suffice with us for men of seven or eight hundred a year would be regarded as very mean accommodation by persons of similar incomes in the states i found that hartford was all alive with trade and that wages were high because there are there two factories for the manufacture of arms colt's pistols come from hartford as also do sharp's rifles wherever arms can be prepared or gunpowder where clothes or blankets fit for soldiers can be made or tents or standards or things appertaining in any way to warfare their trade was still brisk no being is more costly in his requirements than a soldier and no soldier so costly as the american he must eat and drink of the best and have good boots and warm bedding and good shelter there were during the christmas of eighteen sixty one above half a million of soldiers so to be provided the president in his message made in december to congress declared the number to be above six hundred thousand and therefore in such places as hartford trade was very brisk i went over the rifle factory and was shown everything but i do not know that i brought away much with me that was worth any reader's attention the best of rifles i have no doubt were being made with the greatest rapidity and all were sent to the army as soon as finished i saw some murderous-looking weapons with swords attached to them instead of bayonets but have since been told by soldiers that the old-fashioned bayonet is thought to be more serviceable immediately on my arrival in boston i heard that mr emerson was going to lecture at the tremont hall on the subject of the war and i resolved to go and hear him i was acquainted with mr emerson and by reputation knew him well among us in england he is regarded as transcendental and perhaps even as mystic in his philosophy his representative men is the work by which he is best known on our side of the water and i have heard some readers declare that they could not quite understand mr emerson's representative men for myself i confess that i had broken down over some portions of that book since i had become acquainted with him i had read others of his writings especially his book on england and had found that he improved greatly on acquaintance i think that he has confined his mysticism to the book above named in conversation he is very clear and by no means above the small practical things of the world he would i fancy know as well what interest he ought to receive for his money as though he were no philosopher and i am inclined to think that if he held land he would make his hay while the sun shone as might any common farmer before i had met mr emerson when my idea of him was formed simply on the representative men i should have thought that a lecture from him on the war would have taken his hearers all among the clouds as it was i still had my doubts and was inclined to fear that a subject which could only be handled usefully at such a time before a large audience by a combination of common sense high principles and eloquence would hardly be safe in mr emerson's hands i did not doubt the high principles but feared much that there would be a lack of common sense so many have talked on that subject and have shown so great a lack of common sense as to the eloquence that might be there or might not mr emerson is a massachusetts man very well known in boston and a great crowd was collected to hear him i suppose there were some three thousand persons in the room i confess that when he took his place before us my prejudices were against him the matter in hand required no philosophy it required common sense and the very best of common sense it demanded that he should be impassioned for of what interest can any address be on a matter of public politics without passion but it demanded that the passion should be winnowed and free from all rhodomontade i fancied what might be said on such a subject as to that overlauded star-spangled banner and how the star-spangled flag would look when wrapped in a mist of mystic platonism but from the beginning to the end there was nothing mystic no platonism and if i remember rightly the star-spangled banner was altogether omitted to the national eagle he did allude your american eagle he said is very well protected here and abroad but beware of the american peacock 
he gave an account of the war from the beginning showing how it had arisen and how it had been conducted and he did so with admirable simplicity and truth he thought the north was right about the war and as i thought so also i was not called upon to disagree with him he was terse and perspicuous in his sentences practical in his advice and above all things true in what he said to his audience of themselves they who know america will understand how hard it is for a public man in the states to practice such truth in his addresses fluid compliments and high-flown national eulogium are expected in this instance none were forthcoming the north had risen with patriotism to make this effort and it was now warned that in doing so it was simply doing its national duty and then came the subject of slavery i had been told that mr emerson was an abolitionist and knew that i must disagree with him on that head if on no other to me it has always seemed that to mix up the question of general abolition with this war must be the work of a man too ignorant to understand the real subject of the war or too false to his country to regard it throughout the whole lecture i was waiting for mr emerson's abolition doctrine but no abolition doctrine came the words abolition and compensation were mentioned and then there was an end of the subject if mr emerson be an abolitionist he expressed his views very mildly on that occasion on the whole the lecture was excellent and that little advice about the peacock was in itself worth an hour's attention that practice of lecturing is quite an institution in the states so it is in england my readers will say but in england it is done in a different way with a different object and with much less of result with us if i am not mistaken lectures are mostly given gratuitously by the lecturer they are got up here and there with some philanthropical object and in the hope that an hour at the disposal of young men and women may be rescued from idleness the subjects chosen are social literary philanthropic romantic geographical scientific religious anything rather than political the lecture rooms are not usually filled to overflowing and there is often a question whether the real good achieved is worth the trouble taken the most popular lectures are given by big people whose presence is likely to be attractive and the whole thing i fear we must confess is not preeminently successful in the northern states of america the matter stands on a very different footing lectures there are more popular than either theatres or concerts enormous halls are built for them tickets for long courses are taken with avidity very large sums are paid to popular lecturers so that the profession is lucrative more so i am given to understand than is the cognate profession of literature the whole thing is done in great style music is introduced the lecturer stands on a large raised platform on which sit around him the bald and hoary-headed and superlatively wise ladies come in large numbers especially those who aspire to soar above the frivolities of the world politics is the subject most popular and most general the men and women of boston could no more do without their lectures than those of paris could without their theatres it is the decorous diversion of the best ordered of her citizens the fast young men go to clubs and the fast young women to dances as fast young men and women do in other places that are wicked but lecturing is the favorite diversion of the steady-minded bostonian after all i do not know that the result is very good it does not seem that much will be gained by such lectures on either side of the atlantic except that respectable killing of an evening which might otherwise be killed less respectably it is but an industrious idleness an attempt at a royal road to information that habit of attending lectures let any man or woman say what he has brought away from any such attendance it is attractive that idea of being studious without any of the labour of study but i fear it is elusive if an evening can be so passed without ennui i believe that that may be regarded as the best result to be gained but then it so often happens that the evening is not passed without ennui of course in saying this i am not alluding to lectures given in special places as a course of special study medical lectures are or may be a necessary part of medical education as many as two or three thousand often attend these popular lectures in boston but i do not know whether on that account the popular subjects are much better understood 
nevertheless i resolved to hear more hoping that i might in that way teach myself to understand what were the popular politics in new england whether or no i may have learned this in any other way i do not perhaps know but at any rate i did not learn it in this way the next lecture which i attended was also given in the tremont hall and on this occasion also the subject of the war was to be treated the special treachery of the rebels was i think the matter to be taken in hand on this occasion also the room was full and my hopes of a pleasant hour ran high for some fifteen minutes i listened and i am bound to say that the gentleman discoursed in excellent english he was master of that wonderful fluency which is peculiarly the gift of an american he went on from one sentence to another with rhythmic tones and unerring pronunciation he never faltered never repeated his words never fell into those vile half-muttered hems and haws by which an englishman in such a position so generally betrays his timidity but during the whole time of my remaining in the room he did not give expression to a single thought he went on from one soft platitude to another and uttered words from which i would defy any one of his audience to carry away with them anything and yet it seemed to me that his audience was satisfied i was not satisfied and managed to escape out of the room the next lecturer to whom i listened was mr everett mr everett's reputation as an orator is very great and i was especially anxious to hear him i had long since known that his power of delivery was very marvellous that his tones elocution and action were all great and that he was able to command the minds and sympathies of his audience in a remarkable manner his subject also was the war or rather the causes of the war and its qualification had the north given to the south cause of provocation had the south been fair and honest in its dealings to the north had any compromise been possible by which the war might have been avoided and the rights and dignity of the north preserved seeing that mr everett is a northern man and was lecturing to a boston audience one knew well how these questions would be answered but the manner of the answering would be everything this lecture was given at roxbury one of the suburbs of boston so i went out to roxbury with a party and found myself honoured by being placed on the platform among the bald-headed ones and superlatively wise this privilege is naturally gratifying but it entails on him who is so gratified the inconvenience of sitting at the lecturer's back whereas it is perhaps better for the listener to be before his face i could not but be amused by one little scenic incident when we all went upon the platform some one proposed that the clergyman should lead the way out of the little waiting-room in which we bald-headed ones and superlatively wise were assembled but to this the manager of the affair demurred he wanted the clergyman for a purpose he said and so the profane ones led the way and the clergyman of whom there might be some six or seven clustered in around the lecturer at last early in his discourse mr everett told us what it was that the country needed at this period of her trial patriotism courage the bravery of the men the good wishes of the women the self-denial of all and continued the lecturer turning to his immediate neighbours the prayers of these holy men whom i see around me it had not been for nothing that the clergymen were detained mr everett lectures without any book or paper before him and continues from first to last as though the words came from him on the spur of the moment it is known however that it is his practice to prepare his orations with great care and commit them entirely to memory as does an actor indeed he repeats the same lecture over and over again i am told without the change of a word or of an action i did not like mr everett's lecture i did not like what he said or the seeming spirit in which it was framed but i am bound to admit that his power of oratory is very wonderful those among his countrymen who have criticised his manner in my hearing have said that he is too florid that there is an affectation in the motion of his hands and that the intended pathos of his voice sometimes approaches too near the precipice over which the fall is so deep and rapid and at the bottom of which lies absolute ridicule judging for myself i did not find it so my position for seeing was not good but my ear was not offended critics also should bear in mind that an orator does not speak chiefly to them or for their approval he who writes or speaks or sings for thousands must write speak or sing as those thousands would have him 
that to a dainty connoisseur will be false music which to the general ear shall be accounted as the perfection of harmony an eloquence altogether suited to the fastidious and hypercritical would probably fail to carry off the hearts and interest the sympathies of the young and eager as regards manners tone and choice of words i think that the oratory of mr everett places him very high his skill in his work is perfect he never falls back upon a word he never repeats himself his voice is always perfectly under command as for hesitation or timidity the days for those failings have long passed by with him when he makes a point he makes it well and drives it home to the intelligence of every one before him even that appeal to the holy men around him sounded well or would have done so had i not been present at that little arrangement in the ante-room on the audience at large it was manifestly effective but nevertheless the lecture gave me but a poor idea of mr everett as a politician though it made me regard him highly as an orator it was impossible not to perceive that he was anxious to utter the sentiments of the audience rather than his own that he was making himself an echo a powerful and harmonious echo of what he conceived to be public opinion in boston at that moment that he was allowing himself to be led by them so that he might best play his present part for their delectation he was neither bold nor honest as emerson had been and i could not but feel that every tyro of a politician before him would thus recognize his want of boldness and of honesty as a statesman or as a critic of statecraft and of other statesmen he is wanting in backbone for many years mr everett has been not even inimical to southern politics and southern courses nor was he among those who during the last eight years previous to mr lincoln's election fought the battle for northern principles i do not say that on this account he is now false to advocate the war but he cannot carry men with him when at his age he advocates it by arguments opposed to the tenor of his long political life his abuse of the south and of southern ideas was as virulent as might be that of a young lad now beginning his political career or of one who had through life advocated abolition principles he heaped reproaches on poor virginia whose position as the chief of the border states has given to her hardly the possibility of avoiding a scylla of ruin on the one side or a charybdis of rebellion on the other when he spoke as he did of virginia ridiculing the idea of her sacred soil even i englishman as i am could not but think of washington of jefferson of randolph and of madison he should not have spoken of virginia as he did speak for no man could have known better virginia's difficulties but virginia was at a discount in boston and mr everett was speaking to a boston audience and then he referred to england and to europe mr everett has been minister to england and knows the people he is a student of history and must i think know that england's career has not been unhappy or unprosperous but england also was at a discount in boston and mr everett was speaking to a boston audience they are sending us their advice across the water said mr everett and what is their advice to us that we should come down from the high place we have built for ourselves and be even as they are they screech at us from the low depths in which they are wallowing in their misery and call on us to join them in their wretchedness i am not quoting mr everett's very words for i have not them by me but i am not making them stronger nor so strong as he made them as i thought of mr everett's reputation and of his years of study of his long political life and unsurpassed sources of information i could not but grieve heartily when i heard such words fall from him i could not but ask myself whether it were impossible that under the present circumstances of her constitution this great nation of america should produce an honest high-minded statesman when lincoln and hamlin the existing president and vice-president of the states were in eighteen sixty as yet but the candidates of the republican party bell and everett also were the candidates of the old whig conservative party their express theory was this that the question of slavery should not be touched their purpose was to crush agitation and restore harmony by an impartial balance between the north and south a fine purpose the finest of all purposes had it been practicable but such a course of compromise was now at a discount in boston and mr everett was speaking to a boston audience 
as an orator mr everett's excellence is i think not to be questioned but as a politician i cannot give him a high rank after that i heard mr wendell phillips of him too as an orator all the world of massachusetts speaks with great admiration and i have no doubt so speaks with justice he is however known as the hottest and most impassioned advocate of abolition not many months since the cause of abolition as advocated by him was so unpopular in boston that mr phillips was compelled to address his audience surrounded by a guard of policemen of this gentleman i may at any rate say that he is consistent devoted and disinterested he is an abolitionist by profession and seeks to find in every turn of the tide of politics some stream on which he may bring himself nearer to his object in the old days previous to the selection of mr lincoln in days so old that they are now nearly eighteen months past mr phillips was an anti-union man he advocated strongly the disseverance of the union so that the country to which he belonged might have hands clean from the taint of slavery he had probably acknowledged to himself that while the north and south were bound together no hope existed of emancipation but that if the north stood alone the south would become too weak to foster and keep alive the social institution in which if such were his opinion i am inclined to agree with him but now he is all for the union thinking that a victorious north can compel the immediate emancipation of southern slaves as to which i beg to say that i am bold to differ from mr phillips altogether it soon became evident to me that mr phillips was unwell and lecturing at a disadvantage his manner was clearly that of an accustomed orator but his voice was weak and he was not up to the effect which he attempted to make his hearers were impatient repeatedly calling upon him to speak out and on that account i tried hard to feel kindly toward him and his lecture but i must confess that i failed to me it seemed that the doctrine he preached was one of rapine bloodshed and social destruction he would call upon the government and upon congress to enfranchise the slaves at once now during the war so that the southern power might be destroyed by a concurrence of misfortunes and he would do so at once on the spur of the moment fearing lest the south should be before him and themselves emancipate their own bondsmen i have sometimes thought that there is no being so venomous so bloodthirsty as a professed philanthropist and that when the philanthropist's ardour lies negroward it then assumes the deepest dye of venom and bloodthirstiness there are four millions of slaves in the southern states none of whom have any capacity for self-maintenance or self-control four millions of slaves with the necessities of children with the passions of men and the ignorance of savages and mr phillips would emancipate these at a blow would were it possible for him to do so set them loose upon the soil to tear their masters destroy each other and make such a hell upon the earth as has never even yet come from the uncontrolled passions and unsatisfied wants of men but congress cannot do this all the members of congress put together cannot according to the constitution of the united states emancipate a single slave in south carolina not if they were all unanimous no emancipation in a slave state can come otherwise than by the legislative enactment of that state but it was then thought that in this coming winter of eighteen sixty to sixty one the action of congress might be set aside the north possessed an enormous army under the control of the president the south was in rebellion and the president could pronounce and the army perhaps enforce the confiscation of all property held in slaves if any who held them were not disloyal the question of compensation might be settled afterward how those four million slaves should live and how white men should live among them in some states or parts of states not equal to the blacks in number as to that mr phillips did not give his opinion and mr phillips also could not keep his tongue away from the abominations of englishmen and the miraculous powers of his own countrymen it was on this occasion that he told us more than once how yankees carried brains in their fingers whereas common people alluding by that name to europeans had them only if at all inside their brain pans and then he informed us that lord palmerston had always hated america among the radicals there might be one or two who understood and valued the institutions of america but it was a well-known fact that lord palmerston was hostile to the country nothing but hidden enmity 
enmity hidden or not hidden could be expected from england that the people of boston or of massachusetts or of the north generally should feel sore against england is to me intelligible i know how the minds of men are moved in masses to certain feelings and that it ever must be so men in common talk are not bound to weigh their words to think and speculate on their results and be sure of the premises on which their thoughts are founded but it is different with a man who rises before two or three thousand of his countrymen to teach and instruct them after that i heard no more political lectures in boston End of chapter sixteen part one chapter sixteen part two of north america volume one by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain sixteen boston part two of course i visited bunker hill and went to lexington and concord from the top of the monument on bunker hill there is a fine view of boston harbor and seen from thence the harbor is picturesque the mouth is crowded with islands and jutting necks and promontories and though the shores are in no place rich enough to make the scenery grand the general effect is good the monument however is so constructed that one can hardly get a view through the windows at the top of it and there is no outside gallery around it immediately below the monument is a marble figure of major warren who fell there not from the top of the monument as some one was led to believe when informed that on that spot the major had fallen bunker hill which is little more than a mound is at charleston a dull populous respectable and very unattractive suburb of boston bunker hill has obtained a considerable name and is accounted great in the annals of american history in england we have all heard of bunker hill and some of us dislike the sound as much as frenchmen do that of waterloo in the states men talk of bunker hill as we may perhaps talk of agincourt and such favourite fields but after all little was done at bunker hill and as far as i can learn no victory was gained there by either party the road from boston to the town of concord on which stands the village of lexington is the true scene of the earliest and greatest deeds of the men of boston the monument at bunker hill stands high and commands attention while those at lexington and concord are very lowly and command no attention but it is of that road and what was done on it that massachusetts should be proud when the colonists first began to feel that they were oppressed and a half resolve was made to resist that oppression by force they began to collect a few arms and some gunpowder at concord a small town about eighteen miles from boston of this preparation the english governor received tidings and determined to send a party of soldiers to seize the arms this he endeavoured to do secretly but he was too closely watched and the word was sent down over the waters by which boston was then surrounded that the colonists might be prepared for the soldiers at that time boston neck as it was and is still called was the only connection between the town and the mainland and the road over boston neck did not lead to concord boats therefore were necessarily used and there was some difficulty in getting the soldiers to the nearest point they made their way however to the road and continued their route as far as lexington without interruption here however they were attacked and the first blood of that war was shed they shot three or four of the rebels i suppose i should in strict language call them and then proceeded on to concord but at concord they were stopped and repulsed and along the road back from concord to lexington they were driven with slaughter and dismay and thus the rebellion was commenced which led to the establishment of a people which let us englishmen say and think what we may of them at this present moment has made itself one of the five great nations of the earth and has enabled us to boast that the two out of the five who enjoy the greatest liberty and the widest prosperity speak the english language and are known by english names for all that has come and is like to come i say again long may that honour remain i could not but feel that that road from boston to concord deserves a name in the world's history greater perhaps than that has yet been given to it concord is at present to be noted as the residence of mr emerson and of mr hawthorne two of those many men of letters of whose presence boston and its neighbourhood have reason to be proud of mr emerson i have already spoken 
the author of the scarlet letter i regard as certainly the first of american novelists i know what men will say of mr cooper and i also am an admirer of cooper's novels but i cannot think that mr cooper's powers were equal to those of mr hawthorne though his mode of thought may have been more genial and his choice of subjects more attractive in their day in point of imagination which after all is the novelist's greatest gift i hardly know any living author who can be accounted superior to mr hawthorne very much has undoubtedly been done in boston to carry out that theory of colonel newcomb's emolit mores by which the colonel meant to signify his opinion that a competent knowledge of reading writing and arithmetic with a taste for enjoying those accomplishments goes very far toward the making of a man and will by no means mar a gentleman in boston nearly every man woman and child has had his or her manners so far softened and though they may still occasionally be somewhat rough to the outer touch the inward effect is plainly visible with us especially among our agricultural population the absence of that inner softening is as visible i went to see a public library in the city which if not founded by mr bates whose name is so well known in london as connected with the house of messrs baring has been greatly enriched by him it is by his money that it has been enabled to do its work in this library there is a certain number of thousands of volumes a great many volumes as there are in most public libraries there are books of all classes from ponderous unreadable folios of which learned men know the title pages down to the lightest literature novels are by no means as chewed or rather if i understood aright considered as one of the staples of the library from this library any book excepting such rare volumes as in all libraries are considered holy is given out to any inhabitant of boston without any payment on presentation of a simple request on a prepared form in point of fact it is a gratuitous circulating library open to all boston rich or poor young or old the books seemed in general to be confided to young children who came as messengers from their fathers and mothers or brothers and sisters no question whatever is asked if the applicant is known or the place of his residence undoubted if there be no such knowledge or there be any doubt as to the residence the applicant is questioned the object being to confine the use of the library to the bona fide inhabitants of the city practically the books are given to those who ask for them whoever they may be boston contains over two hundred thousand inhabitants and all those two hundred thousand are entitled to them some twenty men and women are kept employed from morning till night in carrying on this circulating library and there is moreover attached to the establishment a large reading-room supplied with papers and magazines open to the public of boston on the same terms of course i asked whether a great many of the books were not lost stolen and destroyed and of course i was told that there were no losses no thefts and no destruction as to thefts the librarian did not seem to think that any instance of such an occurrence could be found among the poorer classes a book might sometimes be lost when they were changing their lodgings but anything so lost was more than replaced by the fines a book is taken out for a week and if not brought back at the end of that week when the loan can be renewed if the reader wishes a fine i think of two cents is incurred the children when too late with the books bring in the two cents as a matter of course and the sum so collected fully replaces all losses it was all couleur de rose the librarianesses looked very pretty and learned and if i remember aright mostly wore spectacles the head librarian was enthusiastic the nice instructive books were properly dog's-eared my own productions were in enormous demand the call for books over the counter was brisk and the reading-room was full of readers it has i dare say occurred to other travellers to remark that the proceedings at such institutions when visited by them on their travels are always rose-coloured it is natural that the bright side should be shown to the visitor it may be that many books are called for and returned unread that many of those taken out are so taken by persons who ought to pay for their novels at circulating libraries that the librarian and librarianesses get very tired of their long hours of attendance for i found that they were very long and that many idlers warm themselves in that reading-room nevertheless the fact remains the library is public to all the men and women in boston 
and books are given out without payment to all who may choose to ask for them why should not the great mr moody emulate mr bates and open a library in london on the same system the librarian took me into one special room of which he himself kept the key to show me a present which the library had received from the english government the room was filled with volumes of two sizes all bound alike containing descriptions and drawings of all the patents taken out in england according to this librarian such a work would be invaluable as to american patents but he conceived that the subject had become too confused to render any such an undertaking possible i never allow a single volume to be used for a moment without the presence of myself or one of my assistants said the librarian and then he explained to me when i asked him why he was so particular that the drawings would as a matter of course be cut out and stolen if he omitted his care but they may be copied i said yes but if jones merely copies one smith may come after him and copy it also jones will probably desire to hinder smith from having any evidence of such a patent as to the ordinary borrowing and returning of books the poorest laborer's child in boston might be trusted as honest but when a question of trade came up of commercial competition then the librarian was bound to bethink himself that his countrymen are very smart i hope said the librarian you will let them know in england how grateful we are for their present and i hereby execute that librarian's commission i shall always look back to social life in boston with great pleasure i met there many men and women whom to know is a distinction and with whom to be intimate is a great delight it was a puritan city in which strict old roundhead sentiments and laws used to prevail but nowadays ginger is hot in the mouth there and in spite of the war there were cakes and ale there was a law passed in massachusetts in the old days that any girl should be fined and imprisoned who allowed a young man to kiss her that law has now i think fallen into abeyance and such matters are regulated in boston much as they are in other large towns farther eastward it still i conceive calls itself a puritan city but it has divested its puritanism of austerity and clings rather to the politics and public bearing of its old fathers than to their social manners and pristine severity of intercourse the young girls are no doubt much more comfortable under the new dispensation and the elderly men also as i fancy sunday as regards the outer streets is sabbatical but sunday evenings within doors i always found to be what my friends in that country call quite a good time it is not the thing in boston to smoke in the streets during the day but the wisest the sagest and the most holy even those holy men whom the lecturer saw around him seldom refuse a cigar in the dining-room as soon as the ladies have gone perhaps even the wicked weed would make its appearance before that sad eclipse thereby postponing or perhaps absolutely annihilating the melancholy period of widowhood to both parties and would light itself under the very eyes of those who in sterner cities will lend no countenance to such lightings ah me it was very pleasant i confess i like this abandonment of the stricter rules of the more decorous world i fear that there is within me an aptitude to the milder debaucheries which make such deviations pleasant i like to drink and i like to smoke but i do not like to turn women out of the room then comes the question whether one can have all that one likes together in some small circles in new england i found people simple enough to fancy that they could in massachusetts the main liquor law is still the law of the land but like that other law to which i have alluded it has fallen very much out of use at any rate it had not reached the houses of the gentlemen with whom i had the pleasure of making acquaintance but here i must guard myself from being misunderstood i saw but one drunken man through all new england and he was very respectable he was however so uncommonly drunk that he might be allowed to count for two or three the puritans of boston are of course simple in their habits and simple in their expenses champagne and canvas-back ducks i found to be the provisions most in vogue among those who desired to adhere closely to the manner of their forefathers upon the whole i found the ways of life which had been brought over in the mayflower from the stern sects of england and preserved through the revolutionary war for liberty to be very pleasant ways and i made up my mind that a yankee puritan can be an uncommonly pleasant fellow 
I wish that some of them did not dine so early, for when a man sits down at half-past two, that keeping up of the after-dinner recreation still bedtime becomes hard work. In Boston the houses are very spacious and excellent, and they are always furnished with those luxuries which it is so difficult to introduce into an old house. They have hot and cold water pipes into every room and baths attached to the bedchambers. It is not only that comfort is increased by such arrangements, but that much labor is saved. In an old English house it will occupy a servant the best part of the day to carry water up and down for a large family. Everything also is spacious, commodious, and well-lighted. I certainly think that in house-building the Americans have gone beyond us, for even our new houses are not commodious as are theirs. One practice which they have in their cities would hardly suit our limited London spaces. When the body of the house is built, they throw out the dining-room behind. It stands alone, as it were, with no other chamber above it, and removed from the rest of the house. It is consequently behind the double drawing-rooms which form the ground floor, and is approached from them and also from the back of the hall. The second entrance to the dining-room is thus near the top of the kitchen stairs, which no doubt is its proper position. The whole of the upper part of the house is thus kept for the private uses of the family. To me this plan of building recommended itself as being very commodious. I found the spirit for the war quite as hot at Boston now, in November, if not hotter than it was when I was there ten weeks earlier, and I found also, to my grief, that the feeling against England was as strong. I can easily understand how difficult it must have been, and still must be, to Englishmen at home to understand this and see how it has come to pass. It has not arisen, I think, from the old jealousy of England. It has not sprung from that source which for years has induced certain newspapers, especially the New York Herald, to vilify England. I do not think that the men of New England have ever been, as regards this matter, in the same boat with the New York Herald. But when this war between the North and South first broke out, even before there was as yet a war, the Northern men had taught themselves to expect what they called British sympathy, meaning British encouragement. They regarded, and properly regarded, the action of the South as a rebellion, and said among themselves that so staid and conservative a nation as Great Britain would surely countenance them in quelling rebels. If not, should it come to pass that Great Britain should show no such countenance and sympathy for Northern law, if Great Britain did not respond to her friend as she was expected to respond, then it would appear that Cotton was king, at least in British eyes. The war did come, and Great Britain regarded the two parties as belligerents, standing as far as she was concerned on equal grounds. This it was that first gave rise to that fretful anger against England which has gone so far toward ruining the northern cause. We know how such passions are swelled by being ventilated, and how they are communicated from mind to mind till they become national. Politicians, American politicians I here mean, have their own future careers ever before their eyes and are driven to make capital where they can. Hence it is that such men as Mr. Seward in the cabinet and Mr. Everett out of it can reconcile it to themselves to speak as they have done of England. It was but the other day that Mr. Everett spoke in one of his orations of the hope that still existed that the flag of the United States might still float over the whole continent of North America, what would he say of an English statesman who should speak of putting up the Union Jack on the State House in Boston? Such words tell for the moment on the hearers and help to gain some slight popularity, but they tell for more than a moment on those who read them and remember them. And then came the capture of Messrs. Slidell and Mason. I was at Boston when those two men were taken out of the Trent by the San Jacinto and brought to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. Captain Wilkes was the officer who had made the capture, and he immediately was recognized as a hero. He was invited to banquets and fêted. Speeches were made to him, as speeches are commonly made to high officers who come home after many perils, victorious from the wars. His health was drunk with great applause, and thanks were voted to him by one of the Houses of Congress. It was said that a sword was to be given to him, but I do not think that the gift was consummated. Should it not have been a policeman's truncheon? Had he, at the best, done anything beyond a policeman's work? 
of Captain Wilkes no one would complain for doing policeman's duty. If his country were satisfied with the manner in which he did it, England, if she quarrelled at all, would not quarrel with him. It may now and again become the duty of a brave officer to do work of so low a calibre. It is a pity that an ambitious sailor should find himself told off for so mean a task, but the world would know that it is not his fault. No one could blame Captain Wilkes for acting policeman on the seas. But who ever before heard of giving a man glory for achievements so little glorious? How Captain Wilkes must have blushed when those speeches were made to him, when that talk about the sword came up, when the thanks arrived to him from Congress. An officer receives his country's thanks when he has been in great peril, and has borne himself gallantly through his danger, when he has endured the brunt of war and come through it with victory when he has exposed himself on behalf of his country and singed his epaulettes with an enemy's fire. Captain Wilkes tapped a merchantman on the shoulder in the high seas and told him that his passengers were wanted. In doing this he showed no lack of spirit for it might be his duty. But where was his spirit when he submitted to be thanked for such work? And then there arose a clamor of justification among the lawyers judges and ex-judges flew to wheaton Fillimore, and lord stowell before twenty-four hours were over every man and every woman in boston were armed with precedents then there was the burning of the caroline england had improperly burned the caroline on lake erie or rather in one of the american ports on lake erie and had then begged pardon if the states had been wrong they would beg pardon but whether wrong or right they would not give up slidell and mason but the lawyers soon waxed stronger. The men were manifestly ambassadors, and as such contraband of war. Wilkes was quite right, only he should have seized the vessel also. He was quite right, for though Slidell and Mason might not be ambassadors, they were undoubtedly carrying dispatches. In a few hours there began to be a doubt whether the men could be ambassadors, because if called ambassadors, then the power that sent the embassy must be presumed to be recognized that captain wilkes had taken no dispatches was true but the captain suggested a way out of this difficulty by declaring that he had regarded the two men themselves as an incarnated embodiment of dispatches at any rate they were clearly contraband of war they were going to do an injury to the north it was pretty to hear the charming women of boston as they became learned in the law of nations wheaton is quite clear about it one young girl said to me it was the first I had ever heard of Wheaton and so far was obliged to knock under. All the world, ladies and lawyers, expressed the utmost confidence in the justice of the seizure, but it was clear that all the world was in a state of the profoundest nervous anxiety on the subject. To me it seemed to be the most suicidal act that any party in a life-and-death struggle ever committed. All Americans on both sides had felt, from the beginning of the war, that any assistance given by England to one or the other would turn the scale. The government of Mr. Lincoln must have learned by this time that England was at least true in her neutrality, that no desire for cotton would compel her to give aid to the South as long as she herself was not ill-treated by the North. But it seemed as though Mr. Seward, the President's Prime Minister, had no better work on hand than that of showing in every way his indifference as to courtesy with England. Insults offered to England would, he seemed to think, strengthen his hands. He would let England know that he did not care for her. When our Minister Lord Lyons appealed to him regarding the suspension of the habeas corpus, Mr. Seward not only answered him with insolence, but instantly published his answer in the papers. He instituted a system of passports especially constructed so as to incommode Englishmen proceeding from the States across the Atlantic. He resolved to make every Englishman in America feel himself in some way punished because England had not assisted the North. And now came the arrest of Slidell and Mason out of an English mail steamer, and Mr. Seward took care to let it be understood that happen what might, those two men should not be given up. Nothing during all this time astonished me so much as the estimation in which Mr. Seward was then held by his own party. It is, perhaps, the worst defect in the Constitution of the States that no incapacity on the part of a minister, no amount of condemnation expressed against him by the people or by Congress, can put him out of office during the term of the existing presidency. The President can dismiss him, 
but it generally happens that the president is brought in on a platform which has already nominated for him his cabinet as thoroughly as they have nominated him mr seward ran mr lincoln very hard for the position of candidate for the presidency on the republican interest on the second voting of the republican delegates at the convention at chicago mr seward polled one hundred eighty four to mr lincoln's one hundred eighty one but as a clear half of the total number of votes was necessary that is two hundred thirty three out of four hundred sixty five there was necessarily a third polling and mr lincoln won the day on that occasion mr chase and mr cameron both of whom became members of mr lincoln's cabinet were also candidates for the white house on the republican side i mention this here to show that though the president can in fact dismiss his ministers he is in a great manner bound to them and that a minister in mr seward's position is hardly to be dismissed but from the first of november eighteen sixty one till the day on which i left the states i do not think that i heard a good word spoken of mr seward as a minister even by one of his own party the radical or abolitionist republicans all abused him the conservative or anti-abolition republicans to whose party he would consider himself as belonging spoke of him as a mistake he had been prominent as senator from new york and had been governor of the state of new york but had none of the aptitudes of a statesman he was there and it was a pity he was not so bad as mr cameron the minister for war that was the best his own party could say for him even in his own state of new york as to the democrats their language respecting him was as harsh as any that i have heard used toward the southern leaders he seemed to have no friends no one who trusted him and yet he was the president's chief minister and seemed to have in his own hands the power of mismanaging all foreign relations as he pleased but in truth the states of america great as they are and much as they have done have not produced statesmen that theory of governing by the little men rather than by the great has not been found to answer and such follies as those of mr seward have been the consequence at boston and indeed elsewhere i found that there was even then at the time of the capture of these two men no true conception of the neutrality of england with reference to the two parties when any argument was made showing that england who had carried these messengers from the south would undoubtedly have also carried messengers from the north the answer always was but the southerners are all rebels will england regard us who are by treaty her friend as she does a people that is in rebellion against its own government that was the old story over again and as it was a very long story it was hardly of use to go back through all its details but the fact was that unless there had been such absolute neutrality such equality between the parties in the eyes of england even captain wilkes would not have thought of stopping the trent or the government at washington of justifying such a proceeding and it must be remembered that the government at washington had justified that proceeding the secretary of the navy had distinctly done so in his official report and that report had been submitted to the president and published by his order it was because england was neutral between the north and south that captain wilkes claimed to have the right of seizing those two men it had been the president's intention some month or so before this affair to send mr everett and other gentlemen over to england with objects as regards the north similar to those which had caused the sending of slidell and mason with reference to the south what would mr everett have thought had he been refused a passage from dover to calais because the carrying of him would have been toward the south a breach of neutrality it would never have occurred to him that he could become subject to such stoppage how should we have been abused for southern sympathies had we so acted we forsooth who carry passengers about the world from china and australia round to chile and peru who have the charge of the world's passengers and letters and as a nation incur out of our pocket annually a loss of some half million of pounds sterling for the privilege of doing so or to inquire the business of every american traveller before we let him on board and be stopped in our work if we take anybody on one side whose journeyings may be conceived by the other side to be to them prejudicial not on such terms will englishmen be willing to spread civilization across the ocean i do not pretend to understand wheaton and Fillimore, or even to have read a single word of any international law i have refused to read any such knowing that it would only confuse and mislead me 
but I have my common sense to guide me. Two men living in one street quarrel and shy brickbats at each other and make the whole street very uncomfortable. Not only is no one to interfere with them, but they are to have the privilege of deciding that their brickbats have the right of way rather than the ordinary intercourse of the neighborhood. If that be national law, national law must be changed. It might do for some centuries back, but it cannot do now. Up to this period my sympathies had been with the North. I thought and still think that the North had no alternative, that the war had been forced upon them, and that they had gone about their work with patriotic energy. But this stopping of an English mail steamer was too much for me. What will they do in England? was now the question. But for any knowledge as to that, I had to wait till I reached Washington. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of North America, Volume 1 by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 17. Cambridge and Lowell. The two places of most general interest in the vicinity of Boston are Cambridge and Lowell. Cambridge is to Massachusetts, and I may almost say is to all the northern states, what Cambridge and Oxford are to England. It is the seat of the university which gives the highest education to be attained by the highest classes in that country. Lowell also is in little to Massachusetts and to New England what Manchester is to us in so great a degree. It is the largest and most prosperous cotton manufacturing town in the States. Cambridge is not above three or four miles from Boston. Indeed, the town of Cambridge property so-called begins where Boston ceases. The Harvard College, that is its name taken from one of its original founders, is reached by horse cars in twenty minutes from the city. An Englishman feels inclined to regard the place as a suburb of Boston, but if he so expresses himself he will not find favor in the eyes of the men of Cambridge. The university is not so large as I had expected to find it. It consists of Harvard College as the undergraduate's department and of professional schools of law, medicine, divinity, and science. In the few words that I will say about it I will confine myself to Harvard College proper, conceiving that the professional schools connected with it have not in themselves any special interest. The average number of undergraduates does not exceed 450, and these are divided into four classes. The average number of degrees taken annually by bachelors of art is something under 100. Four years' residence is required for a degree, and at the end of that period a degree is given as a matter of course if the candidate's conduct has been satisfactory. When a young man has pursued his studies for that period, going through the required examinations and lectures, he is not subjected to any final examination, as is the case with a candidate for a degree at Oxford and Cambridge. It is, perhaps, in this respect that the greatest difference exists between the English universities and Harvard College. With us, a young man may, I take it, still go through his three or four years with a small amount of study but his so doing does not insure him his degree. If he have utterly wasted his time, he is plucked, and late but heavy punishment comes upon him. At Cambridge in Massachusetts, the daily work of the men is made more obligatory. But if this be gone through with such diligence as to enable the student to hold his own during the four years, he has his degree as a matter of course. There are no degrees conferring special honor. A man cannot go out in honors as he does with us. There are no firsts or double firsts, no wranglers, no senior ops or junior ops. Nor are the prizes of fellowships and livings to be obtained. It is, I think, evident from this that the greatest incentives to high excellence are wanting at Harvard College. There is neither the reward of honor nor of money. There is none of that great competition which exists at our Cambridge for the high place of senior wrangler and, consequently, the degree of excellence attained is no doubt lower than with us. But I conceive that the general level of the university education is higher there than with us, that a young man is more sure of getting his education, and that a smaller percentage of men leaves Harvard College utterly uneducated than goes in that condition out of Oxford or Cambridge. The education at Harvard College is more diversified in its nature, 
and study is more absolutely the business of the place than it is at our universities. The expense of education at Harvard College is not much lower than at our colleges. With us there are, no doubt, more men who are absolutely extravagant than at Cambridge, Massachusetts. The actual authorized expenditure in accordance with the rules is only fifty pounds per annum, i.e. two hundred forty nine dollars. But this does not by any means include everything. Some of the richer young men may spend as much as three hundred pounds per annum, but the largest number vary their expenditure from one hundred pounds to one hundred eighty pounds per annum. And I take it the same thing may be said of our universities. There are many young men at Harvard College of very small means. They will live on seventy pounds per annum and will earn a great portion of that by teaching in the vacations. There are thirty-six scholarships attached to the university, varying in value from twenty pounds to sixty pounds per annum. And there is also a beneficiary fund for supplying poor scholars with assistance during their collegiate education. Many are thus brought up at Cambridge who have no means of their own, and I think I may say that the consideration in which they are held among their brother students is in no degree affected by their position. I doubt whether we can say so much of the sizers and Bible clerks at our universities. At Harvard College there is, of course, none of that old-fashioned, time-honored, delicious medieval life which lends so much grace and beauty to our colleges. There are no gates, no porter's lodges, no butteries, no halls, no battles, and no common rooms. There are no proctors, no bulldogs, no bursars, no deans, no morning and evening chapel, no quads, no surplices, no caps and gowns. I have already said that there are no examinations for degrees and no honors, and I can easily conceive that in the absence of all these essentials, many an Englishman will ask what right Harvard College has to call itself a university. I have said that there are no honors, and in our sense there are none. But I should give offense to my American friends if I did not explain that there are prizes given. I think all in money, and that they vary from fifty to ten dollars. These are called debtors. The degrees are given on commencement day, at which occasion certain of the expectant graduates are selected to take parts in a public literary exhibition. To be so selected seems to be tantamount to taking a degree in honors. There is also a dinner on commencement day at which, however, no wine or other intoxicating drink shall be served. It is required that every student shall attend some place of Christian worship on Sundays, but he or his parents for him may elect what denomination of church he shall attend. There is a university chapel on the university grounds which belongs, if I remember aright, to the Episcopalian church. The young men, for the most part, live in college, having rooms in the college buildings, but they do not board in those rooms. There are establishments in the town under the patronage of the university at which dinner, breakfast, and supper are provided, and the young men frequent one of these houses or another as they or their friends for them may arrange. Every young man not belonging to a family resident within a hundred miles of Cambridge, and whose parents are desirous to obtain the protection thus provided, is placed, as regards his pecuniary management, under the care of a patron and this patron acts by him as a father does in england by a boy at school he pays out his money for him and keeps him out of debt the arrangement will not recommend itself to young men at oxford quite so powerfully as it may do to the fathers of some young men who have been there the rules with regard to the lodging and boarding-houses are very stringent any festive entertainment is to be reported to the president no wine or spirituous liquors may be used etc it is not a picturesque system, this, but it has its advantages. There is a handsome library attached to the college which the young men can use, but it is not as extensive as I had expected. The university is not well off for funds by which to increase it. The new museum in the college is also a handsome building. The edifices used for the undergraduates' chambers and for the lecture rooms are by no means handsome. They are very ugly, red brick houses standing here and there without order. There are seven such, and they are called Brattle House, College House, Divinity Hall, Hollis Hall, Hallsworthy Hall, Massachusetts Hall, and Stoughton Hall. It is almost astonishing that buildings so ugly should have been erected for such a purpose. 
these together with the library the museum and the chapel stand on a large green which might be made pretty enough if it were kept well mown like the gardens of our cambridge colleges but it is much neglected here again the want of funds the augusta res domi must be pleaded as an excuse on the same green but at some little distance from any other building stands the president's pleasant house the immediate direction of the college is of course mainly in the hands of the president who is supreme but for the general management of the institution there is a corporation of which he is one it is stated in the laws of the university that the corporation of the university and its overseers constitute the government of the university the corporation consists of the president five fellows so called and a treasurer these fellows are chosen as vacancies occur by themselves subject to the concurrence of the overseers but these fellows are in no wise like to the fellows of our colleges having no salaries attached to their offices the board of overseers consists of the state governor other state officers the president and treasurer of harvard college and thirty other persons men of note chosen by vote the faculty of the college in which is vested the immediate care and government of the undergraduates is composed of the president and the professors the professors answer to the tutors of our colleges and upon them the education of the place depends i cannot complete this short notice of harvard college without saying that it is happy in the possession of that distinguished natural philosopher professor agassiz m agassiz has collected at cambridge a museum of such things as natural philosophers delight to show which i am told is all but invaluable as my ignorance on all such matters is of a depth which the professor can hardly imagine and which it would have shocked him to behold i did not visit the museum taking the university of harvard college as a whole i should say that it is most remarkable in this that it does really give to its pupils that education which it professes to give of our own universities other good things may be said but that one special good thing cannot always be said cambridge boasts itself as the residence of four or five men well known to fame on the american and also on the european side of the ocean president felton's name is very familiar to us and wherever greek scholarship is held in repute that is known note since these words were written president felton has died i as i returned on my way homeward had the melancholy privilege of being present at his funeral i feel bound to record here the great kindness with which mr felton assisted me in obtaining such information as i needed respecting the institution over which he presided and note so is also the name of professor agassiz of whom i have spoken russell lowell is one of the professors of the college that russell lowell who sang of bird of freedom sawin and whose biglow papers were edited with such an ardour of love by our tom brown bird of freedom is worthy of all the ardour mr dana is also a cambridge man he who was two years before the mast and who since that has written to us of cuba but mr dana though residing at cambridge is not of cambridge and though a literary man he does not belong to literature he is could he help it a special attorney i must not however degrade him for in the states barristers and attorneys are all one i cannot but think that he could help it and that he should not give up to law what was meant for mankind i fear however that successful law has caught him in her intolerant clutches and that literature who surely would be the nobler mistress must wear the willow last and greatest is the poet laureate of the west for mr longfellow also lives at cambridge i am not at all aware whether the nature of the manufacturing corporation of lowell is generally understood by englishmen i confess that until i made personal acquaintance with the plan i was absolutely ignorant on the subject i knew that lowell was a manufacturing town at which cotton is made into calico and at which calico is printed as is the case at manchester but i conceived this was done at lowell as it is done at manchester by individual enterprise that i or anyone else could open a mill at lowell and that the manufacturers there were ordinary traders as they are at other manufacturing towns but this is by no means the case 
that which most surprises an english visitor on going through the mills at lowell is the personal appearance of the men and women who work at them as there are twice as many women as there are men it is to them that the attention is chiefly called they are not only better dressed cleaner and better mounted in every respect than the girls employed at manufactories in england but they are so infinitely superior as to make a stranger immediately perceive that some very strong cause must have created the difference we all know the class of young women whom we generally see serving behind counters in the shops of our larger cities they are neat well dressed careful especially about their hair composed in their manner and sometimes a little supercilious in the propriety of their demeanour it is exactly the same class of young women that one sees in the factories at lowell they are not sallow nor dirty nor ragged nor rough they have about them no signs of want or of low culture many of us also know the appearance of those girls who work in the factories in england and i think it will be allowed that a second glance at them is not wanting to show that they are in every respect inferior to the young women who attend our shops the matter indeed requires no argument any young woman at a shop would be insulted by being asked whether she had worked at a factory the difference with regard to the men at lowell is quite as strong though not so striking working men do not show their status in the world by their outward appearance as readily as women and as i have said before the number of the women greatly exceeded that of the men one would of course be disposed to say that the superior condition of the workers must have been occasioned by superior wages and this to a certain extent has been the cause but the higher payment is not the chief cause women's wages including all that they receive at the lowell factories average about fourteen shillings a week which is i take it fully a third more than women can earn in manchester or did earn before the loss of the american cotton began to tell upon them but if wages at manchester were raised to the lowell standard the manchester woman would not be clothed fed cared for and educated like the lowell women the fact is that the workmen and the workwomen at lowell are not exposed to the chances of an open labour market they are taken in as it were to a philanthropical manufacturing college and then looked after and regulated more as girls and lads at a great seminary than as hands by whose industry profit is to be made out of capital this is all very nice and pretty at lowell but i am afraid it could not be done at manchester there are at present twelve different manufactories at lowell each of which has what is called a separate corporation the merrimack manufacturing company was incorporated in eighteen twenty two and thus lowell was commenced the lowell machine shop was incorporated in eighteen forty five and since that no new establishment has been added in eighteen twenty one a certain boston manufacturing company which had mills at waltham near boston was attracted by the water power of the river merrimack on which the present town of lowell is situated a canal called the pawtucket canal had been made for purposes of navigation from one reach of the river to another with the object of avoiding the pawtucket falls and this canal with the adjacent water power of the river was purchased for the boston company the place was then called lowell after one of the partners in that company it must be understood that water power alone is used for preparing the cotton and working the spindles and looms of the cotton mills steam is applied in the two establishments in which the cottons are printed for the purposes of printing but i think nowhere else when the mills are at full work about two and a half million yards of cotton goods are made every week and nearly a million pounds of cotton are consumed per week i e eight hundred forty two thousand pounds but the consumption of coal is only thirty thousand tons in the year this will give some idea of the value of the water power the pawtucket canal was as i say bought and lowell was commenced the town was incorporated in eighteen twenty six and the railway between it and boston was opened in eighteen thirty five under the superintendence of mr jackson the gentleman by whom the purchase of the canal had in the first instance been made lowell now contains about forty thousand inhabitants the following extract is taken from the handbook to lowell mr f c lowell had in his travels abroad observed the effect of large manufacturing establishments on the character of the people and in the establishment at watham the founders looked for a remedy for these defects they thought that education and good morals would even enhance the profit 
and that they could compete with great britain by introducing a more cultivated class of operatives for this purpose they built boarding-houses which under the direct supervision of the agent were kept by discreet matrons i can answer for the discreet matrons at lowell mostly widows no boarders being allowed except operatives agents and overseers of high moral character were selected regulations were adopted at the mills and boarding-houses by which only respectable girls were employed the mills were nicely painted and swept i can also answer for the painting and sweeping at lowell trees set out in the yards and along the streets habits of neatness and cleanliness encouraged and the result justified the expenditure at lowell the same policy has been adopted and extended more spacious mills and elegant boarding-houses have been erected as to the elegance it may be a matter of taste but as to the comfort there is no question the same care as to the classes employed more capital has been expended for cleanliness and decoration a hospital has been established for the sick where for a small price they have an experienced physician and skilful nurses an institute with an extensive library for the use of the mechanics has been endowed the agents have stood forward in the support of schools churches lectures and lyceums and their influence contributed highly to the elevation of the moral and intellectual character of the operatives talent has been encouraged brought forward and recommended for some considerable time the young women wrote edited and published a newspaper among themselves called the lowell offering and lowell has supplied agents and mechanics for the later manufacturing places who have given tone to society and extended the beneficial influence of lowell through the united states girls from the country with a true yankee spirit of independence and confident in their own powers pass a few years here and then return to get married with a dower secured by their exertions with more enlarged ideas and extended means of information and their places are supplied by younger relatives a large proportion of the female population of new england has been employed at some time in manufacturing establishments and they are not on this account less good wives mothers or educators of families then the account goes on to tell how the health of the girls has been improved by their attendance at the mills how they put money into the savings banks and buy railway shares and farms how there are thirty churches in lowell a library banks and insurance offices how there is a cemetery and a park and how everything is beautiful philanthropic profitable and magnificent thus lowell is the realization of a commercial utopia of all the statements made in the little book which i have quoted i cannot point out one which is exaggerated much less false i should not call the place elegant in other respects i am disposed to stand by the book before i had made an inquiry into the cause of the apparent comfort it struck me at once that some great effort at excellence was being made i went into one of the discreet matron's residences and perhaps may give but an indifferent idea of her discretion when i say that she allowed me to go into the bedrooms if you want to ascertain the inner ways or habits of life of any man woman or child see if it be practicable to do so his or her bedroom you will learn more by a minute's glance round that holy of holies than by any conversation looking-glasses and such like suspended dresses and toilet belongings if taken without notice cannot lie or even exaggerate the discreet matron at first showed me rooms only prepared for use for at the period of my visit lowell was by no means full but she soon became more intimate with me and i went through the upper part of the house my report must be altogether in her favour and in that of lowell everything was cleanly well ordered and feminine there was not a bed on which any woman need have hesitated to lay herself if occasion required it i fear that this cannot be said of the lodgings of the manufacturing classes at manchester the boarders all take their meals together as a rule they have meat twice a day hot meat for dinner is with them as much a matter of course or probably more so than with any englishman or woman who may read this book for in the states of america regulations on this matter are much more rigid than with us cold meat is rarely seen and to live a day without meat would be as great a privation as to pass a night without a bed the rules for the guidance of these boarding-houses are very rigid 
the houses themselves belong to the corporations or different manufacturing establishments and the tenants are altogether in the power of the managers none but operatives are to be taken in the tenants are answerable for improper conduct the doors are to be closed at ten o'clock any boarders who do not attend divine worship are to be reported to the managers the yards and walks are to be kept clean and snow removed at once and the inmates must be vaccinated etc 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 it is expressly stated by the hamilton company and i believe by all the companies that no one shall be employed who is habitually absent from public worship on sunday or who is known to be guilty of immorality it is stated that the average wages of the women are two dollars or eight shillings a week besides their board i found when i was there that from three dollars to three and a half a week were paid to the women of which they paid one dollar and twenty-five cents for their board as this would not fully cover the expense of their keep twenty-five cents a week for each was also paid to the boarding-house keepers by the mill agents this substantially came to the same thing as it left the two dollars a week or eight shillings with the girls over and above their cost of living the board included washing lights food bed and attendance leaving a surplus of eight shillings a week for clothes and saving now let me ask any one acquainted with manchester and its operatives whether this is not utopia realized factory girls for whom every comfort of life is secured with twenty-one pounds a year over for saving and dress one sees the failing however at a moment it is utopia any lady bountiful can tutor three or four peasants and make them luxuriously comfortable but no lady bountiful can give luxurious comfort to half a dozen parishes lowell is now nearly forty years old and contains but forty thousand inhabitants from the very nature of its corporations it cannot spread itself chicago which has grown out of nothing in a much shorter period and which has no factories has now one hundred twenty thousand inhabitants lowell is a very wonderful place and shows what philanthropy can do but i fear it also shows what philanthropy cannot do there are however other establishments conducted on the same principle as those at lowell which have had the same amount or rather the same sort of success lawrence is now a town of about fifteen thousand inhabitants and manchester of about twenty four thousand if i remember rightly and at those places the mills are also owned by corporations and conducted as are those at lowell but it seems to me that as new england takes her place in the world as a great manufacturing country which place she undoubtedly will take sooner or later she must abandon the hothouse method of providing for her operatives with which she has commenced her work in the first place lowell is not open as a manufacturing town to the capitalists even of new england at large stock may i presume be bought in the corporations but no interloper can establish a mill there it is a close manufacturing community bolstered up on all sides and has none of that capacity for providing employment for a thickly growing population which belongs to such places as manchester and leeds that it should under its present system have been made in any degree profitable reflects great credit on the managers but the profit does reach an amount which in america can be considered as remunerative the total capital invested by the twelve corporations is thirteen million and a half of dollars or about two million seven hundred thousand pounds in only one of the corporations that of the merrimac company does the profit amount to twelve per cent in one that of the booth company it falls below seven per cent the average profit of the various establishments is something below nine per cent i am of course speaking of lowell as it was previous to the war american capitalists are not as a rule contented with so low a rate of interest as this the states in these matters have had a great advantage over england they have been able to begin at the beginning manufactories have grown up among us as our cities grew from the necessities and chances of the times when labor was wanted it was obtained in the ordinary way and so when houses were built they were built in the ordinary way we had not the experience and the results either for good or bad of other nations to guide us the americans in seeing and resolving to adopt our commercial successes have resolved also if possible to avoid the evils which have attended those successes 
it would be very desirable that all our factory girls should read and write wear clean clothes have decent beds and eat hot meat every day but that is now impossible gradually with very uphill work but still i trust with sure work much will be done to improve their position and render their life respectable but in england we can have no lowells in our thickly populated island any commercial utopia is out of the question nor can i as i think lowell be taken as a type of the future manufacturing towns of new england when new england employs millions in her factories instead of thousands the hands employed at lowell when the mills are at full work are about eleven thousand she must cease to provide for them their beds and meals their church-going proprieties and orderly modes of life in such an attempt she has all the experience of the world against her but nevertheless i think she will have done much good the tone which she will have given will not altogether lose its influence employment in a factory is now considered reputable by a farmer and his children and this idea will remain factory work is regarded as more respectable than domestic service and this prestige will not wear itself altogether out those now employed have a strong conception of the dignity of their own social position and their successors will inherit much of this even though they may find themselves excluded from the advantages of the present utopia the thing has begun well but it can only be regarded as a beginning steam it may be presumed will become the motive power of cotton mills in new england as it is with us and when it is so the amount of work to be done at any one place will not be checked by any such limit as that which now prevails at lowell water power is very cheap but it cannot be extended and it would seem that no place can become large as a manufacturing town which has to depend chiefly upon water it is not improbable that steam may be brought into general use at lowell and that lowell may spread itself if it should spread itself widely it will lose its utopian characteristics one cannot but be greatly struck by the spirit of philanthropy in which the system of lowell was at first instituted it may be presumed that men who put their money into such an undertaking did so with the object of commercial profit to themselves but in this case that was not their first object i think it may be taken for granted that when messrs jackson and lowell went about their task their grand idea was to place factory work upon a respectable footing to give employment in mills which should not be unhealthy degrading demoralizing or hard in its circumstances throughout the northern states of america the same feeling is to be seen good and thoughtful men have been active to spread education to maintain health to make work compatible with comfort and personal dignity and to divest the ordinary lot of man of the sting of that curse which was supposed to be uttered when our first father was ordered to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow one is driven to contrast this feeling of which on all sides one sees such ample testimony with that sharp desire for profit that anxiety to do a stroke of trade at every turn that acknowledged necessity of being smart which we must own is quite as general as the nobler propensity i believe that both cases of commercial activity may be attributed to the same characteristic men in trade in america are not more covetous than tradesmen in england nor probably are they more generous or philanthropical but that which they do they are more anxious to do thoroughly and quickly they desire that every turn shall be a great turn or at any rate that it shall be as great as possible they go ahead for bad or good with all the energy they have in the institutions at lowell i think we may allow that the good has very much prevailed i went over two of the mills those of the merrimack corporation and of the massachusetts at the former the printing establishment only was at work the cotton mills were closed i hardly know whether it will interest any one to learn that something under half a million yards of calico are here printed annually at the lowell bleachery fifteen million yards are dyed annually the merrimack cotton mills were stopped and so had the other mills at lowell been stopped till some short time before my visit trade had been bad and there had of course been a lack of cotton i was assured that no severe suffering had been created by this stoppage the greater number of hands had returned into the country to the farms from whence they had come and though a discontinuance of work and wages had of course produced hardship there had been no actual privation no hunger and want 
those of the workpeople who had no homes out of Lowell to which to betake themselves, and no means at Lowell of living, had received relief before real suffering had begun. I was assured, with something of a smile of contempt at the question, that there had been nothing like hunger. But, as I said before, visitors always see a great deal of rose color, and should endeavor to allay the brilliancy of the tint with the proper amount of human shading. But do not let any visitor mix in the browns with too heavy a hand. At the Massachusetts cotton mills they were working with about two-thirds of their full number of hands, and this, I was told, was about the average of the number now employed throughout Lowell. Working at this rate, they had now on hand a supply of cotton to last them for six months. Their stocks had been increased lately, and, on asking from whence, I was informed that that last received had come to them from Liverpool. There is, I believe, no doubt but that a considerable quantity of cotton has been shipped back from England to the States since the Civil War began. I asked the gentleman to whose care at Lowell I was consigned whether he expected to get cotton from the South for at that time Beaufort in South Carolina had just been taken by the naval expedition. He had, he said, a political expectation of a supply of cotton, but not a commercial expectation. That at least was the gist of his reply, and I found it to be both intelligent and intelligible. The Massachusetts mills, when at full work, employ 1,300 females and 400 males, and turn out 540,000 yards of calico per week. On my return from Lowell in the smoking car, an old man came and squeezed in next to me. The place was terribly crowded, and as the old man was thin and clean and quiet, I willingly made room for him, so as to avoid the contiguity of a neighbor who might be neither thin nor clean nor quiet. He began talking to me in whispers about the war, and I was suspicious that he was a southerner and a secessionist. Under such circumstances his company might not be agreeable, unless he could be induced to hold his tongue. At last he said, "'I come from Canada, you know, and you, you're an Englishman, and therefore I can speak to you openly.' And he gave me an affectionate grip on the knee with his old skinny hand. "'I suppose I do look more like an Englishman than an American, but I was surprised at his knowing me with such certainty.' "'There is no mistaking you,' he said, "'with your round face and your red cheeks. "'They don't look like that here.' "'And he gave me another grip. "'I felt quite fond of the old man "'and offered him a cigar.'" End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of North America, Volume 1 by Antony Trollope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 18. The Rights of Women We all know that the subject which appears above as the title of this chapter is a very favorite subject in America. It is, I hope, a very favorite subject here also, and I am inclined to think has been so for many years past. The rights of women, as contradistinguished from the wrongs of women, has perhaps been the most precious of the legacies left to us by the feudal ages. How, amid the rough darkness of old Teuton rule, women began to receive that respect which is now their dearest right, is one of the most interesting studies of history. It came, I take it, chiefly from their own conduct. The women of the old classic races seem to have enjoyed but a small amount of respect or of rights, and to have deserved as little. It may have been very well for one Caesar to have said that his wife should be above suspicion, but his wife was put away, and therefore either did not have her rights or else had justly forfeited them. The daughter of the next Caesar lived in Rome the life of a Messalina, and did not on that account seem to have lost her position in society, till she absolutely declined to throw any veil whatever over her propensities. But as the Roman Empire fell, chivalry began. For a time even chivalry afforded but a dull time to the women. During the musical period of the troubadours, ladies, I fancy, had but little to amuse themselves save the music. But that was the beginning, and from that time downward the rights of women have progressed very favorably. It may be that they have not yet all that should belong to them. If that be the case, let the men lose no time in making up the difference. But it seems to me that the women who are now making their claims may perhaps hardly know when they are well off. 
it will be an ill movement if they insist on throwing away any of the advantages they have won as for the women in america especially i must confess that i think they have a good time i make them my compliments on their sagacity intelligence and attractions but i utterly refuse to them any sympathy for supposed wrongs o fortunata sua si bona norint whether or no were i an american married man and father of a family i should not go in for the rights of man that is altogether another question this question of the rights of women divides itself into two heads one of which is very important worthy of much consideration capable perhaps of much philanthropic action and at any rate affording matter for grave discussion this is the question of women's work how far the work of the world which is now borne chiefly by men should be thrown open to women further than is now done the other seems to me to be worthy of no consideration to be capable of no action to admit of no grave discussion this refers to the political rights of women how far the political working of the world which is now entirely in the hands of men should be divided between them and women the first question is being debated on our side of the atlantic as keenly perhaps as on the american side as to that other question i do not know that much has ever been said about it in europe you are doing nothing in england toward the employment of females a lady said to me in one of the states soon after my arrival in america pardon me i answered i think we are doing much perhaps too much at any rate we are doing something i then explained to her how miss faithful had instituted a printing establishment in london how all the work in that concern was done by females except such heavy tasks as those for which women could not be fitted and i handed to her one of miss faithful's cards ah said my american friend poor creatures i have no doubt their very flesh will be worked off their bones i thought this a little unjust on her part but nevertheless it occurred to me as an answer not unfit to be made by some other lady by some woman who had not already advocated the increased employment of women let miss faithful look to that not that she will work the flesh of her young women's bones or allow such terrible consequences to take place in quorum street not that she or that those connected with her in that enterprise will do aught but good to those employed therein it will not even be said of her individually or of her partners that they have worked the flesh off women's bones but may it not come to this that when the tasks now done by men have been shifted to the shoulders of women women themselves will so complain may it not go further and come even to this that women will have cause for such complaint i do not think that such a result will come because i do not think that the object desired by those who are active in the matter will be attained men as a general rule among civilized nations have elected to earn their own bread and the bread of the women also and from this resolve on their part i do not think that they will be beaten off we know that mrs dahl an american lady has taken up this subject and has written a book on it in which great good sense and honesty of purpose is shown mrs dahl is a strong advocate for the increased employment of women and i with great deference disagree with her i allude to her book now because she has pointed out i think very strongly the great reason why women do not engage themselves advantageously in trade pursuits she by no means overpraises her own sex and openly declares that young women will not consent to place themselves in fair competition with men they will not undergo the labor and servitude of long study at their trades they will not give themselves up to an apprenticeship they will not enter upon their tasks as though they were to be the tasks of their lives they may have the same physical and mental aptitudes for learning a trade as men but they have not the same devotion to the pursuit and will not bind themselves to it thoroughly as men do in all which i quite agree with mrs dahl and the english of it is that the young women want to get married god forbid that they should not so want indeed god has forbidden in a very express way that there should be any lack of such a desire on the part of women there has of late years arisen a feeling among masses of the best of our english ladies that this feminine propensity should be checked we are told that unmarried women may be respectable which we always knew that they may be useful which we also acknowledge thinking still that if married they would be more useful 
and that they may be happy which we trust feeling confident however that they might in another position be more happy but the question is not only as to the respectability usefulness and happiness of womankind but as to that of men also if women can do without marriage can men do so and if not how are the men to get wives if the women elect to remain single it will be thought that i am treating the subject as though it were simply jocose but i beg to assure my reader that such is not my intention it certainly is the fact that that disinclination to an apprenticeship and unwillingness to bear the long training for a trade of which mrs doll complains on the part of young women arise from the fact that they have other hopes with which such apprenticeships would jar and it is also certain that if such disinclination be overcome on the part of any great number it must be overcome by the destruction or banishment of such hopes the question is whether good or evil would result from such a change it is often said that whatever difficulty a woman may have in getting a husband no man need encounter difficulty in finding a wife but in spite of this seeming fact i think it must be allowed that if women are withdrawn from the marriage market men must be withdrawn from it also to the same extent in any broad view of this matter we are bound to look not on any individual case and the possible remedies for such cases but on the position in the world occupied by women in general on the general happiness and welfare of the aggregate feminine world and perhaps also a little on the general happiness and welfare of the aggregate male world when ladies and gentlemen advocate the right of women to employment they are taking very different ground from that on which stand those less extensive philanthropists who exert themselves for the benefit of distressed needlewomen for instance or for the alleviation of the more bitter misery of governesses the two questions are in fact absolutely antagonistic to each other the rights of women advocate is doing his best to create that position for women from the possible misfortunes of which the friend of the needlewomen is struggling to relieve them the one is endeavouring to throw work from off the shoulders of men on to the shoulders of women and the other is striving to lessen the burden which women are already bearing of course it is good to relieve distress in individual cases that song of the shirt which i regard as poetry of the immortal kind has done an amount of good infinitely wider than poor hood ever ventured to hope of all such efforts i would speak not only with respect but with loving admiration but of those efforts who are made to spread work more widely among women to call upon them to make for us our watches to print our books to sit at our desks as clerks and to add up our accounts much as i may respect the individual operators in such a movement i can express no admiration for their judgment i have seen women with ropes round their necks drawing a harrow over ploughed ground no one will i suppose say that they approve of that but it would not have shocked me to see men drawing a harrow i should have thought it slow unprofitable work but my feelings would not have been hurt there must therefore be some limit but if we men teach ourselves to believe that work is good for women where is the limit to be drawn and who shall draw it it is true that there is now no actually defined limit there is much work that is commonly open to both sexes personal domestic attendance is so and the attendance in shops the use of the needle is shared between men and women and few i take it know where the seamstress ends and where the tailor begins in many trades a woman can be and very often is the owner and manager of the business painting is as much open to women as to men as also is literature there can be no defined limit but nevertheless there is at present a quasi limit which the rights of women advocates wish to move and so to move that women shall do more work and not less a woman now could not well be a cab driver in london but are these advocates sure that no woman will be a cab driver when success has attended their efforts and would they like to see a woman driving a cab for my part i confess i do not like to see a woman acting as road-keeper on a french railway i have seen a woman acting as hostler at a public stage in ireland i knew the circumstances how her husband had become ill and incapable and how she had been allowed to earn the wages but nevertheless the sight was to me disagreeable and seemed as far as it went to degrade the sex chivalry has been very active in raising women from the hard and hardening tasks of the world 
and through this action they may have become soft tender and virtuous it seems to me that they of whom i am now speaking are desirous of undoing what chivalry has done the argument used is of course plain enough it is said that women are left destitute in the world destitute unless they can be self-dependent and that to women should be given the same open access to wages that men possess in order that they may be as self-dependent as men why should a young woman for whom no father is able to provide not enjoy those means of provision which are open to a young man so circumstanced but i think the answer is very simple the young man under the happiest circumstances which may befall him is bound to earn his bread the young woman is only so bound when happy circumstances do not befall her should we endeavour to make the recurrence of unhappy circumstances more general or less so what does any tradesman any professional man any mechanic wish for his children is it not this that his sons shall go forth and earn their bread and that his daughters shall remain with him till they are married is not that the mother's wish is it not notorious that such is the wish of us all as to our daughters in advocating the rights of women it is of other men's girls that we think never of our own but nevertheless what shall we do for those women who must earn their bread by their own work whatever we do do not let us wilfully increase their number by opening trades to women by making them printers watchmakers accountants or what not we shall not simply relieve those who must now earn their bread by some such work or else starve it will not be within our power to stop ourselves exactly at a certain point to arrange that those women who under existing circumstances may now be in want shall be thus placed beyond want but that no others shall be affected men i fear will be too willing to relieve themselves of some portion of their present burden should the world's altered ways enable them to do so at present a lawyer's clerk may earn perhaps his two guineas a week and he with his wife live on that in fair comfort but if his wife as well as he has been brought up as a lawyer's clerk he will look to her also for some amount of wages i doubt whether the two guineas would be much increased but i do not doubt at all that the woman's position would be injured it seems to me that in discussing this subject philanthropists fail to take hold of the right end of the argument money returns from work are very good and work itself is good as bringing such returns and occupying both body and mind but the world's work is very hard and workmen are too often overdriven the question seems to me to be this of all this work have the men got on their own backs too heavy a share for them to bear and should they seek relief by throwing more of it upon women it is the rights of man that we are in fact debating these watches are weary to make and this type is troublesome to set we have battles to fight and speeches to make and our hands altogether are too full the women are idle many of them they shall make the watches for us and set the type and when they have done that why should they not make nails as they do sometimes in worcestershire or clean horses or drive the cabs they have had an easy time of it for these years past but we'll change that and then it would come to pass that with ropes round their necks the women would be drawing harrows across the fields i don't think this will come to pass the women generally do know when they are well off and are not particularly anxious to accept the philanthropy preferred to them as mrs dahl says they do not wish to bind themselves as apprentices to independent money-making this cry has been louder in america than with us but even in america it has not been efficacious for much there is in the states no doubt a sort of hankering after increased influence a desire for that prominence of position which men attain by loud voices and brazen foreheads a desire in the female heart to be up and doing something if the female heart only knew what but even in the states it has hardly advanced beyond a few feminine lectures in many branches of work women are less employed than in england they are not so frequent behind counters in the shops and are rarely seen as servants in hotels the fires in such houses are lighted and the rooms swept by men but the american girls may say they do not desire to light fires and sweep rooms they are ambitious of the higher classes of work but those higher branches of work require study apprenticeship a devotion of youth 
and that they will not give it is very well for a young man to bind himself for four years and to think of marrying four years after that apprenticeship be over but such a prospectus will not do for a girl while the sun shines the hay must be made and her sun shines earlier in the day than that of him who is to be her husband let him go through the apprenticeship and the work and she will have sufficient on her hands if she looks well after his household under nature's teaching she is aware of this and will not bind herself to any other apprenticeship let mrs doll preach as she may i remember seeing either at new york or boston a wooden figure of a neat young woman as large as life standing at a desk with a ledger before her and looking as though the beau ideal of human bliss were realized in her employment under the figure there was some notice respecting female accountants nothing could be nicer than the lady's figure more flowing than the broad lines of her drapery or more attractive than her auburn ringlets there she stood at work earning her bread without any impediment to the natural operation of her female charms and adjusting the accounts of some great firm with as much facility as grace i wonder whether he who designed that figure had ever sat or stood at a desk for six hours whether he knew the dull hum of the brain which comes from long attention to another man's figures whether he had ever soiled his own fingers with the everlasting work of office hours or worn his sleeves threadbare as he leaned weary in body and mind upon his desk work is a grand thing the grandest thing we have but work is not picturesque graceful and in itself alluring it sucks the sap out of men's bones and bends their backs and sometimes breaks their hearts but though it be so i for one would not wish to throw any heavier share of it on to a woman's shoulders it was pretty to see those young women with spectacles at the boston library but when i heard that they were there from eight in the morning till nine at night i pitied them their loss of all the softness of home and felt that they would not willingly be there if necessity were less stern say that by advocating the rights of women philanthropists succeed in apportioning more work to their share will they eat more wear better clothes lie softer and have altogether more of the fruits of work than they do now that some would do so there can be no doubt but as little that some would have less if on the whole they would not have more for what good result is the movement made the first question is whether at the present time they have less than their proper share there are unquestionably terrible cases of female want and so there are also of want among men alas we do not all feel that it must be so let the philanthropist be ever so energetic and if a woman be left destitute without the assistance of father brother or husband it would be hard if no means of earning subsistence were open to her but the object now sought is not that of relieving such distress it has a much wider tendency or at any rate a wider desire the idea is that women will ennoble themselves by making themselves independent by working for their own bread instead of eating bread earned by men it is in that that these new philosophers seem to me to err so greatly humanity and chivalry have succeeded after a long struggle in teaching the man to work for the woman and now the woman rebels against such teaching not because she likes the work but because she desires the influence which attends it but in this i wrong the woman even the american woman it is not she who desires it but her philanthropical philosophical friends who desire it for her if work were more equally divided between the sexes some women would of course receive more of the good things of the world but women generally would not do so the tendency then would be to force young women out upon their own exertions fathers would soon learn to think that their daughters should be no more dependent on them than their sons men would expect their wives to work at their own trades brothers would be taught to think it hard that their sisters should lean on them and thus women driven upon their own resources would hardly fare better than they do at present after all it is a question of money and a contest for that power and influence which money gives at present men have the position of the lower house of parliament they have to do the harder work but they hold the purse 
even in england there has grown up a feeling that the old law of the land gives a married man too much power over the joint pecuniary resources of him and his wife and in america this feeling is much stronger and the old law has been modified why should a married woman be able to possess nothing and if such be the law of the land is it worth a woman's while to marry and put herself in such a position those are the questions asked by the friends of the rights of women but the young women do marry and the men pour their earnings into their wives laps if little has as yet been done in extending the rights of women by giving them a greater share of the work of the world still less has been done toward giving them their portion of political influence in the states there are many men of mark and women of mark also who think that women should have votes for public elections mr wendell phillips the boston lecturer who advocates abolition is an apostle in this cause also and while i was at boston i read the provisions of a will lately left by a millionaire in which he bequeathed some very large sums of money to be expended in agitation on this subject a woman is subject to the law why then should she not help to make the law a child is subject to the law and does not help to make it but the child lacks that discretion which the woman enjoys equally with the man that i take it is the amount of the argument in favour of the political rights of women the logic of this is so conclusive that i am prepared to acknowledge that it admits of no answer i will only say that the mutual good relations between men and women which are so indispensable to our happiness require that men and women should not take to voting at the same time and on the same result if it be decided that women shall have political power let them have it all to themselves for a season if that be so resolved i think we may safely leave it to them to name the time at which they will begin i confess that in the states i have sometimes been driven to think that chivalry has been carried too far that there is an attempt to make women think more of the rights of their womanhood than is needful there are ladies doors at hotels and ladies drawing rooms ladies sides on the ferry boats ladies windows at the post office for the delivery of letters which by the by is an atrocious institution as anybody may learn who will look at the advertisements called personal in some of the new york papers why should not young ladies have their letters sent to their houses instead of getting them at a private window the post office clerks can tell stories about those ladies windows but at every turn it is necessary to make separate provision for ladies from all this it comes to pass that the baker's daughter looks down from a great height on her papa and by no means thinks her brother good enough for her associate nature the great restorer comes in and teaches her to fall in love with the butcher's son thus the evil is mitigated but i cannot but wish that the young woman should not see herself denominated a lady so often and should receive fewer lessons as to the extent of her privileges i would save her if i could from working at the oven i would give to her bread and meat earned by her father's care and her brother's sweat but when she has received these good things i would have her proud of the one and by no means ashamed of the other let women say what they will of their rights or men who think themselves generous say what they will for them the question has all been settled both for them and for us men by a higher power they are the nursing mothers of mankind and in that law their fate is written with all its joys and all its privileges it is for men to make those joys as lasting and those privileges as perfect as may be that women should have their rights no man will deny to my thinking neither increase of work nor increase of political influence are among them the best right a woman has is the right to a husband and that is the right to which i would recommend every young woman here and in the states to turn her best attention on the whole i think that my doctrine will be more acceptable than that of mrs doll or mr wendell phillips End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen part one of north america volume one by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain nineteen education part one the one matter in which as far as my judgment goes the people of the united states have excelled us englishmen 
so as to justify them in taking to themselves praise which we cannot take to ourselves or refuse to them is the matter of education in saying this i do not think that i am proclaiming anything disgraceful to england though i am proclaiming much that is creditable to america to the americans of the states was given the good fortune of beginning at the beginning the french at the time of their revolution endeavoured to reorganise everything and to begin the world again with new habits and grand theories but the french as a people were too old for such a change and the theories fell to the ground but in the states after their revolution an anglo-saxon people had an opportunity of making a new state with all the experience of the world before them and to this matter of education they were from the first aware that they must look for their success they did so and unrivalled population wealth and intelligence has been the result and with these looking at the whole masses of the people i think i am justified in saying unrivalled comfort and happiness it is not that you my reader to whom in this matter of education fortune and your parents have probably been bountiful would have been more happy in new york than in london it is not that i who at any rate can read and write have cause to wish that i had been an american but it is this if you and i can count up in a day all those on whom our eyes may rest and learn the circumstances of their lives we shall be driven to conclude that nine-tenths of that number would have had a better life as americans than they can have in their spheres as englishmen the states are at a discount with us now in the beginning of this year of grace eighteen sixty two and englishmen were not very willing to admit the above statement even when the states were not at a discount but i do not think that a man can travel through the states with his eyes open and not admit the fact many things will conspire to induce him to shut his eyes and admit no conclusion favourable to the americans men and women will sometimes be impudent to him the better his coat the greater the impudence he will be pelted with a braggadocio of equality the corns of his old world conservatism will be trampled on hourly by the purposely vicious herd of uncouth democracy the fact that he is paymaster will go for nothing and will fail to ensure civility i shall never forget my agony as i saw and heard my desk fall from a porter's hand on a railway station as he tossed it from him seven yards off on to the hard pavement i heard its poor weak intestines rattled in their death struggle and knowing that it was smashed i forgot my position on american soil and remonstrated it's my desk and you have utterly destroyed it i said <laughs> laughed the porter you've destroyed my property i rejoined and it's no laughing matter and then all the crowd laughed guess you'd better get it glued said one so i gathered up the broken article and retired mournfully and crestfallen into a coach this was very sad and for the moment i deplored the ill luck which had brought me to so savage a country such and such like are the incidents which make an englishman in the states unhappy and rouse his gall against the institutions of the country these things and the continued appliance of the irritating ointment of american braggadocio with which his sores are kept open but though i was badly off on that railway platform worse off than i should have been in england all that crowd of porters round me were better off than our english porters they had a good time of it and this oh my english brother who has travelled through the states and returned disgusted is the fact throughout those men whose familiarity was so disgusting to you are having a good time of it they might be a little more civil you say and yet read and write just as well true but they are arguing in their minds that civility to you will be taken by you for subservience or for an acknowledgment of superiority and looking at your habits of life yours and mine together i am not quite sure that they are altogether wrong have you ever realized to yourself as a fact that the porter who carries your box has not made himself inferior to you by the very act of carrying that box if not that is the very lesson which the man wishes to teach you if a man can forget his own miseries in his journeyings and think of the people he comes to see rather than of himself i think he will find himself driven to admit that education has made life for the million in the northern states better than life for the million is with us 
they have begun at the beginning and have so managed that every one may learn to read and write have so managed that almost every one does learn to read and write with us this cannot now be done population had come upon us in masses too thick for management before we had as yet acknowledged that it would be a good thing that these masses should be educated prejudices too had sprung up and habits and strong sectional feelings all antagonistic to a great national system of education we are i suppose now doing all that we can do but comparatively it is little i think i saw some time since that the cost for gratuitous education or education in part gratuitous which had fallen upon the nation had already amounted to the sum of eight hundred thousand pounds and i think also that i read in the document which revealed to me this fact a very strong opinion that government could not at present go much further but if this matter were regarded in england as it is regarded in massachusetts or rather had it from some prosperous beginning been put upon a similar footing eight hundred thousand pounds would not have been esteemed a great expenditure for free education simply in the city of london in eighteen fifty seven the public schools of boston cost seventy thousand pounds and these schools were devoted to a population of about one hundred eighty thousand souls taking the population of london at two and a half millions the whole sum now devoted to england would if expended in the metropolis make education there even cheaper than it is in boston in boston during eighteen fifty seven there were above twenty four thousand pupils at these public schools giving more than one-eighth of the whole population but i fear it would not be practicable for us to spend eight hundred thousand pounds on the gratuitous education of london rich as we are we should not know where to raise the money in boston it is raised by a separate tax it is a thing understood acknowledged and made easy by being habitual as is our national debt i do not know that boston is peculiarly blessed but i quote the instance as i have a record of its schools before me at the three high schools in boston at which the average of pupils is five hundred twenty six about thirteen pounds per head is paid for free education the average price per annum of a child's schooling throughout these schools in boston is about three pounds for each to the higher schools any boy or girl may attain without any expense and the education is probably as good as can be given and as far advanced the only question is whether it is not advanced further than may be necessary here as at new york i was almost startled by the amount of knowledge around me and listened as i might have done to an examination in theology among young brahmins when a young lad explained in my hearing all the properties of the different levers as exemplified by the bones of the human body i bowed my head before him in unaffected humility we at our english schools never got beyond the use of those bones which he described with such accurate scientific knowledge in one of the girls schools they were reading milton and when we entered were discussing the nature of the pool in which the devil is described as wallowing the question had been raised by one of the girls a pool so called was supposed to contain but a small amount of water and how could the devil being so large get into it then came the origin of the word pool from palace a marsh as we were told some dictionary attesting to the fact and such a marsh might cover a large expanse the palus maotis was then quoted and so we went on till satan's theory of political liberty better to reign in hell than serve in heaven was thoroughly discussed and understood these girls of sixteen and seventeen got up one after another and gave their opinions on the subject how far the devil was right and how far he was manifestly wrong i was attended by one of the directors or guardians of the schools and the teacher i thought was a little embarrassed by her position but the girls themselves were as easy in their demeanour as though they were stitching handkerchiefs at home it is impossible to refrain from telling all this and from making a little innocent fun out of the super excellencies of these schools but the total result on my mind was very greatly in their favour and indeed the testimony came in both ways not only was i called on to form an opinion of what the men and women would become from the education which was given to the boys and girls but also to say what must have been the education of the boys and girls from what i saw of the men and women 
of course it will be understood that i am not here speaking of those i met in society or of their children but of the working people of that class who find that a gratuitous education for their children is needful if any considerable amount of education is to be given the result is to be seen daily in the whole intercourse of life the coachman who drives you the man who mends your window the boy who brings home your purchases the girl who stitches your wife's dress they all carry with them sure signs of education and show it in every word they utter it will of course be understood that this is in the separate states a matter of state law indeed i may go further and say that it is in most of the states a matter of state constitution it is by no means a matter of federal constitution the united states as a nation takes no heed of the education of its people all that is left to the judgment of the separate states in most of the thirteen original states provision is made in the written constitution for the general education of the people but this is not done in all i find that it was more frequently done in the northern or free soil states than in those which admitted slavery as might have been expected in the constitutions of south carolina and virginia i find no allusion to the public provision for education but in those of north carolina and georgia it is enjoined the forty-first section of the constitution for north carolina enjoins that schools shall be established by the legislature for the convenient instruction of youth with such salaries to the masters paid by the public as may enable them to instruct at low prices showing that the intention here was to assist education and not provide it altogether gratuitously i think that provision for public education is enjoined in the constitutions of all the states admitted into the union since the first federal knot was tied except in that of illinois vermont was the first so admitted in seventeen ninety one and vermont declares that a competent number of schools ought to be maintained in each town for the convenient instruction of youth ohio was the second in eighteen hundred two and ohio enjoins that the general assembly shall make such provisions by taxation or otherwise as with the income arising from the school trust fund will secure a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state but no religious or other sect or sex shall ever have any exclusive right or control of any part of the school funds of this state in indiana admitted in eighteen sixteen it is required that the general assembly shall provide by law for a general and uniform system of common schools illinois was admitted next in eighteen eighteen but the constitution of illinois is silent on the subject of education it enjoins however in lieu of this that no person shall fight a duel or send a challenge if he do he is not only to be punished but to be deprived for ever of the power of holding any office of honour or profit in the state i have no reason however for supposing that education is neglected in illinois or that duelling has been abolished in maine it is demanded that the towns the whole country is divided into what are called towns shall make suitable provision at their own expense for the support and maintenance of public schools some of these constitutional enactments are most magniloquently worded but not always with precise grammatical correctness that for the famous bay state of massachusetts runs as follows quote, wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffused generally among the body of the people being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties and as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people it shall be the duty of the legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interest of literature and the sciences and of all seminaries of them especially the university at cambridge public schools and grammar schools in the towns to encourage private societies and public institutions by rewards and immunities for the promotion of agriculture arts sciences commerce trades manufactures and a natural history of the country to countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence public and private charity industry and frugality honesty and punctuality in all their dealings sincerity good humour and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people End quote. 
i must confess that had the words of that little constitutional enactment been made known to me before i had seen its practical results i should not have put much faith in it of all the public schools i have ever seen by public schools i mean schools for the people at large maintained at public cost those of massachusetts are i think the best but of all the educational enactments which i ever read that of the same state is i should say the worst in texas now of which as a state the people of massachusetts do not think much they have done it better Quote, a general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people it shall be the duty of the legislature of this state to make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of public schools End quote. so say the texans but then the texans had the advantage of a later experience than any which fell in the way of the constitution makers of massachusetts there is something of the magniloquence of the french style of the liberty equality and fraternity mode of eloquence in the preambles of most of these constitutions which but for their success would have seemed to have prophesied loudly of failure those of new york and pennsylvania are the least so and that of massachusetts by far the most violently magniloquent they generally commence by thanking god for the present civil and religious liberty of the people and by declaring that all men are born free and equal new york and pennsylvania however refrain from any such very general remarks i am well aware that all these constitutional enactments are not likely to obtain much credit in england it is not only that grand phrases fail to convince us but that they carry to our senses almost an assurance of their own inefficiency when we hear that a people have declared their intention of being henceforward better than their neighbours and going upon a new theory that shall lead them direct to a terrestrial paradise we button up our pockets and lock up our spoons and that is what we have done very much as regards the americans we have walked with them and talked with them and bought with them and sold with them but we have mistrusted them as to their internal habits and modes of life thinking that their philanthropy was pretentious and that their theories were vague many cities in the states are but skeletons of towns the streets being there and the houses numbered but not one house built out of ten that have been so counted up we have regarded their institutions as we regard those cities and have been specially willing so to consider them because of the fine language in which they have been paraded before us they have been regarded as the skeletons of philanthropical systems to which blood and flesh and muscle and even skin are wanting but it is at least but fair to inquire how far the promise made has been carried out the elaborate wordings of the constitutions made by the french politicians in the days of their great revolution have always been to us no more than so many written grimaces but we should not have continued so to regard them had the political liberty which they promised followed upon the promises so magniloquently made as regards education in the states at any rate in the northern and western states i think that the assurances put forth in the various written constitutions have been kept if this be so an american citizen let him be ever so arrogant ever so impudent if you will is at any rate a civilized being and on the road to that cultivation which will sooner or later divest him of his arrogance emolit mores we quote here our old friend the colonel again if a gentleman be compelled to confine his classical allusions to one quotation he cannot do better than hang by that but has education been so general and has it had the desired result in the city of boston as i have said i found that in eighteen fifty seven about one-eighth of the whole population were then on the books of the free public schools as pupils and that about one-ninth of the population formed the average daily attendance to these numbers of course must be added all pupils of the richer classes those for whose education their parents chose to pay as nearly as i can learn the average duration of each pupil's schooling is six years and if this be figured out statistically i think that it will show that education in boston reaches a very large majority i might almost say the whole of the population that the education given in other towns of massachusetts is not so good as that given in boston i do not doubt but i have reason to believe that it is quite as general i have spoken of one of the schools of new york in that city the public schools are apportioned to the wards 
and are so arranged that in each ward of the city there are public schools of different standing for the gratuitous use of the children the population of the city of new york in eighteen fifty seven was about six hundred fifty thousand and in that year it is stated that there were one hundred thirty five thousand pupils in the schools by this it would appear that one person in five throughout the city was then under process of education which statement however i cannot receive with implicit credence it is however also stated that the daily attendances average something less than fifty thousand a day and this latter statement probably implies some mistake in the former one taking the two together for what they are worth they show i think that school teaching is not only brought within the reach of the population generally but is used by almost all classes at new york there are separate free schools for colored children at philadelphia i did not see the schools but i was assured that the arrangements there were equal to those at new york and boston indeed i was told that they were infinitely better but then i was so told by a philadelphian in the state of connecticut the public schools are certainly equal to those in any part of the union as far as i could learn education what we should call advanced education is brought within the reach of all classes in the northern and western states of america and i would wish to add here to those of the canadas also end of chapter nineteen part one chapter nineteen part two of north america volume one by antony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain nineteen education part two so much for the schools and now for the results i do not know that anything impresses a visitor more strongly with the amount of books sold in the states than the practice of selling them as it has been adopted in the railway cars personally the traveller will find the system very disagreeable as is everything connected with these cars a young man enters during the journey for the trade is carried out while the cars are travelling as is also a very brisk trade in lollipops sugar candy apples and ham sandwiches the young tradesman enters the car firstly with a pile of magazines or of novels bound like magazines these are chiefly the atlantic published at boston harper's magazine published at new york and a cheap series of novels published at philadelphia as he walks along he flings one at every passenger an englishman when he is first introduced to this manner of trade becomes much astonished he is probably reading and on a sudden he finds a fat fluffy magazine very unattractive in its exterior dropped on to the page he is perusing i thought at first that it was a present from some crazed philanthropist who was thus endeavouring to disseminate literature but i was soon undeceived the bookseller having gone down the whole car and the next returned and beginning again where he had begun before picked up either his magazine or else the price of it then in some half hour he came again with an armful or basket of books and distributed them in the same way they were generally novels but not always i do not think that any endeavour is made to assimilate the book to the expected customer the object is to bring the book and the man together and in this way a very large sale is effected the same thing is done with illustrated newspapers the sale of political newspapers goes on so quickly in these cars that no such enforced distribution is necessary i should say that the average consumption of newspapers by an american must amount to about three a day at washington i begged the keeper of my lodgings to let me have a paper regularly one american newspaper being much the same to me as another and my host supplied me daily with four but the numbers of the popular books of the day printed and sold afford the most conclusive proof of the extent to which education is carried in the states the readers of tennyson mackay dickens bulwer collins hughes and martin tupper are to be counted by tens of thousands in the states to the thousands by which they may be counted in our own islands i do not doubt that i had fully fifteen copies of the silver cord thrown at my head in different railway cars on the continent of america nor is the taste by any means confined to the literature of england longfellow curtis holmes hawthorne lowell emerson and mrs stowe are almost as popular as their english rivals 
I do not say whether or no the literature is well chosen, but there it is. It is printed, sold, and read. The disposal of ten thousand copies of a work is no large sale in America of a book published at a dollar. But in England it is a very large sale of a book brought out at five shillings. I do not remember that I ever examined the rooms of an American without finding books or magazines in them. I do not speak here of the houses of my friends, as of course the same remark would apply as strongly in England, but of the houses of persons presumed to earn their bread by the labor of their hands. The opportunity for such examination does not come daily, but when it has been in my power I have made it and have always found signs of education. Men and women of the classes to which I allude talk of reading and writing as of arts belonging to them as a matter of course, quite as much as are the arts of eating and drinking. A porter or farmer's servant in the States is not proud of reading and writing. It is to him quite a matter of course. The coachmen on their boxes and the boots as they set in the halls of the hotels have newspapers constantly in their hands. The young women have them also and the children. The fact comes home to one at every turn and at every hour that the people are an educated people. The whole of this question between North and South is as well understood by the servants as by their masters, is discussed as vehemently by the private soldiers as by the officers. The politics of the country and the nature of its constitution are familiar to every laborer. The very warding of the Declaration of Independence is in the memory of every lad of sixteen. Boys and girls of a younger age than that know why Slidell and Mason were arrested, and will tell you why they should have been given up, or why they should have been held in durance. The question of the war with England is debated by every native pavior and hodman of New York. I know what Englishmen will say in answer to this. They will declare that they do not want their paviors and hodmen to talk politics that they are as well pleased that their coachmen and cooks should not always have a newspaper in their hands, that private soldiers will fight as well and obey better if they are not trained to discuss the causes which have brought them into the field. An English gentleman will think that his gardener will be a better gardener without than with any excessive political ardor, and the English lady will prefer that her housemaid shall not have a very pronounced opinion of her own as to the capabilities of the cabinet ministers but I would submit to all Englishmen and English women who may look at these pages, whether such an opinion or feeling on their part bears much or even at all upon the subject. I am not saying that the man who is driven in the coach is better off because his coachman reads the paper, but that the coachman himself who reads the paper is better off than the coachman who does not and cannot. I think that we are too apt in considering the ways and habits of any people to judge of them by the effect of those ways and habits on us rather than by their effects on the owners of them. When we go among garlic eaters we condemn them because they are offensive to us, but to judge of them properly we should ascertain whether or no the garlic be offensive to them. If we could imagine a nation of vegetarians hearing for the first time of our habits as flesh-eaters, we should feel sure that they would be struck with horror at our blood-stained banquets. But when they came to argue with us, we should bid them inquire whether we flesh-eaters did not live longer and do more than the vegetarians. When we express a dislike to the shoe-boy reading his newspaper, I apprehend we do so because we fear that the shoe-boy is coming near our own heels. I know there is among us a strong feeling that the lower classes are better without politics, as there is also that they are better without crinoline and artificial flowers. But if politics and crinoline and artificial flowers are good at all, they are good for all who can honestly come by them and honestly use them. The political coachman is perhaps less valuable to his master as a coachman than he would be without his politics, but he with his politics is more valuable to himself. For myself, I do not like the Americans of the lower orders. I am not comfortable among them. They tread on my corns and offend me. They make my daily life unpleasant. But I do respect them. I acknowledge their intelligence and personal dignity. I know that they are men and women worthy to be so called. I see that they are living as human beings in possession of reasoning faculties, and I perceive that they owe this to the progress that education has made among them. After all, what is wanted in this world? Is it not that men should eat and drink and read and write and say their prayers? Does not that include everything, providing that they eat and drink enough, 
read and write without restraint, and say their prayers without hypocrisy. When we talk of the advances of civilization, do we mean anything but this, that men who now eat and drink badly shall eat and drink well, and that those who cannot read and write now shall learn to do so, the prayers following as prayers will follow upon such learning? Civilization does not consist in the eschewing of garlic or the keeping clean of a man's fingernails. It may lead to such delicacies and probably will do so. But the man who thinks that civilization cannot exist without them imagines that the church cannot stand without the spire. In the States of America, men do eat and drink and do read and write. But as to saying their prayers, that, as far as I can see, has come also, though perhaps not in a manner altogether satisfactory or to a degree which should be held to be sufficient. Englishmen of strong religious feeling will often be startled in America by the freedom with which religious subjects are discussed and the case with which the matter is treated, but he will very rarely be shocked by that utter absence of all knowledge on the subject, that total darkness which is still so common among the lower orders in our own country. It is not a common thing to meet an American who belongs to no denomination of Christian worship and who cannot tell you why he belongs to that which he has chosen. But, it will be said, all the intelligence and education of this people have not saved them from falling out among themselves and their friends and running into troubles by which they will be ruined. Their political arrangements have been so bad that, in spite of all their reading and writing, they must go to the wall. I venture to express an opinion that they will by no means go to the wall and that they will be saved from such a destiny if in no other way than by their education of their political arrangements as i mean before long to rush into that perilous subject i will say nothing here but no political convulsions should such arise no revolution in the constitution should such be necessary will have any wide effect on the social position of the people to their serious detriment they have the great qualities of the anglo-saxon race industry intelligence and self-confidence and if these qualities will no longer suffice to keep such a people on their legs the world must be coming to an end i have said that it is not a common thing to meet an american who belongs to no denomination of christian worship this i think is so but i would not wish to be taken as saying that religion on that account stands on a satisfactory footing in the states of all subjects of discussion this is the most difficult it is one as to which most of us feel that to some extent we must trust to our prejudices rather than our judgments it is a matter on which we do not dare to rely implicitly on our own reasoning faculties and therefore throw ourselves on the opinions of those whom we believe to have been better men and deeper thinkers than ourselves for myself i love the name of state and church and believe that much of our english well-being has depended on it i have made up my mind to think that union good and i am not to be turned away from that conviction nevertheless i am not prepared to argue the matter one does not always carry one's proof at one's finger ends but i feel very strongly that much of which is evil in the structure of american politics is owing to the absence of any national religion and that something also of social evil has sprung from the same cause it is not that men do not say their prayers for aught i know they may do so as frequently and as fervently or more frequently and more fervently than we do but there is a rowdiness if i may be allowed to use such a word in their manner of doing so which robs religion of that reverence which is if not its essence at any rate its chief protection it is a part of their system that religion shall be perfectly free and that no man shall be in any way constrained in that matter consequently the question of a man's religion is regarded in a free and easy way it is well for instance that a young lad should go somewhere on a sunday but a sermon is a sermon and it does not much concern the lad's father whether his son hear the discourse of a freethinker in the music hall or the eloquent but lengthy outpouring of a preacher in a methodist chapel everybody is bound to have a religion but it does not much matter what it is the difficulty in which the first fathers of the revolution found themselves on this question is shown by the constitutions of the different states there can be no doubt that the inhabitants of the new england states were as things went a strictly religious community 
they had no idea of throwing over the worship of god as the french had attempted to do at their revolution they intended that the new nation should be preeminently composed of a god-fearing people but they intended also that they should be a people free in everything free to choose their own forms of worship they intended that the nation should be a protestant people but they intended also that no man's conscience should be coerced in the matter of his own religion it was hard to reconcile these two things and to explain to the citizens that it behooved them to worship god even under penalties for omission but that it was at the same time open to them to select any form of worship that they pleased however that form might differ from the practices of the majority in connecticut it is declared that it is the duty of all men to worship the supreme being the creator and preserver of the universe but that it is their right to render that worship in the mode most consistent with the dictates of their consciences and then a few lines further down the article skips the great difficulty in a manner somewhat disingenuous and declares that each and every society of christians in the state shall have and enjoy the same and equal privileges but it does not say whether a jew shall be divested of those privileges or if he be divested how that treatment of him is to be reconciled with the assurance that it is every man's right to worship the supreme being in the mode most consistent with the dictates of his own conscience in rhode island they were more honest it is there declared that every man shall be free to worship god according to the dictates of his own conscience and to profess and by argument to maintain his opinion in matters of religion and that the same shall in no wise diminish enlarge or affect his civil capacity here it is simply presumed that every man will worship a god and no allusion is made even to christianity in massachusetts they are again hardly honest it is the right says the constitution as well as the duty of all men in society publicly and at stated seasons to worship the supreme being the great creator and preserver of the universe and then it goes on to say that every man may do so in what form he pleases but further down it declares that every denomination of christians demeaning themselves peaceably and as good subjects of the commonwealth shall be equally under the protection of the law but what about those who are not christians in new hampshire it is exactly the same it is enacted that every individual has a natural and unalienable right to worship god according to the dictates of his own conscience and reason and that every denomination of christians demeaning themselves quietly and as good citizens of the state shall be equally under the protection of the law from all of which it is i think manifest that the men who framed these documents desirous above all things of cutting themselves and their people loose from every kind of trammel still felt the necessity of enforcing religion of making it to a certain extent a matter of state duty in the first constitution of north carolina it is enjoined that no person who shall deny the being of god or the truth of the protestant religion shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit but this was altered in the year eighteen thirty six and the words christian religion were substituted for protestant religion in new england the congregationalists are i think the dominant sect in massachusetts and i believe in the other new england states a man is presumed to be a congregationalist if he do not declare himself to be anything else as with us the church of england counts all who do not specially have themselves counted elsewhere the congregationalist as far as i can learn is very near to a presbyterian in new england i think the unitarians would rank next in number but a unitarian in america is not the same as a unitarian with us here if i understand the nature of his creed a unitarian does not recognize the divinity of our saviour in america he does do so but throws over the doctrine of the trinity the protestant episcopalians muster strong in all the great cities and i fancy that they would be regarded as taking the lead of the other religious denominations in new york their tendency is to high church doctrines i wish they had not found it necessary to alter the forms of our prayer-book in so many little matters as to which there was no national expediency for such changes but it was probably thought necessary that a new people should show their independence in all things the roman catholics have a very strong party as a matter of course seeing how great has been the immigration from ireland 
but here as in ireland and as indeed is the case all the world over the roman catholics are the hewers of wood and drawers of water the germans who have latterly flocked into the states in such swarms that they have almost germanized certain states have of course their own churches in every town there are places of worship for baptists presbyterians methodists anabaptists and every denomination of christianity and the meeting-houses prepared for these sects are not as with us hideous buildings contrived to inspire disgust by the enormity of their ugliness nor are they called salem ebenezer and sion nor do the ministers within them look in any way like the deputy shepherd the churches belonging to those sects are often handsome this is especially the case in new york and the pastors are not unfrequently among the best educated and most agreeable men whom the traveller will meet they are for the most part well paid and are enabled by their outward position to hold that place in the world's ranks which should always belong to a clergyman i have not been able to obtain information from which i can state with anything like correctness what may be the average income of ministers of the gospel in the northern states but that it is much higher than the average income of our parish clergymen admits i think of no doubt the stipends of clergymen in the american towns are higher than those paid in the country the opposite to this i think as a rule is the case with us i have said that religion in the states is rowdy by that i mean to imply that it seems to me to be divested of that reverential order and strictness of rule which according to our idea should be attached to matters of religion one hardly knows where the affairs of this world end or where those of the next begin when the holy men were had in at the lecture were they doing stage work or church work on hearing sermons one is often driven to ask oneself whether the discourse from the pulpit be in its nature political or religious i heard an episcopalian protestant clergyman talk of the scoffing nations of europe because at that moment he was angry with england and france about slidell and mason i have heard a chapter of the bible read in congress at the desire of a member and very badly read after which the chapter itself and the reading of it became a subject of debate partly jocose and partly acrimonious it is a common thing for a clergyman to change his profession and follow any other pursuit i know two or three gentlemen who were once in that line of life but have since gone into other trades there is i think an unexpressed determination on the part of the people to abandon all reverence and to regard religion from an altogether worldly point of view they are willing to have religion as they are willing to have laws but they choose to make it for themselves they do not object to pay for it but they like to have the handling of the article for which they pay as the descendants of puritans and other godly protestants they will submit to religious teaching but as republicans they will have no priestcraft the french at their revolution had the latter feeling without the former and were therefore consistent with themselves in abolishing all worship the americans desire to do the same thing politically but infidelity has had no charms for them they say their prayers and then they seem to apologize for doing so as though it were hardly the act of a free and enlightened citizen justified in ruling himself as he pleases all this to me is rowdy i know no other word by which i can so well describe it nevertheless the nation is religious in its tendencies and prone to acknowledge the goodness of god in all things a man there is expected to belong to some church and is not i think well looked on if he profess that he belongs to none he may be a swedenborgian a quaker a muggletonian anything will do but it is expected of him that he shall place himself under some flag and do his share in supporting the flag to which he belongs this duty is i think generally fulfilled End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty part one of north america volume one by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty from boston to washington part one from boston on the twenty seventh of november my wife returned to england leaving me to prosecute my journey southward to washington by myself 
i shall never forget the political feeling which prevailed in boston at that time or the discussions of the subject of slidell and mason in which i felt myself bound to take a part up to that period i confess that my sympathies had been strongly with the northern side in the general question and so they were still as far as i could divest the matter of its english bearings i have always thought and do think that a war for the suppression of the southern rebellion could not have been avoided by the north without an absolute loss of its political prestige mr lincoln was elected president of the united states in the autumn of eighteen sixty and any steps taken by him or his party toward a peaceable solution of the difficulties which broke out immediately on his election must have been taken before he entered upon his office south carolina threatened secession as soon as mr lincoln's election was known while yet there were four months left of mr buchanan's government that mr buchanan might during those four months have prevented secession few men i think will doubt when the history of the time shall be written but instead of doing so he consummated secession mr buchanan is a northern man a pennsylvanian but he was opposed to the party which had brought in mr lincoln having thriven as a politician by his adherence to southern principles now when the struggle came he could not forget his party in his duty as president general jackson's position was much the same when mr calhoun on the question of the tariff endeavored to produce secession in south carolina thirty years ago in eighteen thirty two excepting in this that jackson was himself a southern man but jackson had a strong conception of the position which he held as president of the united states he put his foot on secession and crushed it forcing mr calhoun as senator from south carolina to vote for that compromise as to the tariff which the government of the day proposed south carolina was as eager in eighteen thirty two for secession as she was in eighteen fifty nine to sixty but the government was in the hands of a strong man and an honest one mr calhoun would have been hung had he carried out his threats but mr buchanan had neither the power nor the honesty of general jackson and thus secession was in fact consummated during his presidency but mr lincoln's party it is said and i believe truly said might have prevented secession by making overtures to the south or accepting overtures from the south before mr lincoln himself had been inaugurated that is to say if mr lincoln and the band of politicians who with him had pushed their way to the top of their party and were about to fill the offices of state chose to throw overboard the political convictions which had bound them together and ensured their success if they could bring themselves to adopt on the subject of slavery the ideas of their opponents then the war might have been avoided and secession also avoided i do believe that had mr lincoln at that time submitted himself to a compromise in favor of the democrats promising the support of the government to certain acts which would in fact have been in favor of slavery south carolina would again have been foiled for the time for it must be understood that though south carolina and the gulf states might have accepted certain compromises they would not have been satisfied in so accepting them the desired secession and nothing short of secession would in truth have been acceptable to them but in doing so mr lincoln would have been the most dishonest politician even in america the north would have been in arms against him and any true spirit of agreement between the cotton-growing slave states and the manufacturing states of the north or the agricultural states of the west would have been as far off and as improbable as it is now mr crittenden who preferred his compromise to the senate in december eighteen sixty was at that time one of the two senators from kentucky a slave state he now sits in the lower house of congress as a member from the same state kentucky is one of those border states which has found it impossible to secede and almost equally impossible to remain in the union it is one of the states into which it was most probable that the war would be carried virginia kentucky and missouri being the three states which have suffered the most in this way of mr crittenden's own family some have gone with secession and some with the union his name had been honorably connected with american politics for nearly forty years and it is not surprising that he should have desired a compromise his terms were in fact these a return to the missouri compromise under which the union pledged itself that no slavery should exist north of thirty six degrees thirty north latitude unless where it had so existed prior to the date of that compromise 
a pledge that congress would not interfere with slavery in the individual states which under the constitution it cannot do and a pledge that the fugitive slave law should be carried out by the northern states such a compromise might seem to make very small demand on the forbearance of the republican party which was now dominant the repeal of the missouri compromise had been to them a loss and it might be said that its reenactment would be a gain but since that compromise had been repealed vast territory south of the line in question had been added to the union and the reenactment of that compromise would hand those vast regions over to absolute slavery as had been done with texas this might be all very well for mr crittenden in the slave state of kentucky for mr crittenden although a slave owner desired to perpetuate the union but it would not have been well for new england or for the west as for the second proposition it is well understood that under the constitution congress cannot interfere in any way in the question of slavery in the individual states congress has no more constitutional power to abolish slavery in maryland than she has to introduce it into massachusetts no such pledge therefore was necessary on either side but such a pledge given by the north and west would have acted as an additional tie upon them binding them to the finality of a constitutional enactment to which as was of course well known they strongly object there was no question of congress interfering with slavery with the purport of extending its area by special enactment and therefore by such a pledge the north and west could gain nothing but the south would in prestige have gained much but that third proposition as to the fugitive slave law and the faithful execution of that law by the northern and western states would if acceded to by mr lincoln's party have amounted to an unconditional surrender of everything what massachusetts and connecticut carry out the fugitive slave law ohio carry out the fugitive slave law after the dred scott decision and all its consequences mr crittenden might as well have asked connecticut massachusetts and ohio to introduce slavery within their own lands the fugitive slave law was then as it is now the law of the land it was the law of the united states as voted by congress and passed by the president and acted on by the supreme judge of the united states court but it was a law to which no free state had submitted itself or would submit itself what the english reader will say sundry states in the union refuse to obey the laws of the union refuse to submit to the constitutional action of their own congress yes such has been the position of this country to such a deadlock has it been brought by the attempted but impossible amalgamation of north and south mr crittenden's compromise was moonshine it was utterly out of the question that the free states should bind themselves to the rendition of escaped slaves or that mr lincoln who had just been brought in by their voices should agree to any compromise which should attempt so to bind them lord palmerston might as well attempt to re-enact the corn laws then comes the question whether mr lincoln or his government could have prevented the war after he had entered upon his office in march eighteen sixty one i do not suppose that any one thinks that he could have avoided secession and avoided the war also that by any ordinary effort of government he could have secured the adhesion of the gulf states to the union after the first shot had been fired at fort sumter the general opinion in england is i take it this that secession then was manifestly necessary and that all the bloodshed and money shed and all this destruction of commerce and of agriculture might have been prevented by a graceful adhesion to an indisputable fact but there are some facts even some indisputable facts to which a graceful adherence is not possible could king bomba have welcomed garibaldi to naples can the pope shake hands with victor emmanuel could the english have surrendered to their rebel colonists peaceable possession of the colonies the indisputability of a fact is not very easily settled while the circumstances are in course of action by which the fact is to be decided the men of the northern states have not believed in the necessity of secession but have believed it to be their duty to enforce the adherence of these states to the union the american governments have been much given to compromises but had mr lincoln attempted any compromise by which any one southern state could have been let out of the union he would have been impeached in all probability the whole constitution would have gone to ruin and the presidency would have been at an end 
at any rate his presidency would have been at an end when secession or in other words a rebellion was once commenced he had no alternative but the use of coercive measures for putting it down that is he had no alternative but war it is not to be supposed that he or his ministry contemplated such a war as has existed with six hundred thousand men in arms on one side each man with his whole belongings maintained at a cost of one hundred fifty pounds per annum or ninety millions sterling per annum for the army nor did we when we resolved to put down the french revolution think of such a national debt as we now owe these things grow by degrees and the mind also grows in becoming used to them but i cannot see that there was any moment at which mr lincoln could have stayed his hand and cried peace it is easy to say now that acquiescence in secession would have been better than war but there has been no moment when he could have said so with any avail it was incumbent on him to put down rebellion or to be put down by it so it was with us in america in seventeen seventy six i do not think that we in england have quite sufficiently taken all this into consideration we have been in the habit of exclaiming very loudly against the war execrating its cruelty and anathematizing its results as though the cruelty were all superfluous and the results unnecessary but i do not remember to have seen any statement as to what the northern states should have done what they should have done that is as regards the south or when they should have done it it seems to me that we have decided as regards them that civil war is a very bad thing and that therefore civil war should be avoided but bad things cannot always be avoided it is this feeling on our part that has produced so much irritation in them against us reproducing of course irritation on our part against them they cannot understand that we should not wish them to be successful in putting down a rebellion nor can we understand why they should be outrageous against us for standing aloof and keeping our hands if it be only possible out of the fire when slidell and mason were arrested my opinions were not changed but my feelings were altered i seemed to acknowledge to myself that the treatment to which england had been subjected and the manner in which that treatment was discussed made it necessary that i should regard the question as it existed between england and the states rather than in its reference to the north and south i had always felt that as regarded the action of our government we had been sans reproche that in arranging our conduct we had thought neither of money nor political influence but simply of the justice of the case promising to abstain from all interference and keeping that promise faithfully it had been quite clear to me that the men of the north and the women also had failed to appreciate this looking as men in a quarrel always do look for special favour on their side everything that england did was wrong if a private merchant at his own risk took a cargo of rifles to some southern port that act to northern eyes was an act of english interference a favour shown to the south by england as a nation but twenty shiploads of rifles sent from england to the north merely signified a brisk trade and a desire for profit the james adger a northern man of war was refitted at southampton as a matter of course there was no blame to england for that but the nashville belonging to the confederates should not have been allowed into english waters it was useless to speak of neutrality no northerner would understand that a rebel could have any mutual right the south had no claim in his eyes as a belligerent though the north claimed all those rights which he could only enjoy by the fact of there being a recognized war between him and his enemy the south the north was learning to hate england and day by day the feeling grew upon me that much as i wished to espouse the cause of the north i should have to espouse the cause of my own country then slidell and mason were arrested and i began to calculate how long i might remain in the country there is no danger we are quite right the lawyers said there are vatel and puffendorf and stowell and Fillimore and wheaton said the ladies ambassadors are contraband all the world over more so than gunpowder and if taken in a neutral bottom etc i wonder why ships are always called bottoms when spoken of with legal technicality but neither the lawyers nor the ladies convinced me i know that there are matters which will be read not in accordance with any written law but in accordance with the bias of the reader's mind such laws are made to be strained any way 
i knew how it would be all the legal acumen of new england declared the seizure of slidell and mason to be right the legal acumen of old england has declared it to be wrong and i have no doubt that the ladies of old england can prove it to be wrong out of vatel puffendorf stowell Fillimore, and wheaton but there's grotius i said to an elderly female at new york who had quoted to me some half-dozen writers on international law thinking thereby that i should trump her last card i've looked into grotius too said she and as far as i can see etc 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 so i had to fall back again on the convictions to which instinct and common sense had brought me i never doubted for a moment that those convictions would be supported by english lawyers i left boston with a sad feeling at my heart that a quarrel was imminent between england and the states and that any such quarrel must be destructive to the cause of the north i had never believed that the states of new england and the gulf states would again become parts of one nation but i had thought that the terms of separation would be dictated by the north and not by the south i had felt assured that south carolina and the gulf states across from the atlantic to texas would succeed in forming themselves into a separate confederation but i had still hoped that maryland virginia kentucky and missouri might be saved to the grander empire of the north and that thus a great blow to slavery might be the consequence of the civil war but such ascendancy could only fall to the north by reason of their command of the sea the northern ports were all open and the southern ports were all closed but if this should be reversed if by england's action the southern ports should be opened and the northern ports closed the north could have no fair expectation of success the ascendancy in that case would all be with the south up to that moment the christmas of eighteen sixty one maryland was kept in subjection by the guns which general dix had planted over the city of baltimore two-thirds of virginia were in active rebellion coerced originally into that position by her dependence for the sale of her slaves on the cotton states kentucky was doubtful and divided when the federal troops prevailed kentucky was loyal when the confederate troops prevailed kentucky was rebellious the condition in missouri was much the same these four states by two of which the capital with its district of columbia is surrounded might be gained or might be lost and these four states are susceptible of white labor as much so as ohio and illinois are rich in fertility and rich also in all associations which must be dear to americans without virginia maryland and kentucky without the potomac the chesapeake and mount vernon the north would indeed be shorn of its glory but it seemed to be in the power of the north to say under what terms secession should take place and where should be the line a senator from south carolina could never again sit in the same chamber with one from massachusetts but there need be no such bar against the border states so much might at any rate be gained and might stand hereafter as the product of all that money spent on six hundred thousand soldiers but if the northerners should now elect to throw themselves into a quarrel with england if in the gratification of a shameless braggadocio they should insist on doing what they liked not only with their own but with the property of all others also it certainly did seem as though utter ruin must await their cause with england or one might say with europe against them secession must be accomplished not on northern terms but on terms dictated by the south the choice was then for them to make and just at that time it seemed as though they were resolved to throw away every good card out of their hand such had been the ministerial wisdom of mr seward i remember hearing the matter discussed in easy terms by one of the united states senators remember mr trollope he said to me we don't want a war with england if the choice is given to us we had rather not fight england fighting is a bad thing but remember this also mr trollope that if the matter is pressed on us we have no great objection we had rather not but we don't care much one way or the other what one individual may say to another is not of much moment but this senator was expressing the feelings of his constituents who were the legislature of the state from whence he came he was expressing the general idea on the subject of a large body of americans it was not that he and his state had really no objection to the war 
such a war loomed terribly large before the minds of them all they know it to be fraught with the saddest consequences it was so regarded in the mind of that senator but the braggadocio could not be omitted had he omitted it he would have been untrue to his constituency when i left boston for washington nothing was as yet known of what the english government or the english lawyers might say this was in the first week in december and the expected voice from england could not be heard till the end of the second week it was a period of great suspense and of great sorrow also to the more sober-minded americans to me the idea of such a war was terrible it seemed that in these days all the hopes of our youth were being shattered that poetic turning of the sword into a sickle which gladdened our hearts ten or twelve years since had been clean banished from men's minds to belong to a peace party was to be either a fanatic an idiot or a driveller the arts of war had become everything armstrong guns themselves indestructible but capable of destroying everything within sight and most things out of sight were the only recognized results of man's inventive faculties to build bigger stronger and more ships than the french was england's glory to hit a speck with a rifle bullet at eight hundred yards distance was an englishman's first duty the proper use for a young man's leisure hours was the practice of drilling all this had come upon us with very quick steps since the beginning of the russian war but if fighting must needs be done one did not feel special grief at fighting a russian that the indian mutiny should be put down was a matter of course that those chinese rascals should be forced into the harness of civilization was a good thing that england should be as strong as france or perhaps if possible a little stronger recommended itself to an englishman's mind as a state necessity but a war with the states of america in thinking of it i began to believe that the world was going backward over sixty million sterling of stock railway stock and such like are held in america by englishmen and the chances would be that before such a war could be finished the whole of that would be confiscated family connections between the states and the british isles are almost as close as between one of those islands and another the commercial intercourse between the two countries has given bread to millions of englishmen and a break in it would rob millions of their bread these people speak our language use our prayers read our books are ruled by our laws dress themselves in our image are warm with our blood they have all our virtues and their vices are our own too loudly as we call out against them they are our sons and our daughters the source of our greatest pride and as we grow old they should be the staff of our age such a war as we should now wage with the states would be an unloosing of hell upon all that is best upon the world's surface if in such a war we beat the americans they with their proud stomachs would never forgive us if they should be victors we should never forgive ourselves i certainly could not bring myself to speak of it with the equanimity of my friend the senator i went through new york to philadelphia and made a short visit to the latter town philadelphia seems to me to have thrown off its quaker garb and to present itself to the world in the garments ordinarily assumed by large cities by which i intend to express my opinion that the philadelphians are not in these latter days any better than their neighbours i am not sure whether in some respects they may not perhaps be worse quakers quakers absolutely in the very flesh of close bonnets and brown knee-breeches are still to be seen there but they are not numerous and would not strike the eye if one did not specially look for a quaker at philadelphia it is a large town with a very large hotel there are no doubt half a dozen large hotels but one of them is specially great with long straight streets good shops and markets and decent comfortable-looking houses the houses of philadelphia generally are not so large as those of other great cities in the states they are more modest than those of new york and less commodious than those of boston their most striking appendage is the marble steps at the front doors two doors as a rule enjoy one set of steps on the outer edges of which there is generally no parapet or raised curbstone this to my eye gave the houses an unfinished appearance as though the marble ran short and no further expenditure could be made the frost came when i was there and then all these steps were covered up in wooden cases 
the city of philadelphia lies between the two rivers the delaware and the schuylkill eight chief streets run from river to river and twenty-four principal cross streets bisect the eight at right angles the cross streets are all called by their numbers in the long streets the numbers of the houses are not consecutive but follow the numbers of the cross streets so that a person living on chestnut street between tenth and eleventh street and ten doors from tenth street would live at number ten ten the opposite house would be number ten eleven it thus follows that the number of the house indicates the exact block of the houses in which it is situated i do not like the right-angled building of these towns nor do i like the sound of twentieth street and thirtieth street but i must acknowledge that the arrangement in philadelphia has its convenience in new york i found it by no means an easy thing to arrive at the desired locality they boast in philadelphia that they have half a million inhabitants if this be taken as a true calculation philadelphia is in size the fourth city in the world putting out of the question the cities of china as to which we have heard so much and believe so little but in making this calculation the citizens include the population of a district on some sides ten miles distant from philadelphia it takes in other towns connected with it by railway but separated by large spaces of open country american cities are very proud of their population but if they all counted in this way there would soon be no rural population left at all there is a very fine bank at philadelphia and philadelphia is a town somewhat celebrated in its banking history my remarks here however apply simply to the external building and not to its internal honesty and wisdom or to its commercial credit in philadelphia also stands the old house of congress the house in which the congress of the united states was held previous to eighteen hundred when the government and congress with it were moved into the new city of washington i believe however that the first congress properly so called was assembled at new york in seventeen eighty nine the date of the inauguration of the first president it was however here in this building at philadelphia that the independence of the union was declared in seventeen seventy six and that the constitution of the united states was framed pennsylvania with philadelphia for its capital was once the leading state of the union leading by a long distance at the end of the last century it beat all the other states in population but has since been surpassed by new york in all respects in population commerce wealth and general activity of course it is known that pennsylvania was granted to william penn the quaker by charles the second i cannot completely understand what was the meaning of such grants how far they implied absolute possession in the territory or how far they confirmed simply the power of settling and governing a colony in this case a very considerable property was confirmed as the claim made by penn's children after penn's death was bought up by the commonwealth of pennsylvania for one hundred thirty thousand pounds which in those days was a large price for almost any landed estate on the other side of the atlantic End of chapter twenty part one Chapter Twenty, Part Two of North America, Volume One by Antony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty, from Boston to Washington, Part Two. Pennsylvania lies directly on the borders of slave land, being immediately north of Maryland. Mason and Dixon's line, of which we hear so often, and which was first established as the division between slave soil and free soil, runs between Pennsylvania and Maryland the little state of delaware which lies between maryland and the atlantic is also tainted with slavery but the stain is not heavy nor indelible in a population of a hundred and twelve thousand there are not two thousand slaves and of these the owners generally would willingly rid themselves if they could it is however a point of honour with these owners as it is also in maryland not to sell their slaves and a man who cannot sell his slaves must keep them were he to enfranchise them and send them about their business they would come back upon his hands were he to enfranchise them and pay them wages for work they would get the wages but he would not get the work they would get the wages but at the end of three months they would still fall back upon his hands in debt and distress looking to him for aid and comfort as a child looks for it 
it is not easy to get rid of a slave in a slave state that question of enfranchising slaves is not one to be very readily solved in pennsylvania the right of voting is confined to free white men in new york the colored free men have the right to vote providing they have a certain small property qualification and have been citizens for three years in the state whereas a white man need have been a citizen but for ten days and need have no property qualification from which it is seen that the position of the negro becomes worse or less like that of a white man as the border of slave land is more nearly reached but in the teeth of this embargo on colored men the constitution of pennsylvania asserts broadly that all men are born equally free and independent one cannot conceive how two clauses can have found their way into the same document so absolutely contradictory to each other the first clause says that white men shall vote and that black men shall not which means that all political action shall be confined to white men the second clause says that all men are born equally free and independent in philadelphia i for the first time came across live secessionists secessionists who pronounce themselves to be such i will not say that i had met in other cities men who falsely declared themselves true to the union but i had fancied in regard to some that their words were a little stronger than their feelings when a man's bread and much more when the bread of his wife and children depends on his professing a certain line of political conviction it is very hard for him to deny his assent to the truth of the argument one feels that a man under such circumstances is bound to be convinced unless he be in a position which may make a stanch adherence to opposite politics a matter of grave public importance in the north i had fancied that i could sometimes read a secessionist tendency under a cloud of unionist protestations but in philadelphia men did not seem to think it necessary to have recourse to such a cloud i generally found in mixed society that even there the discussion of secession was not permitted but in society that was not mixed i heard very strong opinions expressed on each side with the unionists nothing was so strong as the necessity of keeping of slidell and mason when i suggested that the english government would probably require their surrender i was talked down and ridiculed never that come what may then within half an hour i would be told by a secessionist that england must demand reparation if she meant to retain any place among the great nations of the world but he also would declare that the men would not be surrendered she must make the demand the secessionists would say and then there will be war and after that we shall see whose ports will be blockaded the southerner has ever looked to england for some breach of the blockade quite as strongly as the north has looked to england for sympathy and aid in keeping it the railway from philadelphia to baltimore passes along the top of chesapeake bay and across the susquehanna river at least the railway cars do so on one side of that river they are run on to a huge ferry-boat and are again run off at the other side such an operation would seem to be one of difficulty to us under any circumstances but as the susquehanna is a tidal river rising and falling a considerable number of feet the natural impediment in the way of such an enterprise would i think have staggered us we should have built a bridge costing two or three millions sterling on which no conceivable amount of traffic would pay a fair dividend here in crossing the susquehanna the boat is so constructed that its deck shall be level with the line of the railway at half tide so that the inclined plane from the shore down to the boat or from the shore up to the boat shall never exceed half the amount of the rise or fall one would suppose that the most intricate machinery would have been necessary for such an arrangement but it was all rough and simple and apparently managed by two negroes we would employ a small corps of engineers to conduct such an operation and men and women would be detained in their carriages under all manner of threats as to the peril of life and limb but here everybody was expected to look out for himself the cars were dragged up the inclined plane by a hawser attached to an engine which hawser had the stress broken it as i could not but fancy probable would have flown back and cut to pieces a lot of us who were standing in front of the car but i do not think that any such accident would have caused very much attention life and limbs are not held to be so precious here as they are in england it may be a question whether with us they are not almost too precious 
regarding railways in america generally as to the relative safety of which when compared with our own we have not in england a high opinion i must say that i never saw any accident or in any way became conversant with one it is said that large numbers of men and women are slaughtered from time to time on different lines but if it be so the newspapers make very light of such cases i myself have seen no such slaughter nor have i found myself in the vicinity of a broken bone beyond the susquehanna we passed over a creek of chesapeake bay on a long bridge the whole scenery here is very pretty and the view up the susquehanna is fine this is the bay which divides the state of maryland into two parts and which is blessed beyond all other bays by the possession of canvas-backed ducks nature has done a great deal for the state of maryland but in nothing more than in sending thither these web-footed birds of paradise nature has done a great deal for maryland and fortune also has done much for it in these latter days in directing the war from its territory but for the peculiar position of washington as the capital all that is now being done in virginia would have been done in maryland and i must say that the marylanders did their best to bring about such a result had the presence of the war been regarded by the men of baltimore as an unalloyed benefit they could not have made a greater struggle to bring it close to them nevertheless fate has so far spared them as the position of maryland and the course of events as they took place in baltimore on the commencement of secession had considerable influence both in the north and in the south i will endeavor to explain how that state was affected and how the question was affected by that state maryland as i have said before is a slave state lying immediately south of mason and dixon's line small portions both of virginia and of delaware do run north of maryland but practically maryland is the frontier state of the slave states it was therefore of much importance to know which way maryland would go in the event of secession among the slave states becoming general and of much also to ascertain whether it would secede if desirous of doing so i am inclined to think that as a state it was desirous of following virginia though there are many in maryland who deny this very stoutly but it was at once evident that if loyalty to the north could not be had in maryland of its own free will adherence to the north must be enforced upon maryland otherwise the city of washington could not be maintained as the existing capital of the nation the question of the fidelity of the state to the union was first tried by the arrival at baltimore of a certain commissioner from the state of mississippi who visited that city with the object of inducing secession it must be understood that baltimore is the commercial capital of maryland whereas annapolis is the seat of government and the legislature or is in other terms the political capital baltimore is a city containing two hundred thirty thousand inhabitants and is considered to have as strong and perhaps as violent a mob as any city in the union of the above number thirty thousand are negroes and two thousand are slaves the commissioner made his appeal telling his tale of southern grievances declaring among other things that secession was not intended to break up the government but to perpetuate it and asked for the assistance and sympathy of maryland this was in december eighteen sixty the commissioner was answered by governor hicks who was placed in a somewhat difficult position the existing legislature of the state was presumed to be secessionist but the legislature was not sitting nor in the ordinary course of things would that legislature have been called on to sit again the legislature of maryland is elected every other year and in the ordinary course sits only twice in the two years that session had been held and the existing legislature was therefore exempt from further work unless specially summoned for an extraordinary session to do this is within the power of the governor but governor hicks who seems to have been mainly anxious to keep things quiet and whose individual politics did not come out strongly was not inclined to issue the summons let us show moderation as well as firmness he said and that was about all he did say to the commissioner from mississippi the governor after that was directly called on to convene the legislature but this he refused to do alleging that it would not be safe to trust the discussion of such a subject as secession to excited politicians many of whom having nothing to lose from the destruction of the government may hope to derive some gain from the ruin of the state 
i quote these words coming from the head of the executive of the state and spoken with reference to the legislature of the state with the object of showing in what light the political leaders of a state may be held in that very state to which they belong if we are to judge of these legislators from the opinion expressed by governor hicks they could hardly have been fit for their places that plan of governing by the little men has certainly not answered it need hardly be said that governor hicks having expressed such an opinion of his state's legislature refused to call them to an extraordinary session on the eighteenth of april eighteen sixty governor hicks issued a proclamation to the people of maryland begging them to be quiet the chief object of which however was that of promising that no troops should be sent from their state unless with the object of guarding the neighboring city of washington a promise which he had no means of fulfilling seeing that the president of the united states is the commander-in-chief of the army of the nation and can summon the militia of the several states this proclamation by the governor to the state was immediately backed up by one from the mayor of baltimore to the city in which he congratulates the citizens on the governor's promise that none of their troops are to be sent to another state and then he tells them that they shall be preserved from the horrors of civil war but on the very next day the horrors of civil war began in baltimore by this time president lincoln was collecting troops at washington for the protection of the capital and that army of the potomac which has ever since occupied the virginian side of the river was in course of construction to join this certain troops from massachusetts were sent down by the usual route via new york philadelphia and baltimore but on their reaching baltimore by railway the mob of that town refused to allow them to pass through and a fight began nine citizens were killed and two soldiers and as many more were wounded this i think was the first blood spilt in the civil war and the attack was first made by the mob of the first slave city reached by the northern soldiers this goes far to show not that the border states desired secession but that when compelled to choose between secession and union when not allowed by circumstances to remain neutral their sympathies were with their sister slave states rather than with the north then there was a great running about of official men between baltimore and washington and the president was besieged with entreaties that no troops should be sent through baltimore now this was hard enough upon president lincoln seeing that he was bound to defend his capital that he could get no troops from the south and that baltimore is on the high road from washington both to the west and to the north but nevertheless he gave way had he not done so all baltimore would have been in a blaze of rebellion and the scene of the coming contest must have been removed from virginia to maryland and congress and the government must have travelled from washington north to philadelphia they shall not come through baltimore said mr lincoln but they shall come through the state of maryland they shall be passed over chesapeake bay by water to annapolis and shall come up by rail from thence this arrangement was as distasteful to the state of maryland as the other but annapolis is a small town without a mob and the marylanders had no means of preventing the passage of the troops attempts were made to refuse the use of the annapolis branch railway but general butler had the arranging of that general butler was a lawyer from boston and by no means inclined to indulge the scruples of the marylanders who had so roughly treated his fellow citizens from massachusetts the troops did therefore pass by annapolis much to the disgust of the state on the twenty seventh of april governor hicks having now had a sufficiency of individual responsibility summoned the legislature of which he had expressed so bad an opinion but on this occasion he omitted to repeat that opinion and submitted his views in very proper terms to the wisdom of the senators and representatives he entertains as he says an honest conviction that the safety of maryland lies in preserving a neutral position between the north and the south certainly governor hicks if it were only possible the legislature again went to work to prevent if it might be prevented the passage of troops through their state but luckily for them they failed the president was bound to defend washington and the marylanders were denied their wish of having their own fields made the fighting ground of the civil war that which appears to me to be the most remarkable feature in all this 
is the antagonism between the united states law and individual state feeling through the whole proceeding the governor and the state of maryland seem to have considered it quite reasonable to oppose the constitutional power of the president and his government it is argued in all the speeches and written documents that were produced in maryland at the time that maryland was true to the union and yet she put herself in opposition to the constitutional military power of the president certain commissioners went from the state legislature to washington in may and from their report it appears that the president had expressed himself of opinion that maryland might do this or that as long as she had not taken and was not about to take a hostile attitude to the federal government from which we are to gather that a denial of that military power given to the president by the constitution was not considered as an attitude hostile to the federal government at any rate it was direct disobedience to federal law i cannot but revert from this to the condition of the fugitive slave law federal law and indeed the original constitution plainly declare that fugitive slaves shall be given up by the free soil states massachusetts proclaims herself to be specially a federal law-loving state but every man in massachusetts knows that no judge no sheriff no magistrate no policeman in that state would at this time or then when that civil war was beginning have lent a hand in any way to the rendition of a fugitive slave the federal law requires the state to give up the fugitive but the state law does not require judge sheriff magistrate or policeman to engage in such work and no judge sheriff or magistrate will do so consequently that federal law is dead in massachusetts as it is also in every free soil state dead except in as much as there was life in it to create ill blood as long as the north and south remained together and would be life in it for the same effect if they should again be brought under the same flag on the tenth of may the maryland legislature having received the report of their commissioners above mentioned passed the following resolution Quote, whereas the war against the confederate states is unconstitutional and repugnant to civilization and will result in a bloody and shameful overthrow of our constitution and while recognizing the obligations of maryland to the union we sympathize with the south in the struggle for their rights for the sake of humanity we are for peace and reconciliation and solemnly protest against this war and will take no part in it resolved that maryland implores the president in the name of god to cease this unholy war at least until congress assembles a period of above six months that maryland desires and consents to the recognition of the independence of the confederate states the military occupation of maryland is unconstitutional and she protests against it though the violent interference with the transit of the federal troops is discountenanced that the vindication of her rights be left to time and reason and that a convention under existing circumstances is inexpedient End quote. from which it is plain that maryland would have seceded as effectually as georgia seceded had she not been prevented by the interposition of washington between her and the confederate states the happy intervention seeing that she has thus been saved from becoming the battleground of the contest but the legislature had to pay for its rashness on the thirteenth of september thirteen of its members were arrested as were also two editors of newspapers presumed to be secessionists a member of congress was also arrested at the same time and a candidate for governor hicks place who belonged to the secessionist party previously in the last days of june and beginning of july the chief of the police at baltimore and the members of the board of police had been arrested by general banks who then held baltimore in his power i should be sorry to be construed as saying that republican institutions or what may more properly be called democratic institutions have been broken down in the states of america i am far from thinking that they have broken down taking them and their work as a whole i think that they have shown and still show vitality of the best order but the written constitution of the united states and of the several states as bearing upon each other are not equal to the requirements made upon them that i think is the conclusion to which a spectator should come it is in that doctrine of finality that our friends have broken down a doctrine not expressed in their constitutions and indeed expressly denied in the constitution of the united states which provides the mode in which amendments shall be made 
but appearing plainly enough in every word of self-gratulation which comes from them political finality has ever proved a delusion as has the idea of finality in all human institutions i do not doubt but that the republican form of government will remain and make progress in north america but such prolonged existence and progress must be based on an acknowledgment of the necessity for change and must much depend on the facilities for change which shall be afforded i have described the condition of baltimore as it was early in may eighteen sixty one i reached that city just seven months later and its condition was considerably altered there was no question then whether troops should pass through baltimore or by an awkward round through annapolis or not pass at all through maryland general dix who had succeeded general banks was holding the city in his grip and martial law prevailed in such times as those it was bootless to inquire as to that promise that no troops should pass southward through baltimore what have such assurances ever been worth in such days baltimore was now a military depot in the hands of the northern army and general dix was not a man to stand any trifling he did me the honour to take me to the top of federal hill a suburb of the city on which he had raised great earthworks and planted mighty cannons and built tents and barracks for his soldiery and to show me how instantaneously he could destroy the town from his exalted position this hill was made for the very purpose said general dix and no doubt he thought so generals when they have fine positions and big guns and prostrate people lying under their thumbs are inclined to think that god's providence has specially ordained them and their points of vantage it is a good thing in the mind of a general so circumstanced that two hundred thousand men should be made subject to a dozen big guns i confess that to me having had no military education the matter appeared in a different light and i could not work up my enthusiasm to a pitch which would have been suitable to the general's courtesy that hill on which many of the poor of baltimore had lived was desecrated in my eyes by those columbiads the neat earthworks were ugly as looked upon by me and though i regarded general dix as energetic and no doubt skilful in the work assigned to him i could not sympathize with his exaltation previously to the days of secession baltimore had been guarded by fort mchenry which lies on a spit of land running out into the bay just below the town hither i went with general dix and he explained to me how the cannon had heretofore been pointed solely toward the sea that however now was all changed and the mouths of his bombs and great artillery were turned all the other way the commandant of the fort was with us and other officers and they all spoke of this martial tenure as a great blessing hearing them one could hardly fail to suppose that they had lived their forty fifty or sixty years of life in full reliance on the powers of a military despotism but not the less were they american republicans who twelve months since would have dilated on the all-sufficiency of their republican institutions and on the absence of any military restraint in their country with that peculiar pride which characterizes the citizens of the states there are however some lessons which may be learned with singular rapidity such was the state of baltimore when i visited that city i found nevertheless that cakes and ale still prevailed there i am inclined to think that cakes and ale prevail most freely in times that are perilous and when sources of sorrow abound i have seen more reckless joviality in a town stricken by pestilence than i ever encountered elsewhere there was general dix seated on federal hill with his cannon and there beneath his artillery were gentlemen hotly professing themselves to be secessionists men whose sons and brothers were in the southern army and women alas whose brothers would be in one army and their sons in another that was the part of it which was most heart-rending in this borderland in new england and new york men's minds at any rate were bent all in the same direction as doubtless they were also in georgia and alabama but here fathers were divided from sons and mothers from their daughters terrible tales were told of threats uttered by one member of a family against another old ties of friendship were broken up society had so divided itself that one side could hold no terms of courtesy with the other when this is over one gentleman said to me every man in baltimore will have a quarrel to the death on his hands with some friend whom he used to love 
the complaints made on both sides were eager and open-mouthed against the other late in the autumn an election for a new legislature of the state had taken place and the members returned were all supposed to be unionists that they were prepared to support the government is certain but no known or presumed secessionist was allowed to vote without first taking the oath of allegiance the election therefore even if the numbers were true cannot be looked upon as a free election voters were stopped at the poll and not allowed to vote unless they would take an oath which would on their parts undoubtedly have been false it was also declared in baltimore that men engaged to promote the northern party were permitted to vote five or six times over and the enormous number of votes polled on the government side gave some colouring to the statement at any rate an election carried under general dick's guns cannot be regarded as an open election it was out of the question that any election taken under such circumstances should be worth anything as expressing the minds of the people red and white had been declared to be the colours of the confederates and red and white had of course become the favourite colours of the baltimore ladies then it was given out that red and white would not be allowed in the streets ladies wearing red and white were requested to return home children decorated with red and white ribbons were stripped of their bits of finery much to their infantile disgust and dismay ladies would put red and white ornaments in their windows and the police would insist on the withdrawal of the colours such was the condition of baltimore during the past winter nevertheless cakes and ale abounded and though there was deep grief in the city and wailing in the recesses of many houses and a feeling that the good times were gone never to return within the days of many of them still there existed an excitement and a consciousness of the importance of the crisis which was not altogether unsatisfactory men and women can endure to be ruined to be torn from their friends to be overwhelmed with avalanches of misfortune better than they can endure to be dull baltimore is or at any rate was an aspiring city proud of its commerce and proud of its society it has regarded itself as the new york of the south and to some extent has forced others so to regard it also in many respects it is more like an english town than most of its transatlantic brethren and the ways of its inhabitants are english in old days a pack of foxhounds was kept here or indeed in days that are not yet very old for i was told of their doings by a gentleman who had long been a member of the hunt the country looks as a hunting country should look whereas no man that ever crossed a field after a pack of hounds would feel the slightest wish to attempt that process in new england or new york there is in baltimore an old inn with an old sign standing at the corner of utah and franklin streets just such as may still be seen in the towns of somersetshire and before it there are to be seen old wagons covered and soiled and battered about to return from the city to the country just as the wagons do in our own agricultural counties i have seen nothing so thoroughly english in any other part of the union but canvas-back ducks and terrapins are the great glories of baltimore of the nature of the former bird i believe all the world knows something it is a wild duck which obtains the peculiarity of its flavour from the wild celery on which it feeds this celery grows on the chesapeake bay and i believe on the chesapeake bay only at any rate baltimore is the headquarters of the canvas backs and it is on the chesapeake bay that they are shot i was kindly invited to go down on a shooting party but when i learned that i should have to ensconce myself alone for hours in a wet wooden box on the water's edge waiting there for the chance of a duck to come to me i declined the fact of my never having as yet been successful in shooting a bird of any kind conduced somewhat perhaps to my decision i must acknowledge that the canvas-back duck fully deserves all the reputation it has acquired as to the terrapin i have not so much to say the terrapin is a small turtle found on the shores of maryland and virginia out of which a very rich soup is made it is cooked with wines and spices and is served in the shape of a hash with heaps of little bones mixed through it it is held in great repute and the guest is expected as a matter of course to be helped twice the man who did not eat twice of terrapin would be held in small repute as the londoner is held who at a city banquet does not partake of both thick and thin turtle i must however confess that the terrapin for me had no surpassing charms 
maryland was so called from henrietta maria the wife of charles i by which king in sixteen thirty two the territory was conceded to the roman catholic lord baltimore it was chiefly peopled by roman catholics but i do not think that there is now any such specialty attaching to the state there are in it two or three old roman catholic families but the people have come down from the north and have no peculiar religious tendencies some of lord baltimore's descendants remained in the state up to the time of the revolution from baltimore i went on to washington end of chapter twenty end of north america volume one by antony trollope recorded by celine major thank you for listening